Chapter One of Travels in Brazil, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Travels in Brazil, Volume One, by Henry Coster. Chapter One. Departure from Liverpool, arrival at Pernambuco, the town and harbor of Recife the governor, the trade. If my health had not required a change of climate, I should not perhaps so soon have accomplished the wish I had often expressed of leaving England for a short time. An immediate removal was judged expedient, and as the ports of Spain and Portugal were either closed to British subjects, or at least not in a state to be visited by an invalid, I determined upon Brazil, to which my friends agreed. I fixed on Pernambuco, because a gentleman, who had for many years been acquainted with my family, was about to embark for that place, and from the favorable reports of the people and climate which I had received from several persons. On the 2nd of November, 1809, I sailed from Liverpool in the ship Lucy. We had a very prosperous passage of thirty-five days, without any occurrence worthy of particular notice. I was agreeably awakened very early on the morning of the 7th of December with the news that we were in sight of land and likely to get into harbor this day. We soon discovered two vessels, with all sails set, making for us. These proved to be two English merchant ships bound likewise to Pernambuco. They had never before been at this port and therefore wished to receive some information respecting it. They judged that, from the manner in which our vessel made for the land, her commander must be acquainted with it, which was the case, this being the second voyage of the Lucy to Pernambuco. The land is low, and consequently not to be seen at any considerable distance, but as we approached it, we distinguished the hill upon which stands the city of Olinda, a little to the northward, and some leagues to the southward, the Cape of St. Augustino. A nearer view discovered to us the town of St. Antonio do Recife, almost ahead with the shipping in front of it. The dreary land between it and Olinda, which is one league distant, and Coco Groves northward, as far as the eye can reach, which is one league distant, and Coco Groves northward, as far as the eye can reach. Southward of the town are also seen great numbers of cocoa trees, woods, and scattered cottages. The situation of Olinda is the highest in the neighborhood, and though not very high, is still not despicable. Its appearance from the sea is most delightful, its whitewashed churches and convents upon the tops and sides of the hill, its gardens and trees, interspersed among the houses, afford a promise of great extent and hold out expectations of great beauty. The sands, which extend one league to the southward of it, are relieved by two fortresses erected upon them, and by the ships in the lower harbor. Then follows the town of Hesife, with the appearance of being built in the water, so low is the sandbank upon which it has been raised. The shipping immediately in front partly conceal it, and the bold reef of rocks on the outside of these, with the surf dashing violently against and over it, give to them the appearance of being ashore, and as no outlet is seen, they seem to be hemmed in. The small tower or fort at the northern end of the reef, however, soon claims attention, and points out the entrance. We approached the land rather to the southward of the town, and coasted under very easy sail, at a short distance from the reef, waiting for a pilot. It was not yet noon, the sea was smooth, the sun was bright, and everything looked pleasant. The buildings are all whitewashed, and sun shone upon them and gave to them a glittering silvery appearance. Nothing this day created so much astonishment on board our ship amongst those who had not been before upon this coast as the jangatas sailing about in all directions. These are simply rafts of six logs of a peculiar species of light timber, lashed or pinned together, a large latine sail, a paddle used as a rudder, a sliding keel let down between the two center logs, a seat for the steersman, and a long forked pole, 
upon which is hung the vessel containing water the provisions etc these rude floats have a most singular appearance at sea no hull being apparent even when near them they are usually managed by two men and go closer to the wind than any description of vessel a large rowboat at last made its appearance doubling the end of the reef near the small fort which was declared to be that which brings off the pilots the patramore harbour master in his naval uniform likewise came on board a large launch followed the pilot manned chiefly by negroes almost naked the colour of these men the state in which they were their noise and bustle when certainly there was no occasion for it and their awkwardness were to me all new this very first communication with the shore gave me an idea for the moment that the manners of the country at which i had arrived were still more strange than they actually proved to be these visitors were followed by others of a very different description two boats came alongside manned by englishmen and conveying several english gentlemen the former belonged to british ships loading in the harbour and the latter were young men who had come out to pernambuco to settle as merchants the pilot placed himself near to the ship's windlass a portuguese sailor was sent to take the helm but still the vociferation was extreme the man seemed to think that by speaking very loudly he would make the english seamen understand his language and what with his bawling to them and to his own people and their noise the confusion was excessive however we doubled the fort in safety and came to anchor in the upper harbour the reef is very perpendicular near the bar and to one unacquainted with the port there is every appearance of the vessel being about to drive upon it i then accompanied my fellow-passenger we left the ship and proceeded to the shore here was a new scene indeed we had taken the letter-bag with us the crowd of well-dressed persons upon the quay was great they saw the bag and soon their anxiety for news overcame their politeness the letters were asked for and at last we gave them up and they were scrambled for each man seeking his own we had landed at the custom-house wharf upon a busy day and the negroes too were all clamour and bustle their hideous noise when carrying any load bawling out some ditty of their own language or some distich of vulgar portuguese rhyme the numerous questions asked by many persons who met us and the very circumstance of seeing a population consisting chiefly of individuals of a dark colour added to the sound of a new language with which although i was acquainted still i had not since very early youth been in a country where it was generally spoken all combined to perplex and to confuse i was led along by those who were accustomed to these scenes we proceeded to the house of one of the first merchants in the place we were ushered up one pair of stairs into a room in which were several piles of peace goods a table covered with papers and several chairs there were four or five persons in the room besides the owner of the house i delivered my letter of introduction to him and was treated with the greatest civility our next visit was to a colonel who was also a merchant from whom i met with the same behaviour as there are no inns or furnished lodgings at hesifi or at olinda footnote a house answering both these purposes has lately been established at hesifi by an irishman and his wife eighteen fifteen End footnote. an acquaintance of my fellow passenger obtained some temporary rooms for us and supplied us with what we wanted we are therefore at last quietly settled in our new habitation if i may be allowed to call it quiet while some twenty black women are under the window bawling out in almost all tones and keys of which the human voice is capable oranges bananas sweetmeats and other commodities for sale the town of st antonio do Recife, commonly called pernambuco though the latter is properly the name of the captaincy consists of three compartments connected by two bridges a narrow long neck of sand stretches from the foot of the hill upon which olinda is situated to the southward the southern extremity of this bank expands and forms the side of that part of the town particularly called hesifi as being immediately within the reef there is another sand-bank also of considerable extent 
upon which has been built the second division, called Sant Antonio. It connected with that already mentioned by means of a bridge. Yet a third division of the town remains to be mentioned, called Boa Vista, which stands upon the mainland to the southward of the other two, and is joined to them also by a bridge. The Hesifi, or reef of rocks already spoken of, runs in front of these sandbanks, and receives upon it the principal force of the sea, which at the flow of the tide rolls over it, but is much checked by it, and strikes the quays and buildings of the town with diminished strength. The greatest part of the extent of sand between Olinda and the town which remains uncovered is open to the sea, and the surf there is very violent. Buildings have only been raised within the protection of the reef. The tide enters between the bridges and encircles the middle compartment. On the land side there is a considerable expanse of water, having much the appearance of a lake, which becomes narrower towards Olinda and reaches to the very streets of that place, thus facilitating the communication between the two towns. The view from the houses that look on to these waters is very extensive and very beautiful. Their opposite banks are covered with trees and whitewashed cottages, varied by small open spaces and lofty cocoa trees. The first division of the town is composed of brick houses of three, four, and even five stories in height. Most of the streets are narrow, and some of the older houses in the minor streets are only of one story in height, and many of them consist only of the ground floor. The streets of this part, with the exception of one, are paved. In the square are the custom house in one corner, a long, low, and shabby building, the sugar inspection, which bears the appearance of a dwelling house, a large church, not finished, a coffee house, in which the merchants assemble to transact their commercial affairs, and dwelling houses. There are two churches in use, one of which is built over the stone archway leading from the town to Olinda, at which a lieutenant's guard is stationed. The other church belongs to the priests of the Congregación de Madre de Deus. Near to the gateway above mentioned is a small fort, close to the waterside which commands it. To the northward is the residence of the Port Admiral, with the government timber yards attached to it. These are small, and the work going on in them is very trifling. The cotton market, warehouses, and presses are also in this part of the town. Footnote. It is perhaps not generally known that the bags of cotton are compressed by means of machinery into a small compass and fastened round with ropes that the ships which convey them may contain a great number. End footnote. The bridge which leads to St. Antonio has an archway at either end, with a small chapel built upon each, and at the northern arch is stationed a sergeant's guard of six or eight men. The bridge is formed in part of stone arches, and in part of wood. It is quite flat, and lined with small shops, which render it so narrow that two carriages cannot pass each other upon it. St. Antonio, or the Middle Town, is composed chiefly of large houses and broad streets, and if these buildings had about them any beauty, there would exist here a certain degree of grandeur. But they are too lofty for their breadth, and the ground floors are appropriated to shops, warehouses, stables, and other purposes of a like nature. The shops are without windows, and the only light they have is admitted from the door. There exists as yet very little distinction of trades, Thus all descriptions of manufactured goods are sold by the same person. Some of the minor streets consist of low and shabby houses. Here are the governor's palace, which was in other times the Jesuits' convent, the town hall and prison, the barracks, which are very bad, the Franciscan, Carmelite, and Peña convents, and several churches, the interiors of which are very handsomely ornamented but very little plan has been preserved in the architecture of the buildings themselves. It comprises several squares, and has, to a certain degree, a gay and lively appearance. This is the principal division of the town. The bridge which connects St. Antonio with Boa Vista is constructed entirely of wood, and has upon it no shops, but it is likewise narrow. The principal street of Boa Vista, which was formerly a piece of ground overflowed at high water, 
is broad and handsome. The rest of this third division consists chiefly of small houses, and as there is plenty of room here, it extends to some distance in a straggling manner. Neither the streets of this part of the town nor of St. Antonio are paved. A long embankment has likewise been made, which connects the sandbank and town of St. Antonio with the mainland at Afogados. Footnote. I did not discover any vestiges of the fort which stood here at the time of the Dutch War. End footnote. To the south and west of Boa Vista. The river, Capibaribe, so famous in Pernambuco history, discharges its waters into the channel between St. Antonio and Boa Vista, after having run for some distance in a course nearly east and west. Some few of the windows of the houses are glazed and have iron balconies, but the major part are without glass, and of these balconies are enclosed by latticework, and no females are to be seen excepting the negro slaves, which gives a very somber look to the streets. The Portuguese, footnote, I shall use this word exclusively when speaking of Europeans of this nation, and the word Brazilian when speaking of white persons born in Brazil. End footnote. The Brazilian and even the mulatto women in the middle ranks of life do not move out of doors in the daytime. They hear mass at the churches before daylight and do not again stir out, excepting in sedan chairs, or in the evening on foot, when occasionally a whole family will sally forth to take a walk. The upper harbor of Hisifi, called the Mosquero, as has been already said, is formed by the reef of rocks which run parallel with the town at a very small distance. The lower harbor, for vessels of four hundred tons and upwards, called the Pozo, is very dangerous, and it is open to the sea, and the beach opposite to it is very steep. The large Brazil ships, belonging to merchants of the place, lie here for months at a time, moored with four cables, two ahead and two astern. If precautions are not taken very speedily, the entrance to the harbor of Mosquero will become choked up owing to a breach in the reef, immediately within the small fort, which is called Pica. The port has two entrances, one of which is deeper than the other. The tide does not rise more than five and a half feet. The principal defense of the town consists in the forts do Buraco. Footnote, this is the name by which the fort is usually distinguished, but I rather think that it is not its proper appellation. End footnote and do Brum, both of which are built of stone, and are situated upon the sands opposite to the two entrances. Likewise there is the small fort of Bon Jesus, near to the archway and church of the same name, and upon the southeast point of the sandbank of St. Antonio stands the large stone fort of Cinco Pontas, so called from its pentagonal form. They are said to be all out of order, from what I have stated, it will be seen that the ground upon which the town has been built is most peculiarly circumstanced, and that the manner in which the harbor is formed is equally rare. The town is principally supplied with water, which is brought in canoes either from Olinda or from the river Capibaribe above the influence of the tide. It comes in bulk, and although the greater part of the vessels are decked, still it is usually filthy, as too much care is not taken in their cleanliness. The wells that are sunk in the sand upon which the town stands only affords brackish water. The three compartments of the town, together, contain about 25,000 inhabitants or more, and it is increasing rapidly. New houses are building wherever space can be found. The population consists of white persons, of mulatto and black free people, and of slaves also of several shades. The reef of rocks, of which I have before spoken, continues along the whole coast between Pernambuco and Maranhão, and in some parts it runs at a very short distance from the shore, and in this case is usually high, remaining uncovered at low water, as at Recife, but in other places it recedes from the land, and is then generally concealed. It has numberless breaks in it, through which the communication with the sea is laid open. 
Hesifi is a thriving place, increasing daily in opulence and importance. The prosperity which it enjoys may be in some measure attributed to the character of its governor and captain general, Caetano Pinto G. Miranda Montenegro, who has ruled the province for the last ten years with systematic steadiness and uniform prudence. He has made no unnecessary innovations, but he has allowed useful improvements to be introduced. He has not, with hurried enthusiastic zeal, which often defeats its end, pushed forwards any novelty that struck him at the moment, but he has given his consent and countenance to any proposal backed by respectable persons. He has not interfered and intermeddled with those concerns in which governments have no business, but he has supported them when they have been once established. I here speak of commercial regulations and minor improvements in the chief town and in the smaller settlements of the country. He is affable and hears the complaint of a peasant or a rich merchant with the same patience. He is just, seldom exercising the power which he possesses of punishing without appeal to the civil magistrate, and when he does enforce it, the crime must be very glaring indeed. He acts upon a system and from principle, and if it is the fate of Brazil to be in the hands of a despotic government, happy compared to its present state, would it in general be if all its rulers resembled him? I love the place at which I so long resided, and I hope most sincerely that he may not be removed, but that he may continue to dispense to that extensive region the blessings of a mild, forbearing administration. In political consequence, with reference to the Portuguese government, Pernambuco holds the third footnote. I am not quite certain whether it is the third or fourth end footnote rank amongst the provinces of Brazil, but in a commercial point of view, with reference to Great Britain, I know not whether it should not be named first. Footnote. I sailed from Pernambuco in the very last convoy of 1815, previous to the peace with the United States, which consisted of 28 vessels, viz. two ships of war, two prizes to them, and 24 merchant vessels, 14 of which were from Pernambuco, and the remaining ten from Rio de Janeiro and Bahia. End footnote. Its chief exports are cotton and sugar. The former mostly comes to England, and may be accounted at 80,000 or 90,000 bags annually, averaging 160 pounds weight each bag. The latter is chiefly shipped to Lisbon. Hides, coconuts, Ipeca cuanha, and a few other drugs are also occasionally sent from Lentz, but are exported in trifling quantities. These articles are exchanged for manufactured goods, earthenware, porter, and other articles of necessity among civilized people, and also of luxury to no very great amount. Two or three ships sail annually for Goa and the East Indies, and the trade to the coast of Africa for slaves is considerable. Several vessels from the United States arrive at Hesifi annually, bringing flour, of which great quantities are now consumed, furniture for dwelling houses, and other kinds of lumber, and carrying away sugar, molasses, and rum. During the late war between the United States and England, which interrupted this trade, Hesifi was at first somewhat distressed for wheat flour, but a supply arrived from Rio Grande do Sul, the most southern province of the kingdom of Brazil. Footnote. An edict has lately been issued at Rio de Janeiro by the regent, declaring himself the prince regent of the United Kingdoms of Portugal, Brazil, and the two Algarves, 1816. End footnote. The quality is good. Footnote. I saw in the year 1814 a very fine root of wheat that had been raised in the Campina Grande of the province of Paraíba, about thirty leagues to the northward of Hesife. End footnote. And I rather think that some coasting vessels will continue to supply the market with this article, notwithstanding the renewed communication with North America. End of chapter 1
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 Visit to the Governor The Climate First Ride into the Country Residence at a Village in the Neighborhood of Hesifi Olinda Holy Thursday Good Friday Easter Sunday Profession of a Friar St. Peter's Day Visit to a Brazilian Family A Dance Another Visit to Olinda the numerous arrangements necessary on our arrival prevented our making immediately the customary visit to the governor but on the following morning we proceeded to the palace situated in a small square with a guardhouse on one side at which is stationed a captain's guard we were ushered upstairs remained some time in an antechamber with several cadets and were then desired to enter we passed the secretary's room and were shown into a very spacious apartment in which the governor waited to receive us he is a large handsome man with quite the manners of a gentleman we all sat down and he asked several questions respecting affairs in europe i had some english newspapers which i left with him and in about half an hour we retired the first few days after my arrival were spent in delivering my letters of introduction. I soon became acquainted with all the English merchants, who live in a very respectable style, and have done much good in establishing some customs which the Portuguese have had the sense to follow, preserving at the same time those of their own, which are fitted to the country and climate. As this was the summer season, great numbers of the inhabitants were out of town. They removed to small cottages at Olinda and upon the banks of the rivers to enjoy a purer air and the amusement and comfort of bathing during the months most subject to hot parching weather. The heat is, however, seldom very oppressive. The sea breeze during the whole year commences about nine o'clock in the morning and continues until midnight. When exposed to it, even standing in the sun, the heat is so much alleviated by its influence as to make the person so situated forget for a moment that in the shade he would be cooler. At the time this subsides, the land breeze rises and continues until early in the morning, and the half hour in the forenoon, which occasionally passes between the one and the other, is the most unpleasant period of the day. In the rainy season, just before the commencement of a heavy shower, the clouds are very dark, dense, and low. The breeze is suspended for a short time. There is then a sort of expectant stillness, and the weather is very sultry. One afternoon I rode out with several young men to a village in the neighborhood for the purpose of delivering a letter to one of the rich merchants. We passed through the Boa Vista and proceeded along a narrow sandy road, formed by frequent passing and repassing, and along the sides of this are many of the summer residences of the wealthy inhabitants of the town, which are small, neat, whitewashed cottages of one floor, with gardens in front and at the sides, planted with orange, lemon, pomegranate, and many other kinds of fruit trees. Some few are enclosed partly by low walls, but for the most part they are protected by fences of timber, about halfway we came out upon the banks of the Capi Barriba. The view is exceedingly pretty. Houses, trees, and gardens on each side. The river bends just above and appears lost among the trees. The canoes go gently down with the tide, or more laboriously forcing their way up against it, formed a delightful prospect. The river is here rather narrower than the Thames at Richmond. Along the sides of the road, at this spot, are several black women selling oranges, other kinds of fruits, and cakes, and canoe men with their long poles, unable to delay, bargaining with them for some of their commodities. This was the first time I had left the town, and I was truly pleased with these first looks of the country of which I had become an inhabitant. We again left the river, continuing along the road, still bordered by cottages of a better or worse appearance, till we reached a small village. Through this we passed, and soon afterwards arrived at the end of our ride. The situation is very picturesque, 
upon the northern bank of the Capi Bariba, and at the foot of a steep hill clothed with wood. On our arrival at the house, we entered immediately from the road into a hall with a brick floor, of which the doors and windows are very large, so as to leave the front very nearly open. We were received by the lady of the house, and her husband soon appeared. They were exceedingly civil, and ordered sweetmeats to be brought out. Our English flat saddles created as much surprise to the people of Pernambuco as those of the Portuguese appeared strange to us. They are high before and behind, which obliges the rider to sit very upright, and the fashion is to be as stiff as possible, and to hold quite perpendicularly a switch of most enormous length. The horses are taught a delightful amble, upon which some of them can be made to proceed with great speed. The river Capibariba is navigable during the whole year as far as Apepucos, half a league beyond Montero, the village at which my new acquaintance was now residing. It overflows its banks in the rainy season, oftentimes with great rapidity, as the lands through which it runs in this part of the country are very low. The floods are somewhat dreaded, as they occasionally extend far and wide. The straw hovels upon its banks are often carried away, and the whole neighborhood is laid under water. Canoes have been known to ply between this village and those of Poço da Panela and Casa Forci. A Portuguese friend, with whom I had been acquainted in England, having taken a house at the former of the two last-mentioned places, I agreed to share the expense of it with him and we immediately removed to it to pass the summer months. The village was quite full, not a hut remained untenanted, and as occurs in England at watering places, families whose dwellings in town were spacious and handsome, regardless of inconvenience, came to reside here during the summer in very small cottages. The Poso da Panela contains a chapel built by subscription, a row of houses running parallel with the river several washerwomen's huts in front of them, and other dwellings scattered about in all directions. Here the ceremonious manners of the town are thrown aside, and exchanged for an equal degree of freedom. Our mornings were filled up, either in riding to the Hesifi, or to some other part of the country, or in conversation at the houses of any of the families with whom we were acquainted, and the afternoons and evenings with music, dancing, playing at forfeits, and dining with some of the English merchants, a few of whom had also removed to this place and in its neighborhood. At many of the Portuguese houses I found the card tables occupied at nine o'clock in the morning. When one person rose, another took his place, and thus they were scarcely deserted, except during the heat of the day, when each man either returned to his own home to dine, or, as is much less frequent, was requested to remain and partake with the family. On the last day of this year I was invited to visit Olinda, that I might witness the festival of Our Lady of the Mountain. The city is, as I have already observed, situated upon a hill, very steep in front of the sea, and declining gradually on the land side. Its first appearance, on arriving upon the coast, is so beautiful that the disappointment experienced on entering it is great, but still Olinda has many beauties, and the view from it is magnificent. The streets are paved, but are much out of repair. Many of the houses are low, small, and neglected, and the gardens very little cultivated. Indeed, the place has been deserted for the Hesife. However, one of the regiments of the line is stationed here. Footnote. This has lately been removed to Hesife, owing to a report of some plan of revolt amongst the negroes which has since proved to be without foundation eighteen fifteen and footnote it is the residence of the bishop and the site of the ecclesiastical court the seminary which is a public college of education and some convents and fine churches therefore it is by no means desolate though its general aspect bespeaks tranquillity regularity and a degree of neglect the view to the southward takes in a lake of about three miles in length, of which the surface is covered with weeds and grass, and the opposite banks lined with thick woods and some cottages. The Hesife and the bay behind it, formed by the entrance of the tide, extending to Olinda but concealed in places by low and thick mangroves, are also to be seen. 
Belinda covers much ground, but contains only four thousand inhabitants. At this time the whole city presented a scene of bustle and amusement. The church, particularly decorated on this occasion, stands upon the highest point. The assemblage of persons was great, the church was lighted up, and a few individuals of both sexes were kneeling promiscuously in the body of it, but the service was over. This is the season of cheerfulness and gaiety, and we were likewise to have our festival at the Pozo da Panela. These festivals are also preceded by nine evenings of hymn-singing and music in honor of the Virgin, or the saint whose day is to be thus celebrated. On this occasion the performance for the novena, or nine evenings, consisted of a pianoforte played by a lady, the wife of a merchant, and a guitar and some wind instruments, played by several young men of respectability. The vocal music was also executed by the same persons, assisted by some female mulatto slaves belonging to the lady. I was somewhat surprised to hear the airs of country dances and marches occasionally introduced. However, on the day of the festival, the performers were professional men, and in the evening fireworks were displayed. Every house in the village was crowded this day with people from all parts. My friend and I had several persons to dinner, but before we had half finished, some of their friends appeared, and without ceremony came in and helped themselves. Soon all idea of regularity vanished, and things were scrambled for. In a short time both of us left our own house, and tried to gain admittance to some other, but all were in the same condition. We were invited to a dance in the evening, at which the governor was present, and although he is himself desirous of making every person feel at ease, still such is the dreadful idea of rank, for I know not what else to call it, in this country, that the behavior of every one was constrained, and the conversation carried on almost in a whisper. I lost no festivals, and amongst others went to that of Sant Amaro the healer of wounds, at whose chapel are sold bits of ribbon as charms, which many individuals of the lower orders of people tie round their naked ankles or their wrists, and preserve until they wear out and drop off. About the commencement of Lent, the villages in the neighborhood are almost entirely deserted by the white people, who return to town to see the processions customary at this season in Catholic countries, the rains usually begin about the end of March. I did not leave the Pozo de Panela until the very last, but in the end found the place dull and followed the rest. On Holy Thursday, accompanied by two of my countrymen, I sallied forth at three o'clock to see the churches, which are on this occasion lighted up and highly ornamented. The whole town was in motion. The females, too, both high and low, were this afternoon parading the streets on foot, contrary to their usual custom. Many of them were dressed in silks of different colors, and covered with gold chains and other trinkets, a general muster being made of all the finery that could be collected. The blaze in some of the churches from great numbers of wax tapers was prodigious. The object apparently aimed at was the production of the greatest quantity of light, as in some instances mirrors were fixed behind the tapers, the middle of the body of these churches is completely open. There are no pews, no distinction of places. The principal chapel is invariably at the opposite end of the chief entrance, recedes from the church, and is narrower. This part is appropriated to the officiating priests, and is railed in from the body of the church. The females, as they enter, whether white or of color, place themselves as near to the rails as they can squatting down upon the floor of the large open space in the centre. The men stand along either side of the body of the church, a narrow slip being in most cases railed off lengthwise, or they remain near to the entrance, behind the women, but every female of whatever rank or colour is first accommodated. On the following day, Good Friday, the decorations of the church, the dress of the women, and even the manner of both sexes was changed, all was dismal. In the morning I went with the same gentleman to the church of the Sacramento to witness a representation of our Saviour's descent from the cross. We entered the church by a side door. 
it was much crowded, and the difficulty of getting in was considerable. An enormous curtain hung from the ceiling, excluding from the sight the whole of the principal chapel. An Italian missionary friar of the Peña convent, with a long beard and dressed in a thick, dark brown cloth habit, was in the pulpit, and about to commence an extempore sermon. After an exordium of some length, adapted to the day, he cried out, Behold him! The curtain immediately dropped and discovered an enormous cross with a full-size wooden image of our Saviour, exceedingly well carved and painted, and around it a number of angels represented by several young persons, all finely decked out, and each bearing a large pair of outstretched wings made of gauze. A man dressed in a bob wig and a pea-green robe as St. John, and a female kneeling at the foot of the cross as the Magdalene, whose character, as I was informed, seemingly that nothing might be wanting, was not the most pure. The friar continued with much vehemence and much action. His narrative of the crucifixion, and after some minutes again cried out, Behold, they take him down, when four men habited in imitation of Roman soldiers stepped forwards. The countenances of these persons were in part concealed by black crape. Two of them ascended ladders placed on each side of the cross, and one took down the board, bearing the letters I-N-R-I. Then was removed the crown of thorns, and a white cloth was put over, and pressed down upon the head, which was soon taken off and shown to the people, stained with the circular mark of the crown and blood. This done, the nails which transfixed the hands were by degrees knocked out, and this produced a violent beating of breasts among the female part of the congregation. A long white linen bandage was next passed under each armpit of the image. The nail which secured the feet was removed. The figure was let down very gently and was carefully wrapped up in a white sheet. All this was done by word of command from the preacher. The sermon was then quickly brought to a conclusion, and we left the church. I was quite amazed. I had heard of something of this kind was to be done, but I had no idea of the extent to which the representation would be carried. On Saturday morning we were saluted with the bellowing of cattle, the grunting of pigs, and the cries of the negro slaves with baskets of fowls of several kinds for sale. These were to be devoured after the ensuing midnight and many families, weary of their long abstinence, impatiently awaited the striking of the clocks as a signal for the commencement of hostile operations, without mercy or scruple upon turkeys, pigs, and all the rest of the miserable tribes which had been laid down as the lawful victims of our carnivorous nature. On Easter Sunday I was invited by a physician to dine with him, and to attend the christening of one of his grandchildren. At dinner the party was small. The dishes were served up two at a time, to the number of ten or twelve, of all of which I was obliged to taste. From the table we adjourned to the church, about four o'clock, where several persons, likewise invited, waited for us. The ceremony was performed by a friar, and each guest held a wax taper, forming a semicircle towards the altar, from whence we returned to the old gentleman's house to supper. I met here, among others, belonging to the same convent, the friar who preached the crucifixion sermon. The members of this convent are all Italians and missionaries, but as no reinforcement has for a length of time come out from Europe, many few now remain. A long table was laid out, loaded with victuals. Several ladies were present, notwithstanding which enormous quantities of wine were drank, till the whole company began to be riotous but still the ladies did not move. At last no order was left among them. Bottles and glasses were overturned and broken, and the vehement wishes expressed for the prosperity of the whole family of our host, both old and young. When in the midst of this I escaped about nine o'clock, accompanied by a Franciscan friar. We had a journey in contemplation for the next day, and thought it high time to get away. Parties of this kind are not frequent and in a general way these people live in a very quiet manner. The old doctor is a native of Lisbon, and a great friend to Englishmen. 
he was young at the time of the great earthquake and says he shall never forget that he was in part clothed from the necessary sent out by the british government for the assistance of the portuguese after that dreadful calamity on the following afternoon the friar myself and a servant proceeded to iguarasu a small town distant from hesifi seven leagues for the purpose of witnessing the entrance of a novice into the order of st francis we arrived about nine o'clock at night at the gates of the convent the friar rang the bell three times as a signal of the arrival of one of the order a lay brother came and asked who it was that demanded admittance he was answered that it was brother joseph from the convent of hesifi accompanied by a friend the porter shut the gates again but soon returned saying that the guardian the name given to the principal of a franciscan convent allowed us to enter we were conducted up a flight of steps into a long corridor the end of which sat the guardian to whom we were introduced he directed us to the brother who had the management of the accommodations for visitors this man placed us under the especial care of fray luis who took us to his cell supper was served up upon which the guardian came in helped us once round to wine and made many apologies for the badness of his cook and also excuses for the want of ingredients at this distance from hesifi the convents of st francis are all built exactly upon the same plan in the form of a quadrangle one side of which is appropriated to the church and the remaining three cells and other purposes the former are above and to be entered from a gallery which runs round the whole building the beds with which the friars supplied us were hard but very acceptable after our ride the ceremony to be performed the ensuing morning collected great numbers of persons from all quarters as it is now very rare formerly of every family at least one member was a friar but now this is not the custom children are brought up to trade to the army to anything rather than a monastic life which is fast losing its reputation none of the convents are full and some of them are nearly without inhabitants footnote a portuguese gentleman once observed to me that in france and other countries many clever men had written and spoken strongly and for a considerable length of time against this way of life and they at last even affected their purpose with much difficulty but he added in pernambuco such is the conduct of the friars that no writing and no speaking is necessary to bring them into disrepute End footnote. early in the morning the church was lighted up and about ten o'clock the family of the person about to take the vows arrived to occupy the seats prepared for them mass was then said and a sermon preached about eleven o'clock the novice a young man of sixteen years of age entered the principal chapel by a side door walking between two brothers with a large cross in his hands and dressed in a long dark blue robe there was then much chanting after which he knelt down opposite to the guardian received the usual admonitions was asked several questions relating to his belief in the doctrines of the church and then made the separate vows of defending his religion of celibacy and others of minor importance the guardian then dressed him in the habit of the order made a very thick rough dark brown cloth which before lay stretched upon the ground in front of the altar covered with flowers this being done the young man embraced all the brothers present took leave of his relations and left the church many of the friars were laughing during the ceremony and were particularly amused at the guardian accidentally saying brother don't be ashamed footnote irmão não tenha vergonha End footnote. owing to the young man being much abashed a visitor who stood near to me in the gallery from which there are windows into the church said in a low voice to be heard only by those immediately around him see your chief himself thus advises him to put shame aside which unfortunately you are all too much inclined to do at this the friars who were within hearing all laughed great part of the community and many other persons dined with the father of the young friar and i among the rest there was much eating much drinking and much confusion 
in the evening fireworks were displayed which ended by a transparency representing a novice receiving the benediction of his guardian it was determined that we should return to hesifi this night and that the journey was to be commenced as soon as the moon rose the party consisted of five friars several laymen beside myself all on horseback some palaquins with ladies and a number of negroes to carry them we sallied forth about midnight the moon was bright and the sky quite clear the scene was very strange the road made in places abrupt turns so as to give those who were rather in advance on looking back a view of the whole procession at times appearing and at times concealed among the trees of this the friars formed an extraordinary part in their robes tucked up around the waist and tied with a long yellow cord of flagellation and with their enormous white hats at olinda several persons remained and the rest arrived at hesifi about seven o'clock in the morning on the tenth of may i had a sudden attack of fever which was accompanied with delirium however with the assistance of a medical man the disorder subsided in the course of forty-eight hours but it left me in a very weak state from which i was some time in recovering these fevers are well known in the country but are not common and in general are preceded for some days by ague i can only account for this attack from having suffered the window of my room which had a western aspect to remain open during the night and the land breeze which rises about twelve o'clock is not accounted wholesome a young englishman insisted upon my removal to his house that i might not remain in the hands of servants he brought a palaquin for this purpose and made me get into it with him i remained until my health was completely re-established was treated by him with a sort of kindness which can only be expected from a very near relation i dined with a friend on st peter's day the twenty ninth of june and in the evening i proposed walking to the church dedicated to the saint as usual the blaze of light was great the congregation numerous and the whole affair very brilliant after the service we recognized a party of ladies with whom we were acquainted and one of them requested us to look for a young priest her son on making inquiries we were desired to walk upstairs into a large room over the vestry in which were several priests and a table covered with refreshments of many descriptions the young man came to us and was soon followed by others who invited us to stay and partake but we declined and went down to the party we had joined some of the priests accompanied us and persuaded the ladies to ascend and to have a share of the good things we were also requested to return which we did there were great quantities of fruit cakes sweetmeats and wine we met with the most marked attention from these ministers of the roman catholic religion greater politeness could not have been shown to any person many with whom we had not been acquainted before offered us wine and requested to be introduced to us i mentioned the conduct of these men more particularly as i think it showed a great deal of liberality and a wish to conciliate and more especially as there were likely several laymen present of their own nation footnote in speaking of the priesthood it must always be recollected that the secular and regular clergy are two different bodies of men and as distinct in their utility their knowledge and their manners as they are in their situation in life End footnote. about ten o'clock we left the church and taking one family of our party home remained with them until a very late hour we were invited to pass the following sunday with this family which consisted of the father and mother and a son and daughter they were all brazilians and though the young lady had never been from pernambuco her manners were easy and her conversation lively and entertaining her complexion was not darker than that of the portuguese in general her eyes and hair black and her features on the whole good her figure small but well shaped though i have seen others handsomer still this lady may be accounted a very fair sample of the white brazilian females but it is among the women of color that the finest persons are to be found more life and spirit more activity of mind and body 
they are better fitted to the climate, and the mixed race seems to be its proper inhabitant. Their features, too, are often good, and even the color, which in European climates is disagreeable, appears to appertain to that in which it more naturally exists. But this bar to European ideas of beauty set aside, finer specimens of the human form cannot be found than among the mulatto females whom I have seen. We went to them to breakfast, which was of coffee and cakes. Backgammon and cards were then introduced until dinner time at two o'clock. This consisted of great numbers of dishes placed upon the table without any arrangement, and brought in without any regard to the regularity of courses. We were, as may be supposed, rather surprised at being complimented with pieces of meat from the plates of various persons at the table. I've often met with this custom, particularly amongst families in the interior, and this I now speak of had only resided in Hesifi a short time, but many of the people of the town have other ideas on these matters. Two or three knives only were placed upon the table, which obliged each person to cut all the meat upon his own plate into small pieces, and pass the knife to his next neighbor. There was, however, a plentiful supply of silver forks, and abundance of plates. Garlic formed one ingredient in almost every dish, and we had a great deal of wine during the dinner. The moment we finished, everyone rose from the table, and removed into another apartment. At eight o'clock, a large party assembled to tea, and we did not take our departure until a very late hour. On our arrival at home, my friend and I sat together to consider of the transactions of the day, which we had thus passed entirely with the Brazilian family, and both agreed that we had been much amused, and that we had really felt much gratification, save the business at the dining table. The conversation was trifling but entertaining. There was much wit and sport. The ladies of the house, joined by several others in the evening, talked a great deal, and would allow of no subject into which they could not enter. It will be observed from what I have described, and from what I have still to mention, that no rule can be laid down for the society of the place in question. Families of equal rank and of equal wealth and importance are often of manners totally different. The fact is that society is undergoing a rapid change, not that the people imitate European customs, though these have some effect, but as there is more wealth, more luxuries are required, as there is more education, higher and more polished amusements are sought for. As the mind becomes more enlarged from intercourse with other nations, and from reading, many customs are seen in a different light, so that the same persons insensibly change, and in a few years ridicule and are disgusted with many of those very habits which, if they reflect for a moment, they will recollect were practiced but a short time before by themselves. On St. Anne's Day, the 29th of July, two young Englishmen and myself proceeded by invitation to the house of one of the first personages of Pernambuco, a man in place and a planter, possessing three sugar works in different parts of the country. About ten o'clock in the morning we embarked in a canoe, and were pulled and paddled across the bay, on the land side of the town. On our arrival upon the opposite shore, the tide was out, and the mud deep. In fear and trembling of our silks, two of us clung to the backs of the canoemen, who with some difficulty put us down safe on dry land. But the third, who was heavier, for some minutes debated whether to return home was not the better plan. However, he took courage, and was likewise safely conducted through this region of peril. We then walked up to the house, which covers much ground, and of which the apartments are spacious and all upon the first floor. The garden was laid out by this gentleman's father, in the old style of straight walks and trees cut into shapes. A large party was already assembling, as this was the anniversary of the birthday of our hostess. But the females were all ushered into one room, and the men into another. Cards and backgammon, as usual, were the amusements, but there was little of ease and freedom of conversation. At dinner the ladies all arranged themselves on one side, and the men opposite them. There were victuals of many kinds in great profusion, and much wine was drank. Some of the gentlemen who were intimately acquainted with the family, 
did not sit down at table, but assisted in attending upon the ladies. After dinner the whole party adjourned into a large hall, and country dancing being proposed and agreed to, fiddlers were introduced, and a little after seven o'clock about twenty couples commenced and continued this amusement until past two o'clock. Here was the ceremony of the last century in the morning, and in the evening the cheerfulness of an English party the present day. I never partook of one more pleasant. The conversation at times renewed was always genteel, but unceremonious, and I met with several well-educated persons, whose acquaintance I enjoyed during the remainder of my stay at this place. The rains this season had been very slight, and scarcely ever prevented our rides into the country in the neighborhood, to the distance of six or eight miles. But we never reached beyond the summer dwellings of the inhabitants of Hesifu. The villages are at this time very dull, having people of color and negroes as residents almost exclusively. However, as I was fond of the country, I was tempted by the fineness of the weather to remove entirely to a small cottage in the vicinity, where my time passed away pleasantly, though quietly, and in a manner very barren of events. There stands a hamlet not far distant from my new residence, called Casa Forche, formerly the site of a sugar plantation, which has been suffered to decay, and now the chapel alone remains to point out the exact position. The dwelling house of these works is said to have been defended by the Dutch against the Portuguese, who set fire to it for the purpose of obliging their enemies to surrender. A large open piece of ground is pointed out as having been the situation upon which these transactions took place. It is distant from Hesifi about five miles, and the river Capibaribe runs about three-quarters of a mile beyond it. I met with few of the peasants who had any knowledge of the Pernambucan war against the Dutch, but I heard this spot more frequently spoken of than any other. Footnote. I think that the Casa Forci and the Casas de Dona Ana Pais, of which an account is given in the History of Brazil, volume 2, page 124, distinguish the same place under different names. End footnote. Perhaps if I had more communication with the southern districts of Pernambuco, I should have discovered that the war was more vividly remembered there. I had an offer of introduction to another Brazilian family, which I readily accepted, and on the 7th of August I was summoned by my friend to accompany him to Olinda. He had been invited, and liberty had been given to take a friend. We went in a canoe and were completely wet through on the way, but we walked about the streets of Olinda until we were again dry. The family consisted of an old lady, her two daughters, and a son, who was a priest, and one of the professors or masters of the seminary. Several persons of the same class were present, of easy and gentlemanlike manners. Some of them proposed dancing, and although they did not join in the amusement, still they were highly pleased to see others entertained in this manner. Our music was a pianoforte, played by one of the professors, who good-humoredly continued until the dancers themselves begged him to desist. About midnight we left these pleasant people and returned to the beach. The tide was out, and the canoe upon dry land. We therefore determined to walk. The sand was very heavy, the distance three miles, and after our evening's amusement this was hard work. I did not attempt this night to go beyond Hesifi to my cottage, but accepted of a mattress at my friend's residence. Three or four families are in the practice of having weekly evening card parties, as was usual in Lisbon. I attended these occasionally, but in them there was no peculiarity of customs. The foregoing pages will, I think, suffice to point out the kind of society to be met with in Pernambuco, but this must be sought for, as the families in which it is to be found are not numerous. Of these very few are in trade. There are either Portuguese families, of which the chief is in office, or Brazilian planters who are wealthy and prefer residing in Recife or Olinda, or, as is frequently the case, a son or brother belonging to the secular priesthood has imbibed more liberal notions and has acquired a zest for rational society. As may naturally be supposed, the females of a family are always glad to be of more importance 
to be treated with respect, to see and to be seen. The merchants, generally speaking, for there do exist some exceptions, live very much alone. They have been originally from Portugal, have made fortunes in trade, and have married in the country. But most of them still continue to live as if they were not sufficiently wealthy, or at least cannot persuade themselves to alter their close and retired manner of living. And excepting in the summer months, when sitting upon the steps of their country residences, their families are not to be seen. The gentleman, chiefly by whose kindness I had been introduced and, and enabled to partake of the pleasantest society of Pernambuco, was among the first British subjects who availed themselves of the free communication between England and Brazil, and he even already observed a considerable change of manners in the highest class of people. The decrease in the price of all articles of dress, the facility of obtaining at a low rate earthenware, cutlery, and table linen, in fact, the very spur given to the mind by this appearance of a new people among them, the hope of a better state of things that their country was about to become of more importance, renewed in many persons ideas which had long lain dormant, made them wish to show that they had money to expend and that they knew how it should be expended. Footnote. When the Englishmen who first established themselves at Hesifi had finished the stock of tea which they had brought with them, they inquired where more could be purchased, and were directed to an apothecary shop. They went and asked simply for tea, when the man wished to know what kind of tea they meant. He at last understood them, and said, Oh, you want East India tea, Shada India, thus considering it as he would any other drug. But at the time of which I am now speaking, great quantities are consumed. And footnote. It was the custom in Pernambuco to uncover when passing a sentinel, or on meeting a guard of soldiers marching through the streets. Soon after the opening of the port to British shipping, three English gentlemen accidentally met a corporal's guard of four or five men, and as they passed each other, one of the latter took off the hat of one of the former, accompanying the action by an opprobrious expression. The Englishman resented the insult attacked and absolutely routed the guard. This dreadful mark of submission to military power was universally refused by every British subject, and has been very much discontinued even by the Portuguese. Another annoyance to these visitors was the usual respect paid to the sacrament, carried with much pomp and ceremony to persons dangerously ill. It was expected that everyone by whom it chanced to pass should kneel, and continue in that posture until it was out of sight. Here Englishmen, in some degree, conformed in proper deference to the religion of the country, but the necessity of this also is wearing off. Footnote. I once heard that a person who had been in England and had returned to Pernambuco observed that the two things which surprised him the most in the country were that the people did not die, and that the children spoke English, he was asked his reason for supposing that this first wonder was correct, to which he answered that he never had seen the sacrament taken to the sick. Close footnote. End of chapter 2the government, the taxes, the public institutions, criminals, prisons, military establishments, the island of Fernando de Noronha. The captaincies general, or provinces of the first rank in Brazil, of which Pernambuco is one, are governed by captains general, or governors, who are appointed for three years. At the end of this period, the same person is continued or not at the option of the supreme government. They are in fact absolute in power, but before the person who has been nominated to one of these places can exercise any of its functions, he is under the necessity of presenting his credentials to the Senado da Camara, the chamber or municipality of the principal town. This is formed of persons of respectability in the place. The governor has the supreme and sole command of the military force, the civil and criminal causes are discussed before and determined by 
the Ovidor, and Juiz de Fora, the two chief judicial officers, whose duties are somewhat similar, but the former is the superior in rank. They are appointed for three years, and the term may be renewed. Footnote. A Juiz Conservador, Judge Conservator, of the British nation, has been appointed for Pernambuco, but at the period of my departure from Hesifi, he was not arrived. Very soon after the commencement of a direct commercial intercourse with Great Britain, a vice council was appointed for Pernambuco by the council general at Rio de Janeiro. This person was superseded by a council sent out direct from England, who is subject to the council general of Brazil, but the place is disposed of by the government at home. And footnote. It is in these departments of the government that the opportunities of amassing large fortunes are most numerous, and certain it is that some individuals take advantage of them in a manner which renders justice but a name. The governor can determine in a criminal cause without appeal, but if he pleases he refers it to the competent judge. The procurador da Coroa, attorney general, is an officer of considerable weight. The intendente da Marinha, Port Admiral is likewise consulted on matters of first importance, as are also the Escrivam da Fazenda Real, Chief of the Treasury, and the Juiz da Alfandega, Comptroller of the Customs. These seven officers form the Junta or Council, which occasionally meets to arrange and decide upon the affairs of the captaincy to which they belong. The ecclesiastical government is scarcely connected with that above mentioned, and is administered by a bishop and a dean and chapter, with his vicar-general, etc. The governor cannot even appoint a chaplain to the island of Fernando de Noronha, one of the dependencies of Pernambuco, but acquaints the bishop that a priest is wanted, who then nominates one for the place. The number of civil and military officers is enormous. Inspectors innumerable, colonels without end, devoid of any objects to inspect, without any regiments to command, judges to manage each trifling department of which the duties might all be done by two or three persons. Thus salaries are augmented, the people are oppressed, but the state is not benefited. Taxes are laid where they fall heavy upon the lower class, and none are levied where they could well be borne. A tenth is raised in kind upon cattle, poultry, and agriculture, and even upon salt. This in former times appertained, as in other Christian countries, to the clergy. Footnote. When Brazil was in its infancy, the clergy could not subsist upon their tithes, and therefore petitioned the government of Portugal to pay them a certain stipend and receive the tenths for its own account. This was accepted. But now that the tents have increased in value twentyfold, the government still pays to the vicars the same stipends. The clergy of the present day bitterly complain of the agreement made by those to whom they have seceded. And footnote. All the taxes are farmed to the highest bidders, and this among the rest. They are parceled out in extensive districts, and are contracted for at a reasonable rate but the contractors again dispose of their shares in small portions. These are again retailed to other persons, and as a profit is obtained by each transfer, the people must be oppressed that these men may satisfy those above them and enrich themselves. The system is in itself bad, but is rendered still heavier by this division of the spoil. The tenth of cattle, as I have already said, is levied in kind upon the estates in the interior of the country, and besides this, a duty of 320 hayes per ahoba of 32 pounds is paid upon the meat at the shambles, which amounts to about 25 per cent. Fish pays the tenth and afterwards a fifteenth. Every transfer of immovable property is subject to a duty of 10 per cent, and movables to 5 per cent. Besides these, there are many other taxes of minor importance. Rum, both for exportation and home consumption, pays a duty of 80 hayes por canada, which is sometimes a fourth of its value. 
but may be reckoned as from fifteen to twenty per cent. Footnote. A great confusion exists in Brazil respecting measures. Every captaincy has its own, agreeing neither with those of its neighbors nor with the measures of Portugal, though the same names are used invariably. Thus a canada and an alquiere in Pernambuco represents a much greater quantity than the same denominations in Portugal, and less than in some of the other provinces of Brazil. End footnote. Cotton pays the tenth, and is again taxed at the moment of exportation, six hundred hayes per ahoba of thirty-two pounds, or about one and a quarter cents per pound. Nothing can be more injudicious than this double duty upon the chief article of exportation from that country to Europe. The duties at the custom house are fifteen per cent upon imports, of which the valuation is left in some measure to the merchant to whom the property belongs. Here I think ten per cent more might be raised without being felt. A tax is paid at Pernambuco for lighting the streets of the Rio de Janeiro whilst those of Hesifi remain in total darkness. Now, although the expenses of the provincial governments are great and absorb a very considerable proportion of the receipts, owing to the number of officers employed in every department, still the salaries of each are, in most instances, much too small to afford a comfortable subsistence. Consequently, peculation, bribery, and other crimes of the same description are to be looked for and they become so frequent as to escape all punishment or even notice, though there are some men whose character is without reproach. The governor of Pernambuco receives a salary of four million hayes, or about one thousand pounds per annum. Can this be supposed to be sufficient for a man, in his responsible situation, even in a country in which articles of food are cheap? His honor, however, is unimpeached, not one instance did I ever hear mentioned of improper conduct in him. But the temptation and the opportunities of amassing money are very great, and few are the persons who can resist them. The only manufactory in Hesifi of any importance is that of gold and silver trinkets of every description and of gold lace. But the quantities made of either are only sufficient for the demand of the place. The women employ themselves very generally in making thread lace and in embroidery, but the manufacture of these articles is not sufficiently extensive to allow of exportation. Footnote. A patent has been obtained, and a manufactory established upon a large scale for making cordage, from the outward rind of the cocoa nut. Ropes of this description are, I believe, much used in the East Indies. End footnote. The public institutions are not many, but of those that exist, some are excellent. The seminary at Olinda for the education of young persons is well conducted, and many of its professors are persons of knowledge and of liberality. It is intended principally to prepare the students for the church as secular priests, and therefore all of them wear a black gown and a cap of a peculiar form but it is not necessary that they should ultimately take orders. Free schools are also established in most of the small towns in the country, in some of which the Latin language is taught, but the major part are adapted only to give instruction in reading, writing, and arithmetic. Neither in these nor in the seminary is any expense incurred by the pupils. The Lazarus Hospital is neglected, but patients are admitted. The other establishments for the sick are miserable. Strange it is that fine churches should be built whilst many individuals are suffered to perish from want of a suitable building under which to shelter them. But the best institution of which Pernambuco has to boast, in common with the mother country, is the Joda dos Injetados. Infants of doubtful birth are received, taken care of, reared, and provided for. Every person knows what the wheel of a convent is, a cylindrical box open on one side which is fixed in the wall and turns upon a pivot. Near to this is placed a bell, to be rung when anything is put into the box, that the inhabitants of the convent may know when it should be turned. One of these wheels stands ready night and day to receive the child, 
the bell is rung and the box turns thus the lives of many are saved thus numbers are spared from shame never let it be imagined that births of a secret nature will be more frequent from the consideration that this institution exists but it removes all motives for unnatural conduct in a mother and it may sometimes produce reform of future conduct by the facility afforded of concealing what is already past the friars are not numerous though they are far too much so these useless beings amount to about one hundred and fifty in number at olinda hisifi iguarasu and Pariba. footnote an old woman applied at the gates of a convent late one evening and told the porter an old friar who was quite blind that she wished one of the brothers to go with her for the purpose of confessing a sick person the old man with perfect unconcern gave her to understand that they were all out adding but if you will go to the garden gate and wait there some of them will soon be creeping in the younger members of the franciscan order enjoy very much the duty of going out to beg as opportunities offer of amusing themselves a guardian was chosen at Pareipa some years ago who examined the chest in which the money belonging to the community was kept and on finding a considerable sum in it gave orders that no one should go out to beg he was a conscientious man and said that as they had already enough the people must not be importuned for more until what they possessed was finished he kept the whole community within the walls of the convent for the term of two or three years for which each guardian is appointed on another occasion the friars of a franciscan convent chose for their guardian a young man whose life had been very irregularly spent in anything rather than the duties of his calling under the idea that during the continuance of his guardianship they would lead a merry life that very little attention would be paid to the rules and regulations of the order but they were mistaken he changed his habits as soon as he found himself at their head the gates were rigidly closed at the proper hour and according to the old and vulgar proverb of set a thief etc the duties of the convent were performed with much greater austerity than before and footnote but there are no nuns in the province though of these establishments called hecolimentos or retreats three exist these are directed by elderly females who have not taken any vows and who educate young persons of their own sex and receive individuals whose conduct has been incorrect but whose characters are not notorious and who are placed here by their relations to prevent further shame the number of churches chapels and niches and the streets for saints is quite preposterous to these are attached a multitude of religious lay brotherhoods of which the members are merchants and other persons in trade and even some are composed of mulatto and black free people some of these continually beg for a supply of wax and other articles to be consumed in honor of their patron almost every day in the year passengers are importuned in the streets and the inhabitants in their houses by some of these people and among others by the lazy franciscan friars a portuguese gentleman refused to give money for any of these purposes but after each application threw in a bag placed apart for the purpose a five hase coin the smallest in use and in value the third part of a penny at the end of a twelfth month he counted his five hase pieces and found that they amounted to thirty thousand hays or about eight pounds six shillings he then applied to the vicar of his parish requesting him to name some distressed person to which he should give the money the holy office or inquisition has never had an establishment in brazil but several priests resided in pernambuco employed as its familiars and sometimes persons judged amenable to this most horrid tribunal have been sent under confinement to lisbon however the ninth article of the treaty of friendship and alliance between the crowns of england and portugal signed at the rio de janeiro in eighteen ten has completely determined that the power of the inquisition shall not be recognized in brazil 
will appear surprising to english persons that in a place so large as hesifi there should be no printing press or bookseller at the convent of the madre de deus are sold almanacs prints and histories of the virgin and saints and other productions of the same description but a very limited size printed at lisbon the post office is conducted in a very irregular manner the letters from england are usually delivered at the house of the merchant to whom the ship which conveyed them is consigned or at the office of the british consul there is no established means of forwarding letters to any part of the interior of the country nor along the coast so that the post office merely receives the letter bags which are brought by the small vessels that trade with other ports along this coast and sends the bags from pernambuco by the same conveyances and as there is not any regular delivery of letters each person must inquire for his own at the office when the commerce of brazil was trifling compared to its present state a post office managed in this manner was sufficient but in consequence of the increased activity of the trade along the coast and with europe some attention ought to be given to the subject to facilitate communication there is a theatre at hesifi in which are performed portuguese farces but the establishment is most wretchedly conducted the botanic garden at olinda is one of these institutions which have arisen from the removal of the court to south america it is intended as a nursery for exotic plants from whence they are to be distributed to those persons who are willing and capable of rearing them thus the breadfruit tree has been introduced the black pepper plant the large otahetan cane and several others i much fear however that the zeal shown at the commencement has somewhat cooled a botanist has been appointed with an adequate salary he is a frenchman who had resided at cayenne and with this choice many persons were much dissatisfied as it was thought and with good reason that a portuguese subject might have been found quite capable of taking the management of the garden the sight of all others the most offensive to an englishman is that of the criminals who perform the menial offices of the palace the barracks the prisons and other public buildings they are chained in couples and each couple is followed by a soldier armed with a bayonet they are allowed to stop at the shops to obtain any trifle which they wish to purchase and it is disgusting to see with what unconcern the fellows bear this most disgraceful situation laughing and talking as they go along to each other to their acquaintance whom they may chance to meet and to the soldier who follows them as a guard footnote an anecdote was related to me of one of these couples which occurred some years ago under a former governor a solitary passenger between olinda and hesifi witnessed part of the following scene and the remainder was described by one of the actors in it a couple of criminals of which one was a white man and the other a negro accompanied by their guard were walking over the sands to reach a ford and cross the river at its narrowest part three horsemen one of whom led a fourth horse saddled and bridled rode up and one of them knocked the soldier down whilst the white man of the chained couple urged his companion to go with him to the led horse and mount up behind him this the black man refused to do when one of the horsemen who seemed to direct the others called out cut the fellow's leg off the criminals are secured to each other by the ankle the negro now agreed and both mounted the horse and the whole party galloped away first binding the soldier hand and foot they passed through olinda at full speed and when they had arrived at some distance a large fire was made use of and the negro was set down with all the chains and bolts the party then proceeded and were never afterwards heard of it was imagined that the man who had made his escape in this manner was the relation of a rich person in the interior who had either committed some crime or had been thus unjustly punished and footnote the prisons are in a very bad state little attention being paid to the situation of their inhabitants executions are rare at pernambuco the most usual punishment inflicted even for crimes of the first magnitude is transportation to the coast of africa white persons must be removed for trial to bahia 
for crimes of which the punishment is death even to pass sentence of death upon a man of color or a negro several judicial officers must be present there does not exist here a regular police when an arrest is to be effected in hesifi or its neighborhood two officers of justice are accompanied by soldiers from one or other of the regiments of the line for this purpose a honda or patrol consisting of soldiers parades the streets during the night at stated periods but it is not of much service to the town hesifi and its vicinity were formerly in a very tranquil state owing to the exertions of one individual he was sergeant in the regiment of hesifi a courageous man whose activity of mind and body had had no field upon which to act until he was employed in the arduous task of apprehending criminals and at last he received special orders from the governor for patrolling the streets of hesifi olinda and the villages around them he and his followers were much dreaded but at his death no one stepped into his place footnote lately a cadet has come forward and has taken the direction of these matters he has apprehended several persons of infamous characters but of determined courage he has done much good risking his life under circumstances of great danger and even to extreme rashness has he been carried by his zeal this young man well deserves promotion that thus the police should fall into the hands of inferior officers shows the irregular footing upon which it stands eighteen fourteen and footnote the military establishment is much neglected the regular troops consist of two regiments of infantry which ought to form together a body of two thousand five hundred men but they seldom collect more effectives than six hundred so that sufficient numbers can scarcely be mustered to do the duty of the town of Hesifi of Olinda and the forts. Their pay is less than two and three-quarters cents per day, and a portion of the flour of the mangioke weekly, and their clothing is afforded to them very irregularly. From their miserable pay, rather more than one farthing per day is held back for a religious purpose. Recruits are made of some of the worst individuals, in the province this mode of recruiting and their most wretched pay account completely for the depreciated character of the soldiers of the line footnote the arrival of another colonel to the regiment of hesifi and the increase of activity in the officers has altered its appearance much for the better the regiment of olinda or of artillery has been also much improved by the attention of its colonel and the entrance into it of several well-educated Brazilian officers of the first families. And footnote. They are formed chiefly of Brazilians and people of color. Besides these regiments, the militia of the town sometimes do duty without pay, and these make but a sorry show. The militia regiments, commanded by mulatto and black officers, and formed entirely of men of these castes, are very superior in appearance but these I shall have again an opportunity of mentioning. There is one political arrangement of this province which, above all others, cries aloud for alteration. It is a glaring, self-evident evil. It is a disgrace upon the government which suffers its existence. I speak of the small island of Fernando de Noronha. To this spot are transported, for a number of years or for life, a great number of male criminals no females are permitted to visit the island the garrison consisting of about one hundred and twenty men is relieved yearly it is a very difficult matter to obtain a priest to serve for a twelvemonth as chaplain in the island when the bishop is applied to by the governor for a person of this calling he sends some of his ecclesiastical officers in search of one the persons of the profession who are liable to be sent conceal themselves, and the matter usually concludes by a young priest being literally pressed into the service. The vessel employed between Hesifi and the island visits at twice the same period, and carries provisions, clothing, and other articles to the miserable beings who are compelled to remain there, and for the troops. I have conversed with persons who have resided upon it, and the accounts I have heard of the enormities committed there are most horrible crimes punished capitally or 
severely in civilized states or which at least are held in general abhorrence are here practiced talked of publicly acknowledged without shame and without remorse strange it is that the dreadful state of this place should have so long escaped the notice of the supreme government of brazil but the evil ends not here the individuals who return to pernambuco cannot shake off the remembrance of crimes which have become familiar to them the powers likewise conceded to the commandant whose will is absolute have oftentimes proved too great for due performance punishment seldom follows the most wanton tyranny may be practised almost without fear of retribution the climate of the island is good and the small portion of it admitting of cultivation i have understood from competent authority to be of extraordinary fertility it does not however afford any shelter for shipping the supineness of the ancient system upon which brazil was ruled is still too apparent throughout but the removal of the sovereign to that country has roused many persons who had been long influenced by habits of indolence and has increased the activity of others who have impatiently awaited a field for its display the brazilians feel of more importance their native soil now gives law to the mother country their spirit long kept under severe subjection to ancient colonial rules and regulations has now had some opportunities of showing itself as proof that though of long suffering and of patient endurance it does exist and that if its possessors are not treated as men instead of children it will break forth and rend asunder those shackles to which they have forbearingly submitted i hope however most sincerely that the supreme government may see the necessity of reformation and that the people will not expect too much but consider that many hardships are preferable to a generation of bloodshed confusion and misery freedom of communication with other nations has already been of service to the country and the benefits which it imparts are daily augmenting the shoot from our european continent will ultimately increase and a plant will spring up infinitely more important than the branch from which it proceeded and though the season of this maturity is far distant yet the rapidity of its advance or tardiness of its growth greatly depends upon the fostering care or indifferent negligence of its rulers still whatever the conduct of these may be its extent its fertility and other numerous advantages must in the course of time give to it that rank which it has a right to claim among the great nations of the world end of chapter three Chapter Four of Travels in Brazil, Volume One by Henry Coster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four Journey to Guyana, Journey from Guyana to Paraiba, and back to Guyana. I had much desired to perform some considerable journey into the less populous and less cultivated part of the country the chief engineer officer of pernambuco had intended to visit all the fortresses within his extensive district and had kindly promised to permit me to accompany him but unfortunately his projected journey was delayed from some cause connected with his place until the following season as i did not know how soon i might be under the necessity of returning to england i could not postpone my views for this length of time therefore made inquiries among my friends and acquaintance and discovered that the brother of a gentleman resident at guiana was about to set off for that place and would probably from thence proceed further into the country with some object in view connected with trade it was my intention to advance as far as Ceará. i applied to the governor for a passport which was immediately granted without any difficulty on the afternoon of the 19th of October, 1810, some of my English friends accompanied me to my cottage at the Cruz das Almas, that they might be present at my departure in the course of the ensuing night. Señor Feliz, my companion, arrived in the evening, bringing with him his black guide, a freeman. Preparations were made for proceeding upon our journey, 
and about one o'clock as the moon rose we sallied forth senor feliz myself and my english servant john on horseback armed with swords and pistols the black guide also on horseback without saddle or bridle carrying a blunderbuss and driving on before him a baggage horse with a little mulatto boy mounted between the panniers my english friends cheered us as we left the cruise and remained in my quarters the command of which i had given up to one of them during my absence that part of the road which we traversed by moonlight i had already passed over a short time before and subsequently from frequent travelling my acquaintance with it was such that i might have become a guide upon it we rode along a sandy path for three-quarters of a league till we began to ascend a steep hill of which the sides and the flat summit are covered with large trees and thick brushwood growing beneath them the hamlet of be beripe stands at the foot of the corresponding declivity to this place several families resort in the summer and a small rivulet runs through it of which the water is most beautifully clear half a league beyond beberipe we crossed another rivulet and immediately afterwards commenced our ascent of the hill of Gebrasu, which is in most parts very steep and very narrow being enclosed on one side by a precipice and on the other by sloping ground covered with wood this ridge of hill is quite flat along the top and the path continues for half a league between lofty trees and impenetrable brushwood we descended into the long and narrow valley of meruera through which a rivulet runs of which the water never fails the hills on each side are thickly clothed with wood and in the valley are scattered several cottages banana gardens and mangiac lands with a large enclosed piece of ground in which cattle graze the ascent on the opposite side of this beautiful vale is very steep the path along the summit of the ridge is similar to that over which we had travelled we soon again descended and on our arrival at the bottom entered the long straggling village of parachipe with mangioc lands and plantain and tobacco gardens intermixed with the houses the inhabitants are mostly labouring free persons white mulatto and black the houses are built on each side of the road at intervals for the distance of one mile a rivulet runs through it which in the rainy season often overflows its banks to a considerable distance on each side beyond this village the road is comparatively flat but is still diversified by unequal small elevations several sugar works are seen and great numbers of small cottages the passing of the country people with loaded horses carrying cotton hides and other articles the produce of the country and returning with many kinds of wares salt meat and fish from hesifi may almost be called continual the town of iguarasu which we now entered has already been mentioned in a former chapter it is one of the oldest settlements upon this part of the coast and stands at the distance of two leagues from the sea upon the banks of a creek the woods that border the paths or roads are in part so thick and close as to be impassable even to a man on foot unless he carries in his hand a billhook or hatchet to assist in breaking through the numberless obstacles which oppose his progress of these the most formidable is the sipo a plant consisting of long and flexible shoots which twist themselves around the trees and as some of the sprouts which have not yet fixed upon any branch are moved to and fro by the wind they catch upon a neighboring tree and as the operation continues for many years undisturbed a kind of network is made of irregular form but difficult to pass through of this plant there are several varieties that which bears the name of sipo kururu is in the highest estimation from its superior size and strength and likewise from its great flexibility several kinds of sipo are used as cordage in making fences and for many other purposes iguarasu is partly situated upon a hill and partly in the plain below where a rivulet runs and a stone bridge has been built as the tide reaches this spot and would render the communication difficult footnote 
the lower part of the town is the site of the siege which in its infancy the settlement sustained against the savages as is related by hans stad the first traveller who wrote any account of brazil history of brazil volume one page forty six and footnote the place plainly denotes that it has enjoyed greater prosperity than it at present has to boast of many of the houses are of two stories but they are neglected and some of the small cottages are in decay and ruin the streets are paved but are much out of repair and grass grows in many of them it contains several churches one convent and a hecolimento or retreat for females a town hall and prison its affluence proceeded formerly from the weekly cattle fair which was held upon a plain in the vicinity but this has now for some years past been removed to the neighborhood of Guayana. Iguarasu has many white inhabitants, several shops, a good surgeon, who was educated in Lisbon, and it is the resort of the planters, to the distance of several leagues, for the embarkation of their sugar chests, and for the purchase of some articles of necessity. The town contains about 800 inhabitants, reckoning the scattered cottages in the outskirts the view from the tower of the principal church is said to be extensive and grand the only regular inn of which the country has to boast is established here for the convenience of passengers between hesifi and guayana and at this we intended to have stopped had not the early hour at which we reached it tempted us to push forwards before the sun became more powerful footnote i had frequent opportunities afterwards of resting at this inn on one of these i happened to ask for salt which is not usually placed upon the table the master of the house in the customary familiar manner of the country expressed his surprise at the additional quantity of salt which i wished for but it was brought to me and nothing further was said this occurred in the morning soon after our arrival at the place at dinner to our dismay the soup and almost all the other dishes were so plentifully supplied with the unfortunate ingredient as to be scarcely eatable we complained of this to the master who answered why i thought you liked salt cuide que era amigos de sal and footnote the road continues flat and sandy and two leagues beyond iguarasu we enter the village of pasmado which is built in the form of a square it consists of a church and a number of cottages most of them of mean appearance containing from three hundred to four hundred inhabitants we proceeded through it crossed the most considerable stream we had yet seen this day called araripe and entered the enclosed field attached to the ingenio or sugar works of araripe jibaishu belonging to a portuguese we expected to have obtained a dinner from this good man but after considerable delay to the great discomfort of our stomachs we understood from our host that his intended hospitality would not be in readiness till the day would have been too much broken into by the additional delay therefore we again mounted our horses about two o'clock with a broiling sun ascended another steep hill passed several sugar works and cottages and crossed several rivulets traversing a most delightful country we rode through the hamlets of bu and fontainas at the former of which there is a chapel from the latter the road is chiefly over a sandy plain almost without wood until the ingenio of bu Giri is discovered with its field of grass and woods around immediately beyond it is to be forted the river of guayana influenced by the tide as far as this spot the wooden bridge which formerly existed was now fast decaying and dangerous for horses we gave ours to the guide who led them through the water riding upon his own whilst we found our way across some loose beams this operation did not delay us long we received our steeds from the guide with their saddles wet and themselves all dripping and in a few minutes more entered the town of guayana between four and five o'clock in the afternoon the distance from Hesifi to Guayana is fifteen leagues. 
the road we had travelled over is the highway from the Sertão. Footnote. Is this word abbreviated from desertum, used as an augmentative, according to the Portuguese custom, for deserto, and footnote, by which the cattle descend from the estates upon the river Assu, and from the plains of this portion of the interior to the markets of Hesifi. Therefore the continued passage of large droves of cattle has beat down the underwood and made a broad sandy road. The large trees still remain, when it has been so happened that any grew upon the track. These, if of any considerable size, brave the crowd of animals, and will remain either until they decay from age and fall, or till regular roads begin to be constructed in Brazil. Thus, when the ground is flat, the road is not bad, but upon the sides of hills, instead of being carried round the steepest ascents, the track has been made straight up and down, or nearly so, and the winter torrents form deep caverns and ravines, the sides of which sometimes fall in and make the roads very dangerous, so that, unless well acquainted with a hill, it is by no means safe to ascend or descend by night. As one or two days of the usual rain of Brazil may have made a great difference and have rendered the road impassable. In the course of this day we saw four or five large and rudely constructed crosses erected by the roadside, pointing out the situations upon which murder had been committed. I was received most kindly by Signor Joaquim, whom I had before had the pleasure of meeting at Hesifi, and he was not a man difficult to become acquainted with. We sat down to dinner, about five o'clock, when his lady and two little girls, his daughters, made their appearance. We had dishes cooked in Portuguese, Brazilian, and English style. The town of Goiana, one of the largest and most flourishing in the captaincy of Pernambuco, is situated upon the banks of a river of the same name, which at this spot bends so considerably that the town is almost surrounded by it. The dwellings, with one or two exceptions, have only the ground floor. The streets are not paved, but are broad and of these the principal one is of sufficient breadth to admit of a large church at one extremity, and the continuation of a street of considerable width on each side of the church. The town contains a Carmelite convent and several other places of worship. The inhabitants are in number between four and five thousand, and it is an increasing place. Several shops are established here and the commerce with the interior is considerable. In the streets are always to be seen numbers of the matutos, countrymen, either selling produce or purchasing manufactured goods and other articles of consumption. In the vicinity are many fine sugar plantations. I suppose that some of the best lands in the province are in this neighborhood. The proprietors of these occasionally reside in the town and as daily intercourse often creates rivalry among wealthy families, this necessarily increases expenditure, and the town is, in consequence, much benefited by the augmented consumption of luxuries. The planters have the advantage of water carriage from hence to Hesifi for their sugar chests, as this river is one of the largest, for many leagues to the north or to the south and is influenced by the tide even to a short distance above the town. Guayana stands four leagues distant from the sea in a direct line, but by the river it is reckoned to be seven. Above the town, in the rainy season, the river overflows its banks to a great extent. Guayana and its extensive district is subject in military affairs to the governor of Pernambuco but its civil concerns are directed by a Jewish Jifora, a judicial officer appointed by the supreme government for the term of three years, who resides in the town, and from his decisions appeal may be made to the Ovador of Paraiba. We dined on one occasion with the proprietor of the Mazumbo estate. This gentleman and a few others, besides ourselves, dined in one apartment, whilst the ladies, of whom we were not permitted even to have a transient view, were in another adjoining. Two young men, sons of the proprietor, 
assisted their father's slaves in waiting upon us at dinner and did not sit down themselves until we rose from table the owner of the place is a portuguese and it is among this portion of the population who have left their own country to accumulate fortunes in brazil that the introduction of improvement is almost impossible many brazilians likewise even of the higher class follow the moorish customs of subjection and seclusion but these soon see the preference which ought to be given to more civilized manners and easily enter into more polished habits if they have any communication with the towns on the twenty fourth of october i delivered a letter of introduction which i had obtained at Recife to dr manuel ajuda da camara this interesting person then lay at guayana very ill of dropsy brought on by residing in aguish districts he was an enterprising man and had always been an enthusiast in botany his superior abilities would have caused him to be caressed by a provident government when one of this description is establishing itself in an uncultivated but improving country he showed me some of his drawings which i thought well executed i never again had an opportunity of seeing him for when i had returned from ceara i had not time to inquire and seek for him and he died before my second voyage to pernambuco he was forming a flora pernambucana which he did not live to complete senor joaquim had business at paraiba which he intended to have sent his brother feliz to transact but as i offered to accompany him he thought it would be pleasant to go with me and show the lions of that city we sent off his black guide and my servant with a loaded horse before us and followed the next day with his black boy we crossed the campinas de guayana grande about sunrise and passed the sugar plantation of that name belonging to senor giram standing at the foot of the hill which carries you to the dois rios the road i afterwards followed to rio grande is through dois rios but the road to paraiba strikes off just before you reach it to the right the road between guayana and paraiba presents nothing particularly interesting the hills are steep but not high and woods plantations and cottages are as usual the objects to be seen the distance is thirteen leagues we entered the city of paraiba at twelve o'clock and rode to the house of the colonel mateos da gama a man of property and a colonel of militia he was an acquaintance of senor joaquim and was about to leave the place for one of his sugar plantations which he did giving us entire possession of his house and a servant to attend upon us the city of paraiba for much smaller places even than this bear the rank of city in these yet thinly peopled regions contains from two to three thousand inhabitants including the lower town it bears strong marks of having been a place of more importance than it is now and though some improvements were going on they were conducted entirely through the means which government supplied for them or rather the governor wished to leave some memorial of his administration of the province the principal street is broad and paved with large stones but is somewhat out of repair the houses are mostly of one story with the ground floors as shops and a few of them have glass windows an improvement which has been only lately introduced into Hesifi. the jesuits convent is employed as the governor's palace and the ovador's office and residence also the church of the convent stands in the centre and these are the two wings the convents of the franciscan carmelite and benedictine orders are very large buildings and are almost uninhabited the first contains four or five friars the second two and the third only one besides these the city has to boast of six churches the public fountains at paraiba are the only works of the kind i met with anywhere on the part of the coast which i visited one was built i believe by amaro joaquim the former governor it is handsome and has several spouts the other which was only then building is much larger and the superintendence of the workmen was the chief amusement of the governor we waited upon this gentleman the day after our arrival my companion had been acquainted with him in lisbon when he was an ensign 
His parents were respectable people in one of the northern provinces of Portugal. He was placed at some seminary for the purpose of being educated for the church, but he escaped from thence and enlisted as a private soldier in Lisbon. One of the officers of the regiment in which he was enrolled soon found out that he was a man of education. Having learned his story, he was made a cadet as being of good family. He came over in the same ship with the Princess of Brazil, a captain of infantry, married one of the maids of honor on their arrival at Rio de Janeiro, and in about eighteen months had advanced from a captaincy to the government of Paraíba and a commandery of the Order of Christ. We next crossed to the other wing of the building and paid a visit to the Ovador. A very affable and good-humored old gentleman, his chaplain, a jolly little friar, and an old acquaintance of Signor Joaquim, made his appearance and was afterwards very civil to us during our stay. The prospect from the windows presents Brazil's scenery of the best kind, extensive and evergreen woods, dotted by a range of hills and watered by several branches of the river, with here and there a whitewashed cottage placed upon their banks, and these, though they were situated on the higher spots of land, were still half concealed by the lofty trees. The cultivated specks were so small as to be scarcely perceptible. The lower town consists of small houses, and is situated upon the borders of a spacious basin or lake, formed by the junction of three rivers, which from hence discharge their waters into the sea, by one considerable stream. The banks of the basin are covered with mangroves, as in all the salt rivers of this country, and they are so close and thick that there seems to be no outlet. I did not follow the river down to the sea, but I understand that there are in it some fine islands, with good land, quite uncultivated. Footnote. A person with whom I was afterwards acquainted has since cleared one of these islands, and has formed some salt works upon it. End footnote. Paraíba was the scene of much fighting during the Dutch War, and I now regret not having proceeded down the river to the famous fort of Cabedelo. This war was conducted upon a small scale, but the deeds which were performed by the brave defenders of their country may rank with those which any other people have displayed in a cause of equal import to the actors. The trade of Paraíba is inconsiderable, though the river admits of vessels of 150 tons upon the bar, and when in the basin, opposite to the lower town, a rope yarn would keep them still, as no harm could reach them. It contains a regular custom house, which is seldom open. Paraíba lies out of the road from the Sertão to Recife, that is, out of the direct way from the towns upon the coast further north. Footnote. The word Sertão is used rather indefinitely, as it does not only mean the interior of the country, but likewise a great part of the coast, of which the population is yet scanty, receives this general name. Thus the whole of the country between Rio Grande and Paraíba is called Sertão. Paraíba is a small province, situated between Sierra and Maranhão. End footnote. The inhabitants of the Sertão of the interior will make for Recife rather than Paraíba as the more extensive market for their produce. The port of Recife admits of larger vessels, and has more conveniences for the landing and shipment of goods. Consequently, it obtains the preference. The houses of this place, which may be reckoned handsome from the general comparison of the country, have been built by the great landholders in the neighborhood as a residence during the depth of the winter, or rainy season. The lands of the captaincy are, generally speaking, rich and fertile, but so great a preference is given to plantations nearer to Hesifi that those of Paraíba are to be purchased at a much less price. The sugar of this province is reckoned equal to that of any part of Brazil. I soon saw what was to be seen, and we had no society. Time, however, did not appear to hang heavy, for Signor Joaquim was a man of inexhaustible good humor and hilarity. We lived, as it were, by magic, 
as the colonel had ordered his servant to supply everything for us. The late governor, Amato Joaquim, brought the captaincy into great order by his necessary severity. A custom prevailed of persons walking about the town at night in large cloaks and crape over their faces, thus concealed to carry on their irregular practices. The governor, not being able to discover who these persons were, gave orders one night for the parole to take into custody all who were so dressed. This was done, and some of the principal inhabitants were found the next morning in the guardhouse. A man of the name of Nogueira, the son of a black or mulatto woman, and of one of the first men in the captaincy, had made himself much dreaded by his outrageous proceedings. He had carried from their parents' houses the daughters of some persons of respectability in the captaincy, murdering the friends and relatives who opposed his entrance. The man was at last taken. Amado Joaquim would have had him executed, but he found that this was not to be done, from the interest which the family made for him, and therefore ordered him to be flogged. Nogueira said that being half a fidalgo, a nobleman, this mode of punishment could not be practiced upon him. The government then ordered that he should be flogged upon only one side of his body, that his fidalgo side might not suffer. Desiring Nogueira to say which was his fidalgo side, he was accordingly punished in this manner, and after remaining some time in prison, was sent to Angola for life. The city of Paraiba still enjoys the good effects of Amar Joaquim's strict government. I was acquainted with him at Pernambuco before I set off on this journey. His appearance and his conversation both bespoke a man of superior abilities. When I saw him in Hesifi, he was on his way to Piauí, of which captaincy he had been appointed governor. He died on board a coasting vessel on the passage to Piauí of a fever. Senor Joaquim wished to return by the seashore to Guayana, a distance of twenty-two leagues. We set off at the time the tide was flowing, and proceeded along the beach, until about eleven o'clock we reached the house of a Capitan Mor, quite a first-rate man in this part of the world. It was a mud cottage, as bad or worse than that of any laborer in England, situated upon the burning sands, with a pool of salt water before the door, which is never quite dry consequently breeds insects of all kinds. We crossed two ferries in the course of the morning. The conveyances are small jangathas. Footnote. The rafts employed upon small rivers are of a construction similar to those already described on a former occasion, save that still less workmanship is bestowed upon them. End footnote. The saddle is placed upon it, and the horse swims by the side whilst the rider stands upon the raft and holds the reins. The ferryman either paddles across the stream or pulls, if it is not too deep. About three o'clock we found that we had entered upon a considerable tract of sand, enclosed by perpendicular rocks, against which the watermark was at some height. However, the tide was already on the ebb. We made our guide mount the horse, which until now he had driven before him, and keep pace with us, whilst we quickened ours. The tide was still very near to the rocks, and we found that the water still reached one which projected further than the rest. Therefore, as we were yet hemmed in, we left our horses and climbed up this rock. The guide, in the meantime, drove the loose horses into the water. They fortunately leaned to the right, passed out far enough to see the land on the other side of the rock, and made for it. I was getting over the rock, missed my footing, and fell up to my arms into a hole between two pieces of it. However, I succeeded in raising myself, and leaped from it to the sand on the other side, just at the return of a wave, by which means I had an unintentional cold bath up to my waist. We might certainly have waited to allow the tide to retreat, but were afraid of being benighted, which, after all our exertions, did happen to us. The country on the other side of the projecting rock is low and sandy, uncultivated land. At dusk we arrived upon the banks of a broad stream, so that by the light which then remained, we could not see the other side. After several calls, the ferryman did not make his appearance, 
and the night closed in. I advised sleeping under the tree, which then sheltered us. To this my companion would not consent, but asked the distance to Abiya, the nearest sugar plantation. The guide answered three leagues. We must either sleep where we were, or go to Abiya. We had already advanced sixteen leagues, and Senor Joaquim's horse, a fine highly fed animal, began to give way. The guide led, and we followed through a narrow path, very little frequented, as the bushes oftentimes nearly took off our hats, and were continually brushing against us the whole way. On our arrival at Habia the house was quite deserted, as the steward was from home, and we did not like to enter a cottage which stood near to the principal house, when we found that the party in it was larger than our own, and not likely to be of the best kind. We had now another half-league to go to Signor Leonardo's, a friend of my fellow traveller. He gave us a good supper and hammocks, took care of our horses, and in the morning we set forth for Guayana, seven leagues. We passed through Alhandra, an Indian village, containing about six hundred inhabitants. This village is not so regularly built as many of the others which I have seen. Instead of a square, with houses on each side, it is built in streets, and though the square is preserved, still it is not the principal feature of the place. The Indians of Alhandra, from their vicinity to Guayana, which is distant about three leagues, are not so pure as those further from a large town, and they have admitted among them some mamelucos and mestizos. Great part of this extent of coast was uninhabited, but wherever the land was low and the surf not violent, there we found a few cottages. The banks of the rivers were also not entirely destitute of inhabitants. The two streams which we first crossed might be about eighty or one hundred yards in breadth. They are deep, but do not proceed far into the country. When the action of the tide ceases, all these lesser streams become insignificant, and most of them quite dry. The great river which we were to have crossed is the Guayana. It spreads very widely when the tide enters, but is easily passed at the ebb, and the channel becomes much contracted, and very shallow during the spring tides. It is judged to be about a league in breadth at its mouth. End of chapter 4《The Sleeper Vox Recording is in the Public Domain.》Chapter 5 Journey from Guayana to Rio Grande, the City of Natal, the Governor I had entertained hopes of being accompanied by Senor Joaquim at least as far as Rio Grande, but he changed his mind, and I began to make the necessary arrangements for going alone. I purchased three more horses, and hired a guide for the Sertão, who was a white man of the country, and two Indian lads of about sixteen years of age. On the 3rd of November, I again set forth, accompanied by my English, John, Francisco, the guide, Julio, and the other boy, his companion. We only reached Dois Rios the same evening, which is two leagues distant from Guayana. We had left that place late in the day. It got on very slowly, as the two loads upon the horses were not well divided and arranged. I now found, on stopping for the night, that I had not provided as many things as were necessary, that I wanted an additional piece of baize to cover myself at night, that we ought to have brought more kitchen apparatus, and that knives and forks were to be had very rarely. I had with me a trunk with my clothes on one side of the pack-saddle, and a case with some bottles of rum and wine on the other side, and my hammock in the middle. These made one load. The other horse carried in the malas a kind of trunk on the one side, our provisions, and on the other the clothes of my people, additional ropes and other tackle. I was far from being well supplied, but afterwards provided myself with more things as I went on, learning by experience. The hammocks are all made of cotton, and are of several sizes and colors, and of various workmanship. Those in use among the lower orders are made of cotton cloth, of the manufacture of the country. Others are composed of network, 
from which all the several kinds derive the general name of heji, a net. Others, again, are knit or woven in long straight threads, knotted across at intervals. These are usually dyed of two or three colors, and are to be found in the houses of wealthy persons. This species of bed has been adopted from the Indians, and nothing more convenient and better adapted to the climate could possibly be imagined. It could be wrapped up in a very small compass, and with the addition of a piece of baize as a coverlid, is usually of sufficient warmth. I could not discover that there was any stream at this place, though it bears the name of Dois Hios, or the two rivers. It is a large open piece of land, with cottages upon the skirts, and attached to each is a pen for cattle. The great weekly fair for cattle from the Sertão, for the Pernambuco market, is held here. From Dois Hios we advanced the following day to the sugar plantation of Espiritu Santo, situated upon the banks of the river Paraiba, which becomes dry in the summer, at a short distance above this estate. I had letters to the owner of it, who is a member of the Calvacante family, and the Capitan Moore of the Captaincy of Paraiba. I was received by him in a very friendly manner. The house is in the usual style of the country, having only the ground floor and no ceiling the tiles and rafters being in full view. Supper of dried meat and the flour of the mangioc, made into paste and called piraum, was placed before me. Also some hard biscuits and red wine. I was not then sufficiently a Brazilian to eat piraum, and took the biscuits with meat in preference, which much astonished my host. Sweetmeats were afterwards brought in, which are always good in the houses of persons of his rank in life the opulent people in Brazil taking as much pride in their doces as an English citizen in his table or his wines. The cloth was laid at one end of a long table, and I sat down by myself, whilst the Capitão Moor placed himself upon the table near to the other end, and talked to me, and some of the chief persons of his establishment stood around to see the strange animal called an Englishman. We adjourned from the supper-room into another spacious apartment, and each of us took a hammock, of which there were several in the room, and swung and talked until we were half asleep. One of his men supposed that, as I spoke Portuguese, there must be an Englishman who did not speak English, or that any Portuguese, on going to England, would immediately speak the language of that country, as I did Portuguese. The Capitão Moor seldom leaves his estate to go to Recife, or even to Paraíba, and lives in the usual style of the Brazilian gentry, in a kind of feudal state. He had several young men about him, some of whom were employed by him. Neither his wife nor any of his children appeared. The principal apartments of this house are two spacious rooms, having a great number of doors and windows. In one were several hammocks and a sofa, and in the other the long table upon which I supped. There were a few chairs in each of them, the floors were of brick, and the shutters and doors were unpainted. The owner of this mansion wore a shirt and a pair of drawers, a long bedgown, called a chambre, and a pair of slippers. This is the usual dress of those persons who have no work to perform. When a Brazilian takes to wearing one of these long gowns, he begins to think himself a gentleman, and entitled, consequently, to much respect. The next day we advanced about seven leagues, and for the first time I slept in the open air. We intended to have taken up our lodging for the night at a neighboring hamlet, but the huts were so small and miserable, being constructed of the leaves of palm trees, that I preferred the open air. We made for the rivulet, which runs at a little distance from these habitations. The horses were immediately unloaded, and their pack-saddles taken off, that they might roll in comfort. The next thing to be done was to get firewood. In most parts of the country it is very plentiful, and as we were upon the skirts of a thick wood, there was here no want of it. A light was struck, and two fires made. We got an additional pan from one of the neighboring huts, and our dried meat was cooked. The meat is dried in the old Indian manner, by laying it upon a platform of twigs, raised about eighteen inches from the ground, and making a fire underneath. 
we discovered that not far off a field or piece of land rather more cleared of wood than the rest was rented by a cottager who would allow our horses to be put into it for a vincin about five farthings each for the night which the guide thought i should consider dear and therefore told me it was the usual price as may be supposed i made no great difficulties on this score and the horses were taken to the place by julio and his companion i now thought myself settled for the night and therefore ate my supper sitting in my hammock which was slung between two trees with a plate upon one of the trunks having finished i took my cigar and sat down close to the fire the guide lighted his pipe and placed himself on the opposite side that we might have a talk about our proceedings for the morrow i returned to my hammock about ten o'clock but found the air very sharp and consequently lay down under the lee of the fire upon a hide of which we had two for covering the loads in case of rain this was to me a new scene when i thought of the complete change of habits which this kind of life required and how entirely different it was from anything in england i may almost say in europe when i looked round and saw our several fires for the cold air had by this time obliged each person to have his own the men all asleep our pack saddles trunks and other parts of our baggage scattered about as it was taken from the horses when i heard the running of the water and the rustling of the trees and when i considered that i was entering upon a people with whose habits i was a little acquainted whose feelings toward my countrymen i was ignorant of i felt a kind of damp but this was soon removed by thinking of the pleasure of return and of the accomplishment of what i deemed incapable of performing i was cheered by my recollection of the knowledge i had of the language and by the determination i felt within me of conforming to the customs of the people of submitting to their prejudices i was not old enough to have contracted any habits too deep to be laid aside when necessary these thoughts were interrupted by the cry of jesus which was repeated every half minute in a dismal voice i called to the guide supposing it to proceed from some person in distress he waked and i told him what made me call to him he said it was only some person helping another abbe mohir that is that some dying person which i found was the usual custom had a friend to repeat the word jesus until the sufferer expired that it might not be forgotten and perhaps to keep the devil off i dined the following day at the village of manwanguapi situated upon the banks of a dry river it is a thriving place these more modern villages have been built in one long street upon the road the older ones in a square it had then about three hundred inhabitants but i have since heard that the number is more than doubled and that new houses are building the river can scarcely be reckoned of any advantage to the village but the place forms a convenient break between guayana and rio grande for the travelling peddlers a useful industrious and generally honest set of men as the resting place and headquarters from hence they make daily excursions to the plantations at a little distance and return here to sleep i passed the night in the outhouses of some sugar works my guide was much astonished at my not asking for lodgings at the casa grande or owner's house but i preferred these kind of quarters to better ones where i might run the risk of being obliged to remain half the night awake for the purpose of giving news the hospitality however of the planters is very great and no recommendation is necessary though i had provided myself with a few letters the next day we proceeded to cunhão the sugar plantation of the colonel andre d'albuquerque do maranhão the chief of the maranhão branch of this numerous and distinguished family of the albuquerques he is a man of immense landed property the plantation of cunhão extends along the road fourteen leagues and the owner has since purchased another large estate adjoining his lands likewise in the sertão for breeding cattle are supposed not to be less than thirty to forty leagues in extent of those kind of leagues that sometimes takes a man three or four hours to get over one i had letters to him from some of his relations and friends at pernambuco he was sitting at his door with his chaplain and several of his stewards and other persons employed by him 
to have all the benefit of the fresh air. He is a man of about thirty years of age, handsome and rather above the middle size, with genteel manners, rather courtly as the Brazilians of education generally are. He lives quite in feudal state. His negroes and other dependents are numerous. He commands the regiment of militia cavalry of Rio Grande, and has them in good order, considering the state of the country. He came forwards on my dismounting, and I gave him the letters, which he put by to read at leisure, and then desiring me to sit down, asked me several questions of my wishes, intentions, etc. He took me to his guest's apartments at a little distance from his own residence, where I found a good bed. Hot water was brought to me in a large brass basin, and every necessary was supplied in a magnificent style. The towels were all fringed, etc. When I addressed myself, I expected to be called to supper, but to my amazement I waited until near one o'clock, when a servant came to summon me. I found in the dining room a long table laid out and covered with meat of several kinds, and in quantity sufficient for twenty persons. To this feast the colonel, his chaplain, another person, and myself sat down. When I had eaten until I was quite tired, to my utter dismay, another course came on, equally profuse of fowls, pastry, etc., etc., and when this was removed, I had a third to go through of at least ten different kinds of sweetmeats. The supper could not have been better cooked or handsomer if it had been prepared at Hesifi, or even an English epicure might have found much to please his palate. I was not able to retire to rest until near three o'clock. My bed was most excellent, and I enjoyed it still more from not expecting to find one. In the morning the colonel would not allow me to leave his house until I had breakfasted. Tea, coffee, and cakes were brought in, all of which were very good. He then took me to see his horses, impressed me much to leave my own, and take one of his for my journey, that mine might be in good condition on my return, and he also urged me to leave my pack-horses, and take some of his, but as mine were still all in working order, I declined accepting his offer. These circumstances are mentioned to show the frankness with which strangers are treated. I could not get away before ten o'clock and therefore only advanced two leagues to dinner. I stopped by the side of a rivulet under some trees, upon a most beautiful spot. A short distance from the estate of Cunyon is a hamlet of the same name, through which I passed in my way to the colonel's plantation. This hamlet, or the estate itself, was the scene of a massacre which was committed by the Pito Goares and the Tapoyas from the Potengue in the year 1645. A battle was fought by Camarão, the Indian chieftain, to whose prowess the Portuguese are so much indebted, against the Dutch in the following year, between Cunhão and Fort Caelain, which stands at the mouth of the Potengue. The captaincy of Rio Grande commences some leagues to the southward of Cunhão, at a place called Os Marcos, a deep dell inhabited by runaway negroes and criminals. The paths of the dell are intricate, and once a man has taken up his residence here, it is impossible to dislodge him. This season the crop of cotton had failed. It was one of those years in which a great want of rain was felt. The colonel of Cunhão had, for the first time, planted a piece of land from which he expected to have gathered ten thousand ahovas, but in the end only gathered about one hundred and he told me that he should keep to his sugar henceforwards. He is lenient to his slaves, they look fat and well, and he has the character of not making as much of his plantation as he might, which is one proof of his kindness to them. The estate of Cunhão is one of the largest, if not quite the most extensive, in these parts. There are upon it about one hundred and fifty negroes, and the lands belonging to it would employ four or five times the number but the colonel pays more attention to cattle, by which his father increased his fortune very largely. As usual, upon our arrival by the side of the rivulet, the horses were unloaded, and my hammock was slung for me. I laid down in my clothes, but soon I started up, finding myself uneasy. The guide saw me and called out, Oh, sir, you are covered with carapatos. I then perceived them and felt some more of their bites. Instantly throwing off part of my clothes, but with the remainder upon me, 
I ran into the water, and there began to take them off. The carapato, or tick, is a small flat insect of a dark brown color, about the size of four pins' heads placed together. It fastens upon the skin, and will in time eat its way into it. It is dangerous to pull it out quickly when already fixed, for if the head remains, inflammation is not unfrequently the consequence. The point of a heated fork or penknife applied to the insect when it is too far advanced into the skin to be taken out with a hand will secede in loosening it. There is another species of tick of much larger size and of a lead color. This is principally troublesome to horses and horned cattle that are allowed to run loose in lands which have been only partially cleared. I have in some instances seen horses that have had such vast numbers upon them as to have been weakened by the loss of blood which they have occasioned. Insects of this species of carapato fasten themselves to the skin, but do not force their way into it. Footnote. The castor tree is known in Brazil under the same name. Indeed, there is much similarity in appearance between the seed of this plant, from which the oil is extracted, and the larger kind of tick. End footnote. The hammock had fallen to the ground accidentally when taken from the trunk to be slung, and had thus picked up these unpleasant visitors. I had some trouble in getting them all off, but was successful, as I had attacked the enemy in time. We set off again about two o'clock. I had intended to have ridden until sunset, and then to have put up near to some cottage, but a young man overtook us, and we entered into conversation. He lived at Papari, a village about half a league out of the road, and he pressed me so much to accompany him to sleep at his place that I agreed. Papari is a deep and narrow valley, a most delightful situation. The whole of the valley is cultivated, and this year the lands were in great request, as the rains had failed and the high sandy lands had proved barren. For whilst every other part of the country appeared dry and burnt up, this spot was in full verdure. It appeared to laugh at all around it, aware of its own superiority. The inhabitants seemed by their countenances to partake of the joyful looks of the land they lived in. Papari yet enjoys another advantage, though it is at a distance of three or four leagues from the sea. A salt water lake reaches it, so that its inhabitants have the fish brought to their own doors. The tide enters the lake, which is never dry, for although the fresh springs which run into it might fail, still it would always preserve a certain portion of water from the sea. The fishermen come up upon their small river jangadas, which do not require more than twelve inches of water. Papari is about five leagues from Cunhão. Senor Dionisio introduced me to his lady. He is a native of Portugal, and she a Brazilian. They possessed a small piece of land in the valley, and appeared to be comfortably situated. Papari may contain about three hundred inhabitants, very much scattered. In the course of this year I afterwards heard that many persons flocked to it from other parts, owing to the absolute want of provisions. I went down to the edge of the lake to see the fishermen arrive. The people of the valley had all assembled to receive them. It was quite a billingsgate in miniature, save that the Portuguese language does not admit of swearing. We dined in Brazilian style, upon a table raised about six inches from the ground, around which we sat or rather lay down upon mats. We had no forks, and the knives of which there were two or three were intended merely to sever the larger pieces of meat. The fingers were to do the rest. I remained at Papari during one entire day, that my horses might have some respite, that I might purchase another from Senor Dionisio and on poor Julio's account, whose feet had begun to crack from the dryness of the sands. Distant from Papari, from three to four leagues, is the Indian village of saint Jose, built in the form of a square. This place might contain about two hundred inhabitants, but it had evidently the appearance of falling to decay. The grass in the center of the square was high, the church neglected, and the whole aspect dull. St. Jose stands upon a dry, sandy soil, and the severity of the season might have contributed to its dismal look. This day we experienced the utter impossibility of trusting to the accounts we received at distances, and my guide had no very clever head for recollecting them. 
although he, like most of these people, possessed a kind of instinct with respect to the paths we were to follow. We were told that Natal was distant from St. Jose three or four leagues, and therefore expected to arrive at that place by dusk. But about five o'clock we entered upon the dismal sand hills, over which lies the road to the city. The whole country is uninhabited, and I may say uninhabitable, between Natal and St. Jose. Consequently, we had very faint hopes of meeting anyone to give us information of the distance. But the guide said he supposed we could not be nearer to it than from two to three leagues, from the recollection he had of these hills, which, when we once passed over, cannot be entirely forgotten. When it was nearly dark, and when our horses were almost giving way, we saw two boys on horseback coming toward us. We asked them the distance. They answered two leagues in all deep sand adding that they belonged to a party which had come to make farina upon a spot of land half a league distant from where we were upon which mangioc was cultivated they said that to go on to Rio Grande the same night was madness that they were going a short way to water their horses and that on their return they would guide us to their party i agreed to wait for them when they arrived they struck soon from the road down the side of one of the hills was now dark. We followed, entered some high and thick brushwood, and a considerable way into it, found the persons to whom the boys told us they belonged. The implements for making the farina were placed under a shed, which was thatched with the leaves of the macaiba and other palm trees. These persons had fixed upon this spot, as there was a spring of brackish water hard by, which was, however, only to be reached by descending a precipice. The pitcher was fastened to a cord and drawn up, and the person who descended to fill it ascended the precipice by means of the brushwood which grows upon the side. I did not much like the party, therefore we took up our lodgings at some little distance from them, and none of us settled regularly for the night. I now much regret it not having a dog with me. Our horses passed a wretched night, feeding upon the leaves of the shrubs around us. The next morning we continued our journey over the sand hills to Natal, traveling about two miles within the hour. The distance from Guayana to Natal is fifty-five leagues. The sand hills are perpetually changing their situations and forms. The high winds blow the sand in clouds, which renders it dangerous to travelers. It is white and very fine, so that our horses sunk up to the knees at every step, painful to a very great degree when the sun has had full power upon it. Poor Julio had mounted upon the haunches of one of the loaded horses, and occasioned our traveling still slower. All was desolate and dreary, for the great lightness of the sand almost prevented vegetation, though some of the creeping seaside plants had seceded here and there in establishing a footing. The tract of country between Guayana and Espiritu Santo, and indeed even to Cunhaun, keeping at no great distance from the coast, is appropriate for the most part to sugar plantations. But many of the senores de ingenio, sugar planters, also employ part of their time in raising cotton. The general feature is of an uncultivated country, though a great quantity of land is yearly employed. The system of agriculture is so slovenly, or rather, as there is no necessity for a husbandry of land, from the immensity of the country, and the smallness of its population. Lands are employed one year, and the next the brushwood is allowed to grow up, giving thus to every piece of ground that is not absolutely in use that year the look of one totally untouched, until a person is acquainted in some measure from practice with the appearance of the several kinds of land. You will then perceive the difference between brushwood that will not grow because the land is of a barren kind, and that which is left to rise, that the land may rest for another crop. From this manner of cultivating their lands, a plantation requires three or four times more ground than would otherwise be necessary. I passed through several deep woods, and ascended some steep hills, but I saw nothing which deserved the name of mountain. I crossed some flat sandy plains, upon which the acaju, mangaba, and several species of palm or cabbage trees grow. These are merely fit to turn cattle upon in winter and will only be brought into cultivation when lands begin to be scarce in Brazil. Varzeas, or lowly marshlands, 
adapted to the sugar cane, I also frequently saw. The cercados, or fence pieces of ground, attached to each sugar plantation upon which are fed the cattle, cut for the work of it, are the only spots which bear the look of fields, and even in these, the brushwood is not always sufficiently cleared away, unless the proprietor is wealthy, and has an abundance of persons upon his estate. Otherwise, such is the fertility of the soil, that without great care, the cercado will in time become a wood. There are several hamlets upon the road, consisting of three or four cottages, and these are built of slight timber, and the leaves of the cabbage trees. Others have mud walls, and are covered with these leaves, and now and then a house built of mud with the tiled roof is to be seen. This bespeaks a man above the common run of people. I crossed several rivulets, which were much reduced by the drought, but I did not see any great streams. The Paraiba was dry where I passed it, as also was the river near Mamanguape. A rivulet that runs into the lake at Papari was the only stream which appeared still to possess its usual strength. The road from Guayana to Mamanguape is the great Sertan track, and is similar to that between Hesifi and Guayana, excepting that the plains of the part of the country I had just now traversed are more extensive, and the roads over these are dangerous, as they are only marked by the short and ill-grown grass being worn away upon the path. But as the cattle extend more upon a plain, and cannot be kept so close from the greater extent of ground over which they pass, each part receives fewer footsteps, and the grass not unfrequently resists their passing, and vegetation still continues. Consequently, in an imperfect light, an experienced guide is necessary, as on these plains no huts are ever to be met with, being for the most part destitute of waters. These the Brazilians called tableros, distinguishing them by this name from campinas. Upon the latter the soil is closer, and they afford good grass. Beyond Mamanguape the road is sometimes a mere path, with breath sufficient only for two loaded horses to pass, and in some places it has not even the necessary width for this purpose. The valley of Papari I have already mentioned as being much superior to the rest of the country. The trees in Brazil are mostly evergreens, and the drought must be great indeed to make them lose their leaves. But the green of the leaves of a parched plant, though still a green, is very different from the bright joyful color of one that is in full health. This produced the striking difference between that valley and the burnt lands above it. Besides, the misfortunes of other parts made its good luck more apparent. I arrived about eleven o'clock in the morning at the city of Natal, situated upon the banks of the Rio Grande, or Potengi. A foreigner who might chance to land first at this place on his arrival upon the coast of Brazil would form a very poor opinion of the state of the population of the country, for if places like this are called cities, what must the towns and villages be? But such a judgment would not prove correct, for many villages, even of Brazil, surpass this city. The rank must have been given to it not from what it was or is, but from the expectation of what it might be at some future period. The settlement upon rising ground, rather removed from the river, is properly the city, as the parish church is there. It consists of a square, with houses on each side having only a ground floor. The churches, of which there are three, the palace, town hall, and even prison. Three streets lead from it, which have also a few houses on each side. No part of the city is paved, although the sand is deep. On this account, indeed, a few of the inhabitants have raised a footpath of bricks before their own houses. The place may contain from six to seven hundred persons. I rode immediately to the palace, as I had letters of introduction to the governor from several of his friends at Pernambuco. He received me in the most cordial manner. He asked me for my passport, which I produced. It was scarcely open when he immediately returned it, saying that he only did this, that all necessary form must be complied with. He said that I should stay with him, and he would provide a house for my people. At one o'clock we dined, and one of his aides de camp was with us. In the afternoon we walked down to the lower town. It is situated upon the banks of the river. The houses stand along the southern bank. 
but there is only the usual width of a street between them and the river. This place may contain from two to three hundred inhabitants, and here live the men of trade of Rio Grande. The bar of Potengi is very narrow, but is sufficiently deep to admit vessels of one hundred and fifty tons. The northern bank projects considerably, and for this reason it is necessary that a ship should make for it from the southward. The entrance to the reef of rocks, which lies at some distance from the shore, also requires to be known, so that altogether the port is a difficult one. The river is very safe when once within the bar. The water is deep and quite still, and two vessels might swing in its breath, but it soon becomes shallow, and in the course of a few miles is greatly diminished. I should imagine that six or seven vessels might swing altogether in the harbor. The bars of rivers that are formed, as in this case of sand, are, however, not to be trusted to without good pilots, as they soon change their depth and even their situation. When the tide enters, the northern bank is overflowed about one mile from the mouth of the harbor, and spreads over a considerable extent of ground which, even during the ebb, is always wet and muddy, but never becomes sufficiently deep to prevent passing. The governor was raising a road over this piece of land, and the work was then nearly half finished. The new road would be about one mile in length. The captaincy of Rio Grande is subject to the governor of Pernambuco, and those of Paraíba and Sierra were formerly in the same situation, but have of late years been formed into independent provincial governments. The governor, Francisco de Paula Calvacante de Albuquerque, is a native of Pernambuco, and a younger brother of the chief of the Calvacante branch of the Albuquerques. His father, a Brazilian also, was first an ensign in the Recife Regiment of the Line. He afterwards established himself upon a sugar plantation and made a fortune. The old man died and left to each of his sons considerable property. Two remained upon their estates and still live upon them. This third son entered the Olinda Regiment and was much beloved by the men. The regiment had then only one company, of which he became the commander, and large sums of money taken from his own purse were expended by him for their good equipment. He went to Lisbon on some business relating to his company, and whilst he was there, a denuncia, a private accusation, was given by some enemy to the family that the brothers were forming a conspiracy against the government. He was obliged to leave Lisbon, afraid of being put under an arrest, and fled to England, where his reception was such that he has ever wished for opportunities of showing kindness to persons of that nation. His brothers suffered much in person and in property, but matters were at last cleared up, as the accusation was proved to be false. Francisco was immediately promoted to a majority, and soon afterwards sent to govern Rio Grande. He is a man of talent and of proper feelings in regard of his duties, enthusiastic in wishing to better the condition of the people over whom he was placed. I am grieved to say that he has been removed to the insignificant government of St. Michael's, one of the Azores, or Western Islands. When he was appointed to Rio Grande, there was scarcely a well-dressed person in it, but he had succeeded in persuading one family to send for English manufactured goods to Recife. When once these were introduced, they made their way. One would not be outdone by another, and in the course of two years they had become general. We visited the church in the evening. All the ladies were handsomely dressed in silks of various colors and black veils thrown over the head and face. A twelfth-month previous to this period, these same persons would have gone to church in petticoats of Lisbon printed cottons and square pieces of thick cloth over their heads, without stockings, and their shoes down at the heels. The military establishment consists of 114 men, one company, which were in much better order than those of Pernambuco or Paraíba. The captaincy of Rio Grande enjoyed perfect quietude from robberies through the governor's exertions. He promoted the building of a large house, which was going on very fast, and for which he had subscribed largely. The rent of it was to be appropriated to the support of the widows of the soldiers of the captaincy. This work has, I am afraid, been laid aside since his removal. The situation of the prisoners was very miserable. He wished to better it, 
and requested that the principal persons of the place would take it in turn weekly to carry a bag round to all the inhabitants, that each might give some trifle to assist in their support. For some time this went on well, but after a few weeks it was neglected. He therefore took the bag himself, and, accompanied by one of his aides de camp, called at every house. He said that this was the most comfortable week the prisoners had ever passed since their confinement, as more was given by each person than was usual. And the excellent arrangement was again taken up with ardor by the same persons who had neglected it. A British vessel was wrecked near Natal, and I have always understood that the proprietors were perfectly satisfied that every exertion possible had been made use of to save the property. The drought of this year had caused a scarcity of the flour of the manjio, the bread of Brazil, and the price was so high at Recife, Goiana, etc., that those persons of Rio Grande, who possessed it, began to ship it off for other places. This the governor prohibited. He ordered it to be sold in the marketplace, at a price equal to the gain the owners would have had by sending it away, and if all was not bought, he took it himself again giving it out when necessary at the same price. These anecdotes of him I had partly from himself, but principally from persons of the place to whom I was introduced. When he left the city on his appointment to St. Michael's, the people followed him to some distance, praying for his prosperity. End of chapter 5《ハッチャー・ネイル・ハッチャー・ネイル・ハッチャー・ネイル・ハッチャー・ネイル・ハッチャー・ネイル・ハッチャー・ネイル・ハッチャー・ネイル・ハッチャー・ネイル・ハッチャー・ネイル・ハッチャー・ネイル・ハッチャー・ネイル・ハッチャー・ネイル・ハッチャー・ネイル・ハッチャー・ネイル・ハッチャー・ネイル・ハッチャー・ネイル・ハッチャー・ネイル・ハッチャー・ネイル・ハッチャー・ネイル・ハッチャー・ネイル・ハッ I was resolved at any rate to make the attempt. If I had been certain of being able to undertake the journey at a future period, it would have been better to have returned and to have waited until a more favorable season. But I am rejoiced that I went at that time, as otherwise I should most probably have been under the necessity of foregoing my plan altogether. Some of the disagreeable circumstances which I met with certainly proceeded from the rigor of the season. I received from the governor a letter of introduction to Aracati. He also insisted upon my leaving my own horse, that he might be in good condition when I returned. I was to sleep at a place from which Rio Grande is supplied with farinha during the drought, but in usual years it is too wet to be cultivated unless it was drained, and of this operation scarcely any notions are entertained. At Natal I purchased another horse. I crossed the river in a canoe, and the horses and men upon Jangadas. We were landed upon the new raised road, and immediately beyond it overtook some persons who were going to the Lagoa Seca, or dry lake above mentioned, where I was to purchase maize and farinha for crossing the tract of country through which runs the river Sierra Meyerin. We left the usual road and turned down a narrow path, which leads to this lake. It was overhung with trees. I struck my head against a branch of one of these and found that I had disturbed a large family which had taken up its residence upon it. My shoulders were quickly covered with small red ants, and I did not get rid of them without feeling some of their bites. We arrived at the dry lake about six o'clock in the evening and put up at one of the cottages. In the course of the following morning, I made known my principal errand, and that I likewise wished to purchase another horse. The people who were residing here had removed from high lands which had in this season proved barren. They had erected small huts, some of which had not been finished. And the families, therefore, lived in public. These huts had only a roof to shelter their inhabitants. Who expected that the first heavy rain would drive them back to their usual habitations, as these lands, after violent rains, are laid under water. Each man possessed his small field of mandioc and maize. I left John's horse here in charge of one of these men, as he began to give way, and I proceeded with four loaded horses, two as before, and with farinha and another with maize. 
I had provided myself at Rio Grande with leathern bags for carrying water and several other necessary things which I had not been instructed to bring, but which experience had taught me the necessity of possessing. We remained at this place during one entire day, and the next morning set off, intending to sleep at a hamlet called Pai Paulo. We rested at midday near to a well, and in the afternoon proceeded. Wells are generally formed in these parts by digging a hole in the ground to the depth of two or three feet until the water appears. If a person in the neighborhood of one of them who takes water from it should be nice about these matters, a fence is made round it. But if not, as is oftener the case, the well remains open and the cattle come down to drink at it. These pits or wells are called caisimbas. The grass was much burnt up, but still there was plenty of it. In the afternoon we passed over some stony ground. It was the first I had met with, and it was very painful to the horses which had come from the sandy soil of Pernambuco. But we soon entered upon a long, though narrow plain, bounded by brushwood, over which the road was clear, and the grass burnt up entirely on each side. We overtook a white man on foot, with twelve loaded horses, and a very small pony which carried a saddle. The loads were all alike, each horse carrying two skins or bags of some kind of provisions. I was much surprised at the circumstance of this man having the management of so many horses, because generally the number of men is nearly equal to that of the beasts. I observed that his horses began to spread upon the plain, and seemed inclined to take to the brushwood. I called to my guide to ride to the right, whilst I did the same to the left, and go in quickly between them and the wood, to prevent the animals from separating. The man thanked me, which brought on further conversation. He asked the guide where we intended to sleep, and was answered at Pai Paolo. The wells at Pai Paolo, he told us, were all dried up, and the inhabitants had deserted their houses. What was to be done? He said that he intended to remain upon a plain two leagues distance from where we then were, that no water was to be had there, but that for our party and himself, his slave who had remained behind to fill a skin at a well which we had passed, would bring a sufficient quantity. There was no alternative. To remain here was impossible, for there was no grass. Therefore I ordered Julio and his companion to let our horses and those of our new friend remain together, and to look to them equally. The slave soon joined us with the water, gave the skin to my guide, and went on to assist Julio, whilst I advanced very slowly, that I might have some more conversation with the owner of the convoyo, or convoy, which we had thus joined. He was the son of a man of property, who resided upon the banks of the Azul, and possessed several cattle estates in those parts. The old man was a colonel of militia, and he, with whom I conversed, was the major of the same regiment. The drought had been so severe with them that they feared a famine, and he had been sent down to the coast to purchase farina for the family, which the skins contained, with the exception of one load consisting of maize for his horses. After he had purchased his farina, he heard of the prohibition of the governor respecting it, and understood that a guard of soldiers was to be sent down to the lake to take it from him. He had therefore stolen a march, and that nothing might be suspected, he had left all his people, excepting this one slave, and had even left his clothes. His saddle horse carried a heavy load, and he set off a day before he had intended. The animal upon which he had placed his saddle was a colt, and too young to bear any further weight. Thus was this major, in true Brazilian campaigning style, in his shirt and drawers, his alpargatas or sandals upon his feet, his musket upon his shoulder, his sword by his side, hanging from a belt over one shoulder, and his long knife in his girdle. He was a stout, handsome man, about forty years of age, and where his skin was not exposed it was as white as that of a European, but his face, neck, and legs were of a dark brown color. This man, who at other times enjoyed all the comforts that his country affords, who was respected for his rank and wealth, was obliged to make this journey absolutely to save the lives of his family. True it is that he should not be considered as we should persons of his situation in Europe. Like most of these people, he had been from his infancy daily accustomed 
to what men in a more civilized state would account very great hardships. The alpargatas are pieces of leather, of a size rather larger than the soles of the feet of the person for whom they are intended. Two loops are fastened in front of each, through which two of the toes are placed. There is a ring of leather around each ankle, through which are drawn and tied two thongs which proceed from each side of the hinder part. These are the shoes of the Brazilians, who live removed from the great and improving towns. Julio was now provided with a pair of them, else I hardly know how he could have proceeded. We halted at the place appointed, upon an immense plain. The grass was all gone, and even the hardy trees, the acaju and mangaba, seemed to feel the want of water, for their leaves had begun to fall. The two parties took up their stations under separate clumps of trees. But upon these plains the trees scarcely ever grow sufficiently near to each other to enable the traveller to hang his hammock between two of them. The poor horses were taken to a dell at some distance to pick up what they could find that had escaped the drought and the traveller. Our allowance of water was not large, and therefore we were afraid of eating much salt meat. We did not pass the night comfortably, for the wind rose and scattered our fires, nor did we sleep much and at four o'clock the horses were brought to give each of them a feed of maize. One of them refused to eat his portion. The following morning we advanced to Pai Paolo, three leagues further, still crossing the same plain, at the extremity of which we first approached the Sierra Mierim, and on the opposite side from that on which we were, stands the village of Pai Paolo, upon rising ground. This was, without exception, the most desolate place I ever beheld, the roofs of some of the cottages were falling in, the walls of others had fallen, but the roofs remained. The course of the river was only marked by the depth of its bed, for the soil around was a loose sand, destitute of any covering, and nothing differing from that in the channel of the river. The trees had mostly lost their leaves. I had now entered upon the Sertão, and surely it deserves the name. We passed Paipalo, and about noon reached an open well of brackish water dug in the bed of the river. Our Penambuco horses at first refused to drink, but the dirt was cleared away as much as possible for them, and the water left to settle. However, even then they did little more than taste it. Here we were to rest and to give our horses some maize, for there was no grass. The same horse again refused his feed. The guide said that he supposed he was not accustomed to it, and therefore must be taught to like it, otherwise he could not possibly get over this barren tract of country. The first operation was to soak the maize in water, until it softened. Then the guide forced some of it down the animal's throat, closing forcibly its mouth. Whether this had the effect or hunger I know not, but at night he performed his part pretty well, taking rather more time than the others to finish his feed. I drank a small portion of the water, mixing it with lemon juice and sugar, which I had with me. We carried some of this water on with us, for at night we should find none. The county presented the same appearance. We crossed the Sierra Mierim several times, which in some parts had large rocks in the center of the bed. At night I was not much inclined to eat, but I made up by smoking. We found a sheltered place behind part of the bank of the river, and slung our hammocks upon a sloping ground as the wind rises about eleven or twelve o'clock in these parts, and renders shelter very requisite. It sometimes blows hard. It is a dry wind, but healthy. The following day we proceeded again in the same manner. I had by this time fully entered into the custom of smoking early, and as we could never get anything cooked until twelve o'clock, I found that this prevented any unpleasant sense of hunger. My people could not have anything to eat early, as it would have caused delay, therefore it would not have been proper for me to show a bad example. I had become very intimate with my friend the Major. He learnt from me that we had horses and cows and dogs in England, and he liked me the better for this. At first he wondered how it happened that I could ride. He thought I must be an apt scholar to have learnt since I had gone over to Brazil. He was also much surprised to hear that we had churches in England which he had never understood before. He said he should not believe henceforwards that the English were Pagoins, heathens. I told him that one chief point upon which our religion differed from his was in ours not enjoining us to confess. 
he thought confession a great annoyance but he could not doubt its propriety we reached another dirty pool or well of water in the river which we had again crossed several times our resting place at midday afforded no shelter excepting what could be obtained from one small shrub which was in full leaf the leaves or branches of it reached to the ground i lay down upon the sand and pushed my head in among them covering the rest of my body with a hide this was a hot berth but better than to be completely exposed to the sun i was astonished at the appearance of this shrub there are two kinds of trees in certain parts of the sertão which are called pejero and ico both seem to flourish most when the seasons are the driest and both are particularly dangerous to horses the latter of these plants kills the traveller's beasts and the former has the effect of appearing to produce intoxication and sometimes also proves fatal the major said that this part of the country abounded in these trees and consequently our horses were tied to those around us and to each was given a feed of maize the plant of which i have spoken above was very beautiful the green of its leaves were bright and healthy and i afterwards saw many more of them upon the travesia or crossing i particularly observed them on this tract of country as other plants had lost all appearance of life we were less unpleasantly situated at night as the water though brackish was comparatively clear the following day we had still the same country and river to cross the consciousness of having advanced upon our journey alone caused the knowledge of a change of situation so exactly similar was the face of the country at midday we had again no shelter from the sun the water was little different from that of the preceding day i lay down under the shady side of a rock which afforded sufficient shelter until the sun began to decline and throw its rays into the quarter under which i had taken up my station we had often seen cattle about the pools or wells on this occasion one miserable cow came down to drink the major happened to be near the pool at the time he looked at the mark she bore and knew it to be that of the cattle upon his own estates how can this animal he exclaimed have strayed so far from its own home the want of water had made it stray at least one hundred miles this day we overtook a party of sertanejos as the inhabitants of the sertão are called likewise going our way they were at the midway resting point and one of the horses was at the time of our coming up tottering from having eaten of the eco they were trying to give it maize in the hope of recovering it as this is said to have the effect if it is taken soon after but at the time we left them the animal when he fell was with difficulty raised and the major said that he thought him too far gone i never heard whether these persons returned or still advanced after this misfortune i observed in the afternoon several heaps of rocks in the bed of the river which must form beautiful falls of water when the stream is rapid towards evening my guide began to try me i found that there had been some conversation between him and the two indians respecting the journey and now he sounded me about returning i told him i had fully determined to go on and that i would most certainly shoot any man who attempted to go back and that if he even then escaped me i would follow him until i overtook him he had not said that he would return but had hinted at the danger of the undertaking at this season and that the two lads were afraid of proceeding but i knew him to be the mover at night he could not have found his way back as the only mark of a road that was to be perceived proceeded from the sand being more worn away and the banks of the river being broken down at the proper crossings in fact the marks were such that even in the daytime a man accustomed to this description of road could alone find it out therefore i was certain that desertion could only take place in the daytime which was almost impossible as i always rode in the rear of the whole party the guide had no firearms of his own besides he never would have made any attempt to murder me as he knew how little i slept and that my pistols were always with me in my hammock and moreover anything of this sort could have been done only in concert with julio who in the sequel proved worthy of the greatest confidence i found more necessity to be on my guard in returning when john was no longer with me however although this man had sufficient courage he had no watchfulness 
the summary manner in which i threatened to treat the guide can only be justified by the necessity of the case for had he returned the two indians would most probably likewise have deserted me if a man suffers himself to be trifled with he cannot possibly secede under circumstances such as these however i made the threat under the conviction of its being sufficient we carried water from the resting place at midday and as usual fixed our quarters at night upon the banks of the river the next day we advanced again exactly in the same manner but at noon to our dismay there was no water the pool had dried up but we rested the horses for a short time notwithstanding this dreadful disappointment my thirst was great for i had not drank the night before we had still some lemons left which were distributed and these afforded much relief in the afternoon the major told me to follow his example and put a pebble into my mouth which was the usual resource of the sertanatios on these occasions i did so and certainly found that it produced considerable moisture this was a dismal day and we knew not whether we should be able to reach a well before some of our horses failed one of those belonging to the major already ran loose among the others as he was weak and his load had been changed to the horse which had carried the maize the remainder of this being distributed in small portions that it might be carried by the rest my horses bore it very well as those which had not been loaded with provisions were of course in part relieved and the largest load that on my trunk in the case of bottles was carried by each of them in turn that the hard work might be equally divided this day we passed some deserted cottages our night was very miserable for some of the horses refused to finish their feeds of maize the danger of their failing prevented our thinking so much of our own inconvenience my spirits were kept up by the necessity i felt of keeping up those of others john was not quite well and this made me uneasy as it was as much as we could do to carry ourselves indeed had any of the party fallen sick i know not how we should have proceeded the next morning about nine o'clock we reached a well to our great joy but the water was so bad that we could not drink much as it was as usual dirty and brackish but of the first draught i shall never forget the delight when i tried a second could not take it the taste was so very nauseous on looking round we saw some goats julio went towards them and then discovered some fowls proceeded a little farther and found an inhabited cottage he came and gave us the joyful intelligence we determined to remain here to rest if the people could give us any hopes of food for our horses i found an elderly woman and her two daughters in the hut the father was not at home the old woman seemed quite astonished to hear that we had crossed the sierra mierin she said she did not know how soon she and her family might be obliged to leave their cottage as many others had done she directed the major and my people to a dell at some distance where dry grass and leaves might perhaps still be picked up she said that it was the last place which could have any for travellers did not in general know of it and she and her husband made a point of not discovering it but i paved the way by making her a present of some farina throwing maize to the fowls and by pouring in an immense number of minas senoras i had purchased a kid and a fowl and laid down the money immediately Persons circumstances as these were are sometimes robbed in a most unpardonable manner by travellers who take advantage of their houses eat their poultry and leave them without paying but considering the entire non-existence of law in these regions i am only surprised that greater enormities are not committed however every man feels it to be his own case if he has a house and a family he is aware that on going from home those he may leave will be in the same helpless state these persons and their property were at the mercy of any travellers if they had been murdered and the cottage from being deserted began to fall it would have been supposed that its inhabitants like many others had decamped and no inquiry would be made about the direction they had taken such is the rambling disposition of the people in general and the state of this part of the country at the period of which i speak they have nothing to make them remain upon one spot neither comfort nor security in the afternoon we advanced as usual and passed some deserted cottages but towards the close of the day arrived at some that were inhabited and at dusk put up near to two or three that stood together 
after having crossed the Sierra Mirim for the last and forty-second time. This river takes its sources from the mountains to the northward, in the same direction as those of the river Azul, of which I shall have occasion to speak. The Sierra Mirim falls into the Potengi, and perhaps some branches of it bend their course as far as the Paraiba. The face of the country presents one continued flat, from Pai Paolo to the place at which we left the river. The soil is loose sand, which is sometimes, though rarely, intermixed with black earth. The trees are thinly scattered, and at the time that I traveled were without leaves. The river winds like the coils of a serpent. To have followed them would have been endless. It sometimes fills, after heavy rain in the course of a very short time, the water coming down in a torrent, delayed only by the inequality of the depth of the channel and the walls with which the rocks in some parts oppose its progress. The sand in the bed of the river is little different from that of which the banks are composed, being, however, on the whole thicker and approaching nearer to gravel. The water which oozes from it, on digging into the sand, is in all parts brackish, and in some places is too salt for any use to be made of it. This is not, however, peculiar to the Sierra Merim, for I found that all the beds of the rivers which become dry in the summer contain more or less salt. At best, the water taken from them was never quite sweet. The place at which we had arrived is reckoned to be distant forty leagues from Natal. The league of the Sertão is never less than four miles, and is often much more. There are Legoas Granges, Legoas Pequenas, and Legoas de Nada, or nothing leagues which I have found quite long enough, notwithstanding their encouraging name. Pai Paolo may be about eight or ten leagues from Natal, which makes the Travesia, or barren crossing, thirty or thirty-two leagues. We advanced at about three miles within the hour, or rather more, and traveled from half-past five to ten in the morning, and in the afternoon from two or half-past two to six o'clock. We now reached again the habitations of man, there was still the same burnt-up appearance, but the wells were taken care of, the water was better, and grass, although it was dry, was still to be had. I intended to accompany the major, part of the way to his home, or the whole, but it was necessary that I should be guided by circumstances, by the accounts we heard of of the state of the country. We advanced in our usual manner, resting more at midday, traversing a dead flat, and passing two or three fazendas, or cattle estates, each day of which the livestock looked very miserable, and the people half-starved. After being with the major four days, since we had left the Sierra Neerim, I saw that it would not be prudent to proceed farther. The accounts from the interior were bad, and we arrived at one estate, of which the cattle were all dying, and the people intending, there was no rain very soon, to leave their houses. I now judged myself to be distant from the coast not less than two hundred miles. We had advanced northward and westward, and were therefore not far to the southward of Azul, but were to the westward of it. I now resolved to make for it, for my horses might fail, and all the country was in so bad a state, that we might not have found others in a proper condition to go on with us. In fact, as I was not acting from orders, but merely for my own amusement, and as the guide was afraid of proceeding, I did not think I was authorized in persevering. If I had orders for the purpose, the case would have been altered, and I must have run all hazards. Here also desertion was easier in the night, as the country was comparatively inhabited towards Azul, and the difficulty was in advancing, and not in retreating. Each cattle estate has a tolerably decent house, which the owner or herdsman resides, and usually a few smaller habitations are scattered about upon the plain around it. The pens stand near to the principal house, and enable the travelers to distinguish immediately, although at some distance, the site of a fazenda. I heard of a strange custom existing in these parts of the country that are so thinly inhabited, which arises from this state of things. Certain priests obtain a license from the bishop of Pernambuco, and travel through these regions with a small altar constructed for the purpose, of a size to be placed upon one side of a pack-saddle, and they have with them all their apparatus for saying mass. 
thus with a horse conveying the necessary paraphernalia and a boy to drive it who likewise assists in saying mass and another horse on which the priest himself rides and carries his own small portmanteau these men make in the course of the year between one hundred and fifty and two hundred pounds a large income in brazil but hardly earn if the inconveniences and privations which they must undergo to obtain it are taken into consideration they stop and erect the altar wherever a sufficient number of persons who are willing to pay for the mass is collected this will sometimes be said for three or four shillings but at other times if a rich man takes a fancy to a priest or has a fit of extreme devotion upon him he will give eight or ten mil hays two or three pounds and it does happen that one hundred mil hays are received for saying a mass but this is very rare at times an ox or a horse or two or three are given these men have their use in the world this custom did not exist all form of worship would be completely out of the reach of the inhabitants of many districts or at any rate they would not be able to attend more than once or twice in the course of a year for it must be remembered that there is no church within twenty or thirty leagues of some parts besides where there is no law nor real rational religion anything is better than nothing they christen and marry and thus preserve these necessary forms of religion and prevent a total forgetfulness of the established rules of civilized society a sufficient link is kept up to make any of these people if they removed into more populous districts conform to received ideas end of chapter six part one chapter six part two of travels in brazil volume one by henry coster this LibriVox recording is in the public domain i left the major to pursue his journey homewards whilst i retreated or rather advanced in a contrary direction but a retreat it was from this inhospitable region footnote between two and three years after this journey i heard again of my friend the major I had become acquainted with a man who resided at the foot of the Sierra do Teixeira, which is beyond the estates of the major's father. The old colonel was killed by a bolt before his own door. The animal had been driven into a small enclosure and become mad from feeling himself confined. It was necessary to bring him to the ground, which is done in a peculiar manner by running a short iron prong into a certain part of the thigh. The herdsmen were afraid and wished to let the beast have time to cool and become less violent. The old man, who was between seventy and eighty years of age, told them that if they were afraid he would attack him, and immediately entered the enclosure. But before he could prepare to receive the bull, and while he was still leaning against the palings, the animal ran at him and fixed his horns through the old man's body, with sufficient force to run them into the palings, and in such a manner that before he could extricate himself, one of the herdsmen ran a long knife into his head between the horns and brought him to the ground but the old man lost his life End footnote. we found no change during that day and if we had not met with a good-natured herdsman should have fared very badly for want of water unless we had seen some other person equally well disposed i asked him the way to the nearest estate which he told me and then i made inquiries about water to which he answered that unless i was acquainted with the place i should not find the well and this part of our conversation ended by his turning back to show it to me regardless of thus increasing his journey four or five miles i asked him when we arrived at the well to stay and dine with me for although i had no great dainties to offer still he carried only what provision his boro acas contained these are small leathern bags one of which hangs on each side of the saddle he would not however dismount and immediately turned his horse and went his way my guide had remained behind as his horse was rather lame and now he joined us we passed over some stony ground and the well itself was situated among rocks between two of which the horses passed and descended to it i may give some description of my friend who turned back to show me the well and this may be taken as the usual appearance of a travelling certainejo he rode a small horse with a long tail and mane. His saddle was rather raised before and behind, his stirrups were of rusty iron, and his bit was of the same. 
The reins were two very narrow thongs. His dress consisted of long pantaloons or leggings, of tan but undressed leather, of a rusty brown color, which were tied tight round his waist. And under these are worn a pair of cotton drawers or trousers, as the seat is left unprotected by the leather. He had a tan goatskin over his breast, which was tied behind by four strings, and a jacket also made of leather, which is generally thrown over one shoulder. His hat was of the same, with a very shallow crown and small brim. He had slipshod slippers of the same color and iron spurs upon his naked heels. The straps which go under the feet prevent the risk of losing the slippers. A long whip of twisted thongs hung from his right wrist. He had a sword by his side, hanging from a belt over one shoulder. His knife was in his girdle, and his short, dirty pipe in his mouth. Fastened to his saddle behind was a piece of red baize, rolled up in the form of a greatcoat, and this usually contains a hammock and a change of linen, a shirt and drawers, and perhaps a pair of nankeen pantaloons. His boro akas hung also on each side of the back of his saddle, and these generally contained farina and dried meat on one side, and on the other a flint and steel, dried leaves serve as tinder, tobacco and a spare pipe. To this equipment is sometimes added a large pistol, thrust partly under his left thigh and thus secured. The usual pace of the Sertanejo's horse is a walk, approaching to a short trot, so that the horses of these people often have acquired the habit of dragging their hind legs and throwing up the dust. The usual color of the Sertanejo's is a dark brown, for even those who are born white soon become as completely tanned as the dress which they wear from exposure to the sun. At one of the estates I heard an anecdote which is illustrative of the neglect or the impossibility on all occasions of conforming to religious duties. A priest on passing was requested by the wife of the owner of the place to stay for the purpose of baptizing her son. He consented to this, but after waiting some time said that he wished to proceed on his journey, and therefore desired that the child might be brought to him. The woman answered, Pray wait a short time longer, as the boy has taken the horses to water, and will soon return. The priest was surprised, but was still more astonished when he was required to christen a fellow of thirteen or fourteen years of age. The next day we still proceeded over the same sort of ground, in part stony, and where stony it was rather hilly, but not sufficiently so to form a decided ridge of hills. John was at night taken suddenly ill. He had drank too much water, and would not mix any spirit with it, neither would he smoke. I considered smoking as almost absolutely necessary for the preservation of health on these occasions. It is generally practiced among the people of the country, and indeed many of the women are as fond of it as their husbands. Towards the morning the man recovered. The following day we reached at ten o'clock the estate of St. Lucia. It is situated upon a wide plain similar to those upon which we had been traveling for many days. This is a campina and not a tabloero. There were no trees upon it, excepting a few near to the well. The sight of this place raised our spirits, for there was no want of water, nor of grass, though it was completely dry. The lots, lotes, of mares came down to drink, all in fine condition, followed and protected by the master horse of each lot. The cattle, the sheep, and every other living thing seemed to enjoy and to be conscious of the abundance of which they were reaping the advantage. We loaded it near to the well under the trees. The house of the chief herdsman stood before us, distant about one hundred yards upon rather higher ground, it was a low whitewashed cottage with the stables, pens, etc. on each side. About twelve o'clock I saw some men employed in milking goats. I sent Julio with a half-gourd for some milk, desiring him to offer payment. The guide cautioned me not to do so, but still I ordered Julio to present the money. The milk came, but the money was not taken. And soon afterwards three of the men came down towards us. I thanked them for the milk, and they addressed me, saying that they wished to know if I had intended to insult them by offering payment, as such things were not customary in their country. The guide had told me I should affront them, and therefore I had brought this upon myself. But I put them in good humor by answering that they would pardon my mistake, 
when I told them that I belonged to a country in which we were obliged to purchase the sand with which we scoured our houses. Then they said that the boy on going for the milk had mentioned that there was an Englishman in company whom they wished much to see, as it was a bishu, an animal, they had never seen. I said that he was gone with the horses and would soon return. I met John. However, the guide soon told them that I was an Englishman. Their countenances showed much disappointment when they were persuaded that this was true. They had expected to see some strange beast. John soon came, and he certainly was a curiosity, for he did not speak Portuguese, and when anything went wrong he swore away in English, at which they were all astonishment. They said he speaks the Negro language. Footnote. Fala a lingua de negro. End footnote. They sat upon the ground near to my hammock, and asked me of the news from Pernambuco, for they cared about nothing more distant. I was acquainted at Hesifi with the owner of the place, which I made them confident was the case, by describing his house and garden, and they asked me after him, etc. The conversation concluded by an offer of horses to proceed, and on their return to the house a present of dried meat was sent. Thus I was in the end a gainer by offering to pay for the milk, but I was more careful ever after. From St. Lucia we proceeded across the plain, expecting to reach a lake, of which the guide had some recollection. But when the night had already closed in, we were still upon the same endless plain, over which the track was only marked by the sand upon it being more worn away. Consequently, it might easily be lost at night. The lake at which we had entertained hopes of arriving never becomes entirely dry in the summer, but there was only one place at which it could be crossed, therefore it would be dangerous to reach its borders in the dark. The plain presented no tempting lodging. There were several rocks upon it of different sizes, but no trees, and the wind blew hard. The guide dismounted, to feel if there was any of the long grass where we were. On not finding it, he walked to the left of the road, but was not successful. He then tried to the right, and found some. We only discovered his situation by the sound of his voice. He called, and we answered, several times, until at last we joined him. He had also discovered a large rock, under the lee of which we unloaded, and then lighted our fire, and fettered the horses to feed. We soon found that to cook any victuals was impossible, for the wind scattered our fire, which was only formed of the branches of the small shrubs and briars that grow upon these plains. Water we had by accident, as the guide had brought a small skin of it, in case he should be thirsty during the afternoon, for we had made ourselves quite certain of reaching the lake by night. I slept upon two of our packages, under the lee of the rock, and the whole party did the same, sharing as equally as possible our scanty means of accommodation. This afternoon I had seen many rocks of remarkable forms. One particularly struck me as extraordinary. It was placed upon another of much smaller dimensions, and the resting point was so small as to render its removal apparently easy, but on trial it had not the slightest motion. The discomfort of this night was great caused chiefly by the violence of the wind. We had at last no fire, all was dark around us, and we could scarcely make ourselves heard. The horses seemed to feel as much as we did the unsheltered situation. They were near to us during the whole night. On continuing our journey the following morning, we discovered that we had halted within half a league of the lake. The water was all gone, but the ground was boggy and not to be crossed, excepting at the place over which is the usual path. It extends to the right and left to a considerable distance, but is not broad. If the mud was cleared away, it might perhaps afford an inexhaustible source of water to the neighborhood. But Brazil is not in a state for such works. Hands in these parts are not yet sufficiently numerous. In the afternoon we crossed some stony hills and passed by two fazendas. This day I observed at some distance a high hill of a circular form, standing quite alone and unconnected with any other high ground. Its sides appeared to be too steep for horses to ascend, and I much regret not being so situated as to be enabled to delay for the purpose of taking a nearer and more exact view of it. The guide was surprised at my curiosity about it, and told me that horses could not go up its sides, 
that there were snakes upon it, etc. All this might be true, but it was evidently said to prevent any intention I might have had of delaying to see it more correctly. The plain appeared in many parts, as if the sea had at some time covered it. The dead flat, the sand in places mixed with particles of a substance which looked like broken shells, and the rocks worn away in such parts as, from their situation, could not have been acted upon by rain. We slept this night at an estate where there were several houses forming a hamlet, having passed through a considerable quantity of wooded land. The next morning we again proceeded over some lands that were covered with wood, and near twelve o'clock reached the town of Asu. Oh, the joy of again seeing a church, of the sight of a regular village, and civilized persons, if even these could be called civilized, according to European ideas. The country I passed over from Natal never can, in any state of civilization, or from any increase of population, be rendered a fertile tract. But it might be, without doubt, much improved, if proper wells were sunk, reservoirs made for rainwater, and trees planted. Much might be done. The plains I crossed are of three kinds, those of which the soil is a loose sand, producing the acaju, the mangaba, and several kinds of palm or cabbage trees. Upon them the grass is short, and of a kind which is not reckoned nourishing. In these situations are likewise produced several creeping plants, similar to those growing upon the common lands, near the seashore in England, and the trees are thinly scattered. The fruit of the acaju or cashew tree and of the mangaba are most delightful and are doubly acceptable in crossing the sands upon which they are to be met with. The former has been often described. The latter is a small round fruit and is not unlike a crab apple in appearance, but it is sweet and is unfit to be eaten until it drops from the tree. The pulp is fibrous but soft, and three seeds or kernels are contained in it of which the taste approaches that of almonds. The palm or cabbage trees also afford fruits, which are eaten when other food fails, but they are insipid. These plains are the taboleros, of which there exists also another kind, which are covered with brushwood of stinted height from the nature of the soil, but it is close and higher than a man on horseback. The road lies in many places through it but as it does not afford any shade, and prevents the wind from alleviating the intenseness of the heat, it is here that the power of the sun is fully felt. This brushwood is, however, not too thick to prevent cattle from breaking their way through it and feeding among it. The third description of plains are those of a better kind of soil, which produce good nourishing grass, but upon these no trees grow, small shrubs and briars alone are to be seen and oftentimes not even these. They are in parts stony, and have rising ground upon them, which is not sufficiently high to deserve the name of a ridge of hills, but it is enough to break the ocean-like flatness and immensity which these plains sometimes present to the traveller. After proceeding for hours, the same distance still seems to remain for him to traverse. These are the Campinas. I passed over some spots covered with high trees, which in our own country would be called woods of considerable extent, but in Brazil they could not be accounted of sufficient magnitude to compose a distinguishing feature in the naked regions which I traversed. The impression which a recollection of this portion of land left upon my mind is of a flat, uncovered country. I heard very little of beasts of prey. They had removed to better districts, I suppose, nor were we much troubled with snakes but my people never failed in taking up our quarters to look well around which proves their frequent appearance else this cautious behavior would not have become habitual to them i merely say that they are not plentiful in this barren part for elsewhere near lakes and large pools of water in fertile districts the rattle of the snake of which this is a distinguishing mark is often heard we saw a small kind of rabbit near rocky ground which is called moko the carapato or tick and the chiqua had entirely disappeared since we left the dry lake near natal the chiqua has been so often described that a minute account of it is in this place is unnecessary 
it is a very small insect which lodges itself principally under the nails of the feet in the country bordering upon the sea it is to be found most abundantly in sandy districts and yet although the plains of the sertan appear to be formed of the same kind of sand the insect is not to be met with in the whole tract of country between natal and aracati we arrived at Assul on the first of december having travelled about three hundred and forty miles in nineteen days the continual anxiety in which i was kept prevented me from keeping any regular journal of my proceedings from Asu to Arakachi, i have preserved the names of the places through which i passed the country is more inhabited and i was nearer the coast i travelled also with more ease but between natal and Asu, excepting the deserted pai paulo i did not pass any settlement which deserved even the name of village single cottages much separated from each other and often uninhabited contain the whole population of this district it is a miserable desolate country the town of Asu is built in a square and consists of about three hundred inhabitants it has two churches and a town hall and a prison at that time building the governor was the promoter of the work the place stands upon the great river of Asu, where it runs in two channels for a short distance it is situated upon the northern bank of the smaller branch there is an island of sand between the two branches and the distance from whence the river is divided to where it is again united is about two or perhaps three miles we cross the dry beds and enter the square which is not paved and the sand is deep many of the inhabitants were at their doors for all travellers are objects of curiosity and our appearance increased it i rode upon an english saddle and this particularly attracted the notice of an equestrian people the houses have only the ground floor some of them are plastered and whitewashed but the mud of which others are composed remains in its natural colour both within and without and the floors also are of earth so that in spite of the greatest care when water is scarce their inhabitants cannot keep themselves clean though the lower class of brazilians of all castes have many dirty customs allied to those of savage life still they are remarkably clean in their persons one of the greatest inconveniences of a situation when a brazilian complains of the place he happens to reside in is the want of a river or pool of water in the neighbourhood for the purpose of bathing we inquired for the house of a man of colour a saddler by trade with whom my guide was acquainted this person like many others had come to his door to see the travellers he soon recognised his friend and came forwards to speak to him he procured a house for us during our stay it was a small place upon which neither plaster nor whitewash had been bestowed with two rooms one opening to the square and the other to the river when we were a little settled and i had dressed myself i sallied forth to visit the vicar who resided in the best or rather least miserable-looking habitation in the town it was about the size of the cottages of labourers or small farmers in england but not nearly so comfortable though the floors were bricked it is true that this climate does not demand as much as those of bleaker regions that necessary of an english dwelling of english growth that undefinable something called comfort i told him i had called upon him as the first person of the neighbourhood and that i should always be happy in my proceedings to have the prayers and good wishes of his order and particularly his as the governor had spoken so very highly of him some further conversation passed between us but i did not stay long for i was much tired i made arrangements for sending my horses towards piatto where grass was to be had and the green stalks of maize sugar-cane and other plants but the guide recommended that we should not stay here longer than was necessary he said that whilst the horses continued on their journey they would bear up very well but if they were suffered to rest they would become stiff lose flesh and be rendered entirely unfit for service for a considerable time i did not then quite believe him but as there was no object in staying i desired julio to return with them to Asu the next day at two o'clock that we and they might have at any rate a rest of twenty-four hours i afterwards learnt by experience 
that the guide was quite right regarding the horses, that regular work is better than a rest of more than one whole day. Our friend the saddler, among other stories, mentioned having passed over the same ground which we had traversed from St. Lucia only a short time before us. He was in company with another man and a boy, and had also a dog with him. They had put up for the night under shelter of one of the rocks in the vicinity of the lake of which I have spoken. His companion had taken the horses to some little distance to graze. The boy and the dog remained with him. He made a fire and was in the act of preparing some dried meat to be cooked. When the boy called out, Where is the dog? The man answered, Here he is. Why, what is the matter? The boy said, What eyes then are those? Pointing at the same time to the corner of the rock. The man looked and saw the eyes, for nothing else was to be seen. He called to the dog, took up his fowling piece, and fired, whilst the dog started up and darted toward the spot. A jaguar rushed out and made off. It had been partly concealed under the rock, which, with the dazzle of the fire, had prevented its body from being seen. It had crouched and was ready for a spring when everything was quiet and unprepared. I learnt that there are some extensive salt works at the mouth of the Azul, and that small craft come from different parts of the coast occasionally to carry away the overplus. I took an additional guide here, as the man I had brought with me from Guyana was not acquainted with the remainder of the road, but I kept him with me, for although he was not a person I liked, still he was master of his employment. He managed the horses well, for they had, through his attention and knowledge of the business, all arrived here without sore backs, which I found, from the surprise expressed by all those who saw them, was not a usual piece of good fortune or good management. He was, however, a great bully when we quartered ourselves in the houses of poor people, with whom he found he could so act with impunity. He was also continually reporting that I was a great personage, that he might increase his own importance. Of this I said nothing, but on our return, whilst I was unwell, he gave himself out as the chief of the party, which I once caught him in the act of doing. I disconcerted him by threatening to turn him out of my service, and when I recovered he took care to draw in and be more careful who overheard him. The additional man I took with me was a dark-colored mulatto, young and stout. His father lived at Asu, and this son had a fair character. He brought with him a beautiful dog, which I afterwards possessed. The next day Julio came with the horses, and between three and four o'clock in the afternoon we left Asu. End of chapter 6, part 2Chapter 7, Part 1 From Travels in Brazil by Henry Coster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7, Part 1 Continuation of the Journey From Azul to Aracachi, From Aracachi to Sierra, Indians, the late governor, the family of the Feitosas. Our way was through woodlands for about one league when we came out upon the borders of the Lake Piato. We proceeded along them for another half-league, and unloaded near to the Casa de Palia, or Straw Cottage, of the Commandant of the district. Piato is a lake of three leagues in length, and about one league in breadth. In the summer its sides become sufficiently dry to allow them to be cultivated, but the center of it is invariably marshy and impassable. The fertility of its sides is very great, affording most plentifully rice, maize, sugarcane, melons, etc., and I saw some cotton trees planted very near to the edge. The lake is filled from the river in the rainy seasons, and as the lands around it are much higher than the lake itself, the waters which run down from them wash away all vestiges of cultivation, till these again subside, and the same operations are continued the following season. In such dreadfully severe years as that during which I traveled, the people of the district would be starved if this lake did not exist. It enabled the inhabitants of Azul, at the time I was there, to remain in their houses. The appearance of abundance, the bright green, the well-fed horses and cattle which we saw, as we traveled along the banks, enlivened us all. There was a look of security, a seeming certainty 
of at least the necessaries of life. Let what would happen, which we had not for a long time felt. The parched hills which surround the lake, its beautifully cultivated borders, and the dark and dangerous bogs which compose its center and prevent the communication of the inhabitants of either bank, formed a very extraordinary scene. No water was to be seen, but the mud was too deep and not of sufficient consistence for a man to be enabled to wade across, nor could a passage to the other side be effected by means of a raft, for a very trifling weight would make it sink. We unloaded under a small tree on rising ground, with the lake on our right. Between us and the house of the commandant there was a deep ravine, down which, in the rainy season, the waters rushed from the hills. This ravine was under cultivation, and was enclosed, a narrow path only being left to cross from where we had stationed ourselves to the hut on the opposite hill, which was entirely composed of wood, and the leaves of the carna uba and other kinds of cabbage trees. This was only a temporary habitation for the summer months, the usual residence of the owner being at Hasu. He had a large family, who were all very shy. Indeed, the females I scarcely saw, though they sometimes did peep at the Englishmen, not knowing until now that these were truly and bona fide nothing but men. I was this afternoon surprised at a feat of dexterity of one of the commandant's sons, a boy of about fourteen years of age. I had often heard of the manner of catching the wild cattle in the Sertan. The person employed for the purpose pursues on horseback with a long pole, having a goat at one end, the animal which he is desirous of bringing to the ground, until he overtakes it. He then pierces its side between the ribs and the hip bone, which, if it be done at the moment the beast raises its hind feet from the ground, throws it with such violence as sometimes to make it roll over. Some oxen have often trespassed upon the commandant's maze. One of the boys could no longer bear this quietly. He therefore mounted one of his father's horses, of which there were several very fine ones, took one of the long poles, and set off without a saddle, and in his shirt and drawers, to attack the animals. He drove them out of the maze, reached one of them with a goad at the right moment, and threw it down. But before he could turn his horse, another had attacked him, running its horns into the fleshy part of one of the horse's thighs. The boy had taken the precaution of putting a bridle on to his horse, otherwise if he had mounted with a halter only, he would most probably have suffered much more. One of his brothers came to his assistance and drove the oxen quite away. The facility with which the beast was thrown proved that practice and quickness were more requisite than strength in this operation. Towards the evening a shower of rain came on, being the first we had since we left Guyana, and indeed this was the only rain which fell during my journey between Guyana and Sierra. However, there is not usually much wet weather at this season of the year. The distress occasioned by the want of it arose from the failure of the accustomed rains in the preceding winter. We removed to the hut across the ravine, leaving the greatest part of our baggage under the tree but the shower did not continue long. The hut was too small to admit of our taking up our lodging for the night in it, and in case of rain, the tree was too far from the hut to reach it in time to prevent being wet. For which reason I determined to sleep in the ravine close to the fence, at the foot of the hill upon which the hut stood. I made a bed for myself upon two packages, to windward of the fire which we had kindled. But multitudes of mosquitoes rose about midnight, which obliged me to remove and lie down upon a hide to leeward. The fire was mostly composed of the dried ordure of cattle, the smoke of which is so thick and pungent as to prevent entirely any annoyance from these troublesome insects. But the remedy is bad enough, as it is almost impossible to open your eyes or to speak. The misery being exposed to the myriads of mosquitoes which hovered around us this night made us choose the smoke as the more endurable evil. None of us slept much, for attention to the fire has obliged everyone to be on the alert. Towards morning, the smoke was scarcely sufficient to protect us from these tormenting insects. I now learnt that, near to any lake or pool of water, the highest ground is always to be fixed upon for a night station. Even the commandant upon the hill had fires to windward of the house during the whole of the night. 
Early in the morning we continued our journey for some distance along the banks of the lake, and then entered upon some open land, which was now quite dry. We slept under a clump of trees, distant about twenty miles from Piatto. The cattle we saw this day were in good condition, plainly showing that the country enjoyed a plentiful supply of water. The road of the next day led us through woodlands, and over loose stony ground, but the woods of this part of the country are not large and luxuriant. They have not the grandeur of the forests of Pernambuco, nor is the brushwood which grows under them so close and thick. We passed through some estates, of which the livestock seemed in good condition, and saw this day a whole drove or lot, loche, of cream-colored mares. I asked for water to drink at one of the houses. Some was brought to me by a pretty white girl, who was apparently about seventeen years of age. She talked a great deal, and in a lively manner, so as to show that she had inhabited more civilized regions. There were in the house two children of color, which she told me were hers. She was the daughter of a man of small property, who had married her, contrary to her wishes, to a wealthy mulatto man. She gave a message to the guide to deliver to her husband, who was superintending the felling of some timber by the roadside, along which we were to pass. We met with him. He was of a dark complexion, and about forty years of age. I learned her story from the Azu guide. He said it had made some noise in these parts at the time. In the afternoon we passed over a salt marsh, surrounded by great numbers of Karnauba trees. We bordered the marsh, looking for a crossing, and entered it where we found the footsteps of others who had recently passed. The mud was from twelve to eighteen inches deep where we crossed, but it was in some parts impassable. The salt had coagulated wherever the footsteps of a horse had formed an opening in the mud, and had collected a small quantity of water. The breadth of the march might be about two hundred yards in the center, and its length about one league. After leaving the marsh, we reached the tabolero, upon which we were to sleep. Towards evening the wind was high. I was riding as if I had been seated upon a side saddle, with both my legs on the same side of the horse, and with my umbrella over my head to shade me from the heat of the sun. A sudden gust of wind took me and my umbrella, and landed us in the sand, to the no small entertainment of my companions. If the horse had gone off I should have been awkwardly situated." but he had traveled too many leagues to be frightened at trifles such as these. We continued traveling for two days over the same kind of ground, plains with trees thinly scattered and spots of wooded land. We likewise crossed two salt marshes, but upon these there was no mud. The water which oozes from the land on digging into it is, however, salt, but the soil was dry and hard. Mimosa, the dog belonging to my new guide, afforded us considerable amusement. She generally made her way through the wood at a little distance from the road, now and then returning to the path. She was very expert in discovering the tattoo bola, or rolling tattoo, a small species of armadillo. This animal is protected by its bony shell. On being touched, it rolls itself up in the manner of a hedgehog. As soon as the dog saw one of these, she touched it with her nose and barked continuing the same operation as often as the armadillo attempted to move, until her master answered the well-known signal. Several were caught in this manner. The flesh is as fine as that of a young pig. The tatu verdadero, or legitimate armadillo, which is much larger, does not roll itself up, and Mimosa sometimes pursued it to its hole, and stood at the mouth of it, until she had her master's permission to come away. There exists a third species of armadillo, called the tatu peda, which is said to feed upon human flesh. On the 7th of December we arrived at 10 o'clock in the morning at the village of St. Lucia, containing from two to three hundred inhabitants. It is built in a square and has one church. The houses are small and low. Here I was able to replenish my spirit bottles and to purchase a supply of hapadoras, these are cakes of brown sugar or treacle, boiled to a sufficient consistency to harden, by which means it is more portable, and much less liable to be wasted in its conveyance. The day before we reached St. Lucia, our resting place at midday was under some trees, 
and not far from a cottage. I observed the skin of a jaguar, the onza pintada, in the language of the country, stretched upon several pieces of wood. It had the appearance of being quite fresh. I had afterwards some conversation with a cottager, and he told me that he had killed the animal to which the skin had belonged, with the assistance of three dogs, only the day before. It had committed great destruction, particularly among the sheep, but had escaped for a length of time, from never appearing at the same place twice successively. The preceding day this man had gone out with his three dogs, as was occasionally his practice. His musket was loaded, but he was without any farther supply of ammunition, and he had his long knife in his girdle. One of the dogs got sent to the jaguar and followed it up to the den. The beast was within. The dogs attacked it. One of them was killed and another much maimed, which we saw, and even the third was hurt. The man fired as soon as the jaguar came out and wounded it and when he saw that it was considerably disabled, he ran in upon the animal with his knife and killed it. In doing which, one of his arms was much lacerated, and this was bound up at the time I conversed with him. He asked for some powder, saying that there was still another jaguar in the neighborhood. The skins are much valued in Brazil for saddle cloths, and from the make of the saddles used in that country, a cloth of some sort, or a skin, is required for each. I have the skin of a jaguar in my possession, which measures five feet and three inches. The onza vermelha, feliz con color, and the onza preta, feliz discolor, are also to be met with, but the jaguar is more common and more dreaded than either of these. The same day we passed over the dry bed of the Panema. It was the third river we had crossed since our departure from Asu, and all were in the same state. St. Lucia stands upon the northern bank of a dry river, in a sandy, loose soil. We took up our midday station under the roof of a miserable hut. The ashes of an extinguished fire in its center, and a bench of twisted twigs, alone denoted that it had served as a dwelling. Several of the inhabitants of the village soon came to us to inquire for news from Pernambuco, and among others a young man whose accent discovered him to be a native of some of the northern provinces of Portugal, and whose manner displayed the idea which he entertained of his own importance. He said that he had orders from the commandant to demand my passport, to which I answered that if the commandant had wished to see the passport, he would certainly have sent one of his officers to ask for it. The young man rejoined that he was the sergeant of the district. I said that I did not doubt the truth of what he said, but that I could not know him in that capacity, because, instead of being in uniform, he had appeared in the usual dress of shirt and drawers. And I added that his manner was such that I had resolved not to show it to him at all. He said I must and should show it. I turned to Julio and asked him if he had heard what the man said. Julio answered, Yes, sir. Never mind. Footnote. Deixe estar meu amo. End footnote. The sergeant went off, and we prepared our arms, much to the amazement and amusement of some of the more peaceable inhabitants. I soon saw him again, and he was coming toward us with two or three other persons. I called to him to keep at a distance, telling him that Julio would fire if he did not. This he judged advisable to do, and, as I thought it proper and prudent to advance as soon as possible, we left the place soon after one o'clock, with a broiling sun therefore we saw no more of the sergeant. The dry river upon which this village stands divides the captaincies of Rio Grande and Sierra. Consequently, there was much reason for the commandant's demand of my passport, but it was necessary to preserve the high opinion generally entertained of the name of Inglés, Englishman, wherever the people possessed sufficient knowledge to understand that the said Ingleses were not bichos or animals, and also to keep up my own importance with the persons about me. It would not have answered to have thus given way to a man who was inclined to make me feel the consequence which he judged his place would allow him to assume. If I had been invited to the commandant's house in a civil way, or if the sergeant had come to me in his uniform, all would have gone well. These trifles, though apparently of no importance, weigh very heavily with persons who have made such small advances toward civilization. Public opinion is everything. 
if the idea of my being a bishu and a heretic had not been counterbalanced by that of rank and consequence i might have had the whole village upon me and have been deserted by my own people into the bargain the general features of the captaincy of hio grangi may be laid down as displaying tolerable fertility to the southward of natal and as having a barren aspect to the northward of it excepting the banks in immediate neighbourhood of the potengi we pass through the estate of ilia distant from st lucia one league and a half and proceeded after taking water four leagues beyond it to an uninhabitable and unfinished house the owner had commenced building during the rains of the former year and had gone on with the work until the spring of water near to the place failed the house was tiled and spacious but the woodwork only of the walls was erected it had been the intention of this person to establish a fazenda here but the failure of the spring of water would probably deter him from his purpose the country from ilia to tibu where we halted at noon on the following day a distance of ten leagues was now without water two parties of travellers besides our own had taken up their night's lodging at this unfinished house the several fires the groups around them some cooking some eating and others asleep the pack saddles and trunks strewed about as they had been taken from the horses backs formed a scene worthy of a painter all was darkness around and the wind blew fresh for the house had no walls and no obstruction to oppose its entrance save the upright posts which supported the roof the light of the fire sometimes flashed upon one or other of the countenances of the travellers and on these occasions alone could i discover their colour and consequently in some degree their rank i might be in the company of slaves or of white men for both would have taken up their night's station in the same manner an old man of colour addressed me asking if i was the englishman who had rested at noon at st lucia on my answering in the affirmative he said that he was at the commandant's at the time and there were several debates about the mode of proceeding respecting me and mine that my determination not to give up my passport had caused some demur and that among other suppositions of who i might be one wiseacre said there was no knowing whether i was not one of bonaparte's ministers and what might be my diabolical plans indeed i was often amused with the strange ideas which the country people entertained of distant nations of which they had heard the names and perhaps some further particulars these were altered in such a manner by their misapprehension that it was oftentimes difficult to discover what the real circumstances were which had been related to them we traversed another salt marsh this afternoon the marsh i have mentioned as having crossed on the fourth of this month was the only one of that description which i met with the others which i have spoken of and those which i shall have occasion to mention are dry and the soil upon them in summer is hard it is dark coloured and produces no grass but upon the skirts of the marshes are seen several seaside plants and the water that oozes from them is quite salt our road the next morning lay through brushwood for three leagues over heavy sand and three leagues over a salt marsh near midday we passed a cottage in which resided the herdsmen of a fazenda and immediately beyond ascended a hill of heavy sand called tibu from which we again saw the sea i can scarcely describe the sensations which were occasioned by this sight i felt as if i was at home as if free to act as i pleased the spring of water near to the cottage was dried up but there was one on the opposite side of the sand hill which still afforded a small supply we now took up our midday station under a miserable hut erected at the summit of the hill by the inhabitants of the cottage for the purpose of curing their fish they had fixed upon this spot from its height and consequent exposure to the wind the descent to the seashore is steep but not dangerous as the depth of the sand prevents any apprehension of a horse falling and rolling down the great length of the journeys of the two last days had almost knocked up the horse upon which my goyana god rode i saw that the man was not inclined to walk for the purpose of easing the animal and therefore wishing to see what could be done by example i dismounted and took off the greatest part of my clothes removed the bit from my horse's mouth tied the bridle round his neck 
and turned them loose among the others. This had the desired effect, and John also was then ashamed to be the only person on horseback. We advanced very quickly over the wet sands, past two fishermen's huts, distant from Tibu two leagues, and one league further, turned up from the shore by a steep sandy path, which took us to the hamlet of Areas, composed of one respectable-looking dwelling and five or six straw huts. The lands we passed this afternoon, bordering the shore, are low and sandy, without trees and without cultivation. In seasons less severe than this, there is a small spring of water, not far from the fishermen's huts which we had passed, but now it is entirely dried up. These huts stand near to a small piece of ground of which the soil is less sandy than that in the neighborhood, and a crop of watermelons is usually obtained from it, which had, however, completely failed this year. On our arrival at Areas, I made for the principal house and asked for a night's lodging. The front room was offered to me, upon which our horses were unloaded and our baggage put into it. I was surprised to see no elderly or middle-aged person belonging to this house, there were three or four boys only, of whom the oldest was about sixteen years of age, and he appeared to direct the concerns of the establishment. He had a piece of enclosed ground near to the house, into which he allowed our horses to be turned, and this arrangement being made, I had then time to look round and see my quarters. Not a tree or shrub was to be seen in the neighborhood, but there were immense sand hills on one side, and on the other the sea. The convenience of the spot for fishing could alone have made these people fix upon it for a residence. I sent out to purchase a fowl, one was bought, for which I paid 640 hayes, about three shillings, six pence. Julio told me that he had seen some goats and kids, upon which I sent him to purchase one of the latter. He returned with a large one, for which the owner asked 80 hayes, less than six pence. A boy passed in the evening with a large turtle, which he begged the guide to exchange for about one pound of the kid. The meat was given to him, but his turtle would have been of no use to us. Julio, when we went to purchase the kid, had heard a long story about a ghost which made its appearance in the house at which we had stationed ourselves. The persons from whom he heard it had advised him to make me acquainted with the circumstance that I might move to some other place for the night. I began to suspect some trick and told my people my idea of the sort of ghost we were likely to meet with. I found that this cheered them, as by them shadows were more dreadful than flesh and blood. We slung our hammocks in different directions in a large room, and each took his arms and settled for the night. A sudden panic seized my additional guide, and he was sneaking out of the room, but I stopped him and said that I would send him back to his own country if he went out. The business was, however, settled by taking the key from the door. The story ran thus. The master and mistress of the house had been murdered by two of their slaves, and it was said that their ghosts occasionally took a walk in this room. Nay, it was even reported that the old gentleman used his gold-headed cane and woke with it those who slept in the house. We had not, however, the honor of his company, and in the morning had much laughter at the fellow who had been so dreadfully frightened. The country through which we proceeded on the morrow presented a more cheering appearance. We reached at a short distance from Areas some enclosed lands, then passed over a salt marsh and arrived at Cajuais, distant from Areas two leagues. The place receives its name from the great number of Acaju trees, and consists of six or seven huts. Here we dined, finding good water and abundance of maize stalks for our horses. There were some appearance of comfort and enjoyment of life, at least comparatively speaking. Beyond Cajuais, three leagues, we slept near to a hut, after traveling through some more cultivated ground. I was asked by some persons at Cajuais at what place we had slept the preceding night. I answered at Areas. They then inquired in which house at Areas, as at that village there was none into which travelers could be received. I replied that, on the contrary, there was the great house, which I had found very comfortable. They were perfectly astonished at my sleeping in this haunted place, and for some time imagined that I was joking. Afterwards, on other occasions, I heard of the same story, which appeared to have taken deep root in the faith of all those who spoke of it. 
the next day about five o'clock in the afternoon we reach aracachi distant seven leagues from where we had slept great part of this day's journey was through salt marshes or plains covered with the carnauba the tall naked stems of the palms crowned with branches like the cocoa tree at the summit which rustle with the least breath of air in the bare and dark-coloured soil upon which no grass grows and rarely any shrub give a dismal look to these plains the computed distance from azu to aracachi is forty-five leagues when i approached aracachi i sent my goyana guide forwards with a letter which i had received from the governor of rio grande to senor jose fidelis bajoso a wealthy merchant and landed proprietor on my arrival i found that the guide had delivered the letter and that senor bajoso had given him the keys of an unoccupied house which i was to inhabit during my stay the town of aracachi consists chiefly of one long street with several others of minor importance branching from it to the southward it stands upon the southern bank of the river jaguaribe which is so far influenced by the tide at the ebb the stream is fordable and as it spreads considerably from the main channel some parts remain quite dry at low water the houses of aracachi unlike those of any other small places which i visited have one story above the ground floor i inquired the reason of this and was told that the floods of the river were sometimes so great as to render necessary a retreat to the upper part of the houses the town contains three churches and a town hall and prison but no monasteries this captaincy does not contain any such pest the inhabitants are in number about six hundred the house i was to occupy consisted of two good-sized rooms with large closets or small bedchambers leading from each called alcovas and a kitchen these were all above and underneath there was a sort of warehouse to the back we had an oblong yard enclosed by a brick wall with a gate at the farther end by which our horses entered and here they remained until better arrangements could be made for them i slung my hammock in the front room and desired that some fowl should be purchased as stock whilst we remained here one was preparing for me when three black servants appeared from senor pajoso the first brought a large tray with a plentiful and excellently cooked supper wine sweetmeats etc a second carried a silver ewer and basin and a french towel and a third came to know if there was anything which i particularly wished for besides what had been prepared this man took back my answer and the other two remained to attend until i had supped i learnt from my guide afterwards that another tray had been sent for my people i suppose that senor bojoso had thought proper to treat me in this manner on the day of my arrival from an idea that i could not have arranged any means of cooking etc till the next day but in the morning coffee and cakes were brought to me and the same major domo came to know if all was to my liking whilst i remained at aracachi senor bajoso provided everything for me and for my people in the same handsome manner this treatment is usual where persons are well recommended it is notable and shows the state of manners among the higher orders in the morning i received a visit from senor bajoso whose manners were ceremonious and courtly on my mentioning the inconvenience to which i was putting him by my stay he said that he could not alter in any way his mode of treating me because if he did he should not do his duty to the governor of rio grande to whom he owed many obligations and consequently took every opportunity of showing his gratitude by all the means in his power the reason which he thus gave for his civility completely set at rest anything i could have said to prevent its continuance he ordered all my horses to be taken to an island in the river upon which there was plenty of grass i had resolved to send john back to pernambuco by sea and spoke to senor bajoso upon the subject when he immediately said that one of his smacks was going in which my servant might have a berth john was out of health and not adapted to the kind of life which we had been leading and should be yet under the necessity of continuing this day i remained at home employing the greatest part of it in sleeping and in the evening returned senor bajoso's visit a white man with whom my guayana guide was acquainted called upon me and we arranged an expedition in a canoe for the next day to go down the river to its mouth 
My guide's friend came as he had appointed, and his canoe was waiting for us. His two negroes pulled where the water was shallow, and paddled us along where it became deep. We passed several beautiful islands, some of which had cattle upon them, and others of which the land was too low to produce grass. The latter were entirely covered with mangroves, which grow likewise on the borders of the river, the shores being clear of them only where settlements are formed, and the proprietors have extirpated them. The river is in parts about half a mile in breadth, and in some places where there are islands, it is broader, taken from the outermost sides of the two branches which it and the situation forms. The town is distant from the bar about eight miles. We boarded Senor Bojosa's smack, took the longboat belonging to it, and proceeded to the bar, which is narrow and dangerous, owing to the sandbanks on each side. Upon these the surf is very violent. The sand is so loose at the mouth of the river that the masters of the coasting vessels are obliged to use every precaution possible each voyage as if they were entering a harbor with which they are unacquainted. The river widens immediately within the bar and forms rather a spacious bay. Even if no other obstacle presented itself, the port cannot, from the uncertainty of the depth of its entrance, ever become of any importance. Coasters alone can enter, and I understand that the sand in the river also accumulates. The sandbanks project from each side in some places so much as to render the navigation even for a boat, somewhat difficult from a short distance above the bay. Footnote. I heard in the beginning of the year 1815 that the bar had been completely choked up during a violent gale of wind from the sea, whilst two coasters were in the river, taking in cargoes for Pernambuco. End footnote. On our return we dined at an estate upon the banks of the river, of which the owner was an acquaintance of the man who had proposed this party. Opposite to the dwelling-house of this estate stands an island, which produces abundance of grass, but there is no fresh water upon it. This obliges the cattle that feed there regularly to pass over to the mainland every day to drink and return to the island, which they are so much accustomed to do that no herdsman is necessary to compel them. We saw them swim across and all pass close to the house in their way to the pool. The owner said that the calves invariably took that side of their mothers to which the tide was running, to prevent being carried away in the force of the stream, and indeed I observed that all the calves took the same side. In the evening arrangements were made for the hire of two horses to carry me and one of my people to Sierra, leaving my own beast to rest for the journey back to Pernambuco. I again called upon Senor Pajoso to make known to him my plan, and he then gave me a letter to a gentleman with whom he was acquainted at Sierra. A guide for the journey was also procured. The horses were ready, and in the morning I set forth, accompanied by my Guayana guide and the man whom I had hired for this additional journey. He rode a horse which he had been charged to take to Sierra. He was an old man, half mad and very amusing. We hailed the ferryman to take us across the river before daybreak, but as he did not answer, we took possession of a large canoe which lay empty, and was tied to a post. We got into it, and the Guayana guide paddled us very dexterously to the middle of the river, where the canoe grounded. It had struck upon a sandbank, owing to the man being unacquainted with the navigation of the stream. We were obliged to undress and get into the water to push the canoe off, which we succeeded in doing, and reached the opposite side in safety. The horses crossed over, tied to the sides of the canoe, swimming or taking the ground according to the depth of the water. The distance between Aracachi and the Via da Fortaleza do Sierra Grande is thirty leagues, principally consisting of sandy lands covered with brushwood. In a few places the wood is loftier and thicker, but of this there is not much. We passed also some fine varseas or low marshy grounds, which were now sufficiently dry for cultivation, and indeed the only land from which any crop could be expected in this particularly severe dry season. The country is, generally speaking, flat, and in some parts the path led us near to the seashore, but was never upon it. We saw several cottages and three or four hamlets. The facility of obtaining fish from the sea has rendered living comparatively easy in these parts. We passed through an Indian village and the town of St. Jose, 
each built in a square, and each containing about three hundred inhabitants. I understood that the governors of Sierra are obliged to take possession of their office at St. Jose. We made the journey in four days, arriving at the Villa da Fortaleza on the 16th of December. It might have entered at noon on the fourth day, but I preferred waiting until the evening. I performed the journey from Natal to Sierra, a distance of 160 leagues, according to the vague computation of the country in 34 days. The morning after my arrival, I sent back to Aracachi the men and horses which I had brought with me. End of chapter 7, part 1Chapter 7, Part 2 of Travels in Brazil, Volume 1, by Henry Coster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7, Part 2 The town of the fortress of Sierra is built upon heavy sand, in the form of a square, with four streets leading from it, and it has an additional long street on the north side of the square, which runs in a parallel direction but is unconnected with it. The dwellings have only a ground floor, and the streets are not paved, but some of the houses have footpaths of brick in front. It contains three churches, a governor's palace, the town hall and prison, a custom house and a treasury. The number of inhabitants I judge to be from 1,000 to 1,200. The fort, from which the place derives its name, stands upon a sand hill close to the town, and consists of a sand or earth rampart towards the sea, and of stakes driven into the ground on the land side. It contains four or five pieces of cannon of several sizes, which were pointed various ways, and I observed that the gun of heaviest metal was mounted on the land side. Those which pointed to the sea were not of sufficient caliber to have reached a vessel in the usual anchorage ground. The powder magazine is situated upon another part of the sand hill, in full view of the harbor. There is not much to invite the preference given to this spot. It has no river, nor any harbor, and the beach is bad to land upon. The breakers are violent, and the hecifi, or reef of rocks, afford very little protection to vessels riding at anchor upon the coast. The settlement was formerly situated three leagues to the northward upon a narrow creek, where there exists only the remains of an old fort. The beach is steep, which renders the surf dangerous for a boat to pass through in making for the shore. A vessel unloaded during my stay there, and part of her cargo, consisted of the flower of the mangia, in small bags. The longboat approached as near to the shore as it could without striking, and the bags were landed on men's heads. The persons employed to bring them ashore passed through the surf with them, but if they were caught by a wave, the flower was wetted and injured, and indeed very few reached the shore perfectly dry. The anchorage ground is bad and exposed. The winds are always from the southward and eastward, and if they were very variable, a vessel could scarcely ride upon the coast. The reef of rocks forms a complete ridge at a considerable distance from the shore, and is to be seen at low water. Upon this part of the coast, the reef runs lower than towards Pernambuco, which has obliged the people of Sierra to take advantage of the rocks, being rather higher here and affording some little protection to ships at anchor. The spot seems to have been preferred owing to this advantage, trifling as it is, though the rocks are much inferior to those which form the bold reef of Pernambuco. The ridge runs parallel with the shore for about one quarter of a mile, with two openings, one above and the other below the town. A small vessel may come to anchor between it and the shore, but a large ship can only bring up either to the northward or to the southward of the town, in one of the openings of the ridge or on the outside of it. The opening to the northward is to be preferred. A vessel coming from the northward should make the point of Mocoripe, which lies one league to the southward of the town, and upon it stands a small fort. This being done, she will be able to make the anchorage ground. On the appearance of a ship, the fort of the town has a white flag flying upon a high flagstaff. To the northward of the town, between the reef and the shore, there is a rock called Pedra da Velha, or the Old Woman's Rock. 
which is to be seen even at high water, by the breakers upon it. When a vessel leaves the port, she may either pass between this rock and the shore, giving a berth to a shoal about one hundred yards to the northward, or she may run between the rock and the principal ridge or reef. The public buildings are small and low, but are neat and whitewashed, and adapted to the purposes for which they are intended. Notwithstanding the disadvantage to the general appearance imparted by the wretched soil upon which the town has been erected, I could not avoid thinking that its look was that of a thriving place. But the difficulty of land carriage, particularly in such a country, the one of a good harbor, and the dreadful droughts, prevent any sanguine hope of its rise to opulence. The commerce of Sierra is very limited, and is not likely to increase. The long credits which it is necessary for the trader to give preclude the hope of quick returns, to which British merchants are accustomed. I wrote immediately on my arrival to the house of Senor Marcos Antonio Bricio, the chief of the treasury and of the naval department, with several other titles which are not transferable into our language. To this gentleman I had a letter of introduction from Senor Bajoso. I found several persons assembled at his house to drink tea and play at cards. Senor Marcos is an intelligent and well-informed man, who has seen good society in Lisbon, and had held a high situation at Maranhão before he was appointed to Sierra. I was introduced to Senor Lorenzo, a merchant, who had connections in trade with England. He recognized my name for he had been acquainted with near relations of mine in Lisbon. I was invited to stay with him, and received from him every civility. The morning after my arrival I visited the governor, Luis Barba Lardo de Menendez. Footnote. This person has since been removed to a province of more importance. End footnote. And was received by him with much affability. He said that he wished he had more opportunities of showing the regard which he entertained for my countrymen, and that some of them would come and settle in his captaincy. He built, during the administration of the province, the center of the palace, and employed Indian workmen, paying them half the usual price of labor. He was in the habit of speaking of the property of individuals residing within the province as if it was his own, saying his ships, his cotton, etc., I happened to be at Sierra on the Queen of Portugal's birthday. The company of regular troops, consisting of 114 men, was reviewed. They looked respectable and were in tolerable order. In the chief apartment of the palace stood a full-length picture of the Prince Regent of Brazil, which was placed against the wall, and was raised about three feet from the ground. Three or four steps ascended from the floor to the foot of the picture. Upon the lowest of these the governor stood in full uniform, and each person passed before him and bowed, that thus the state of the sovereign court might be kept up. I dined with the governor this day, at whose table were assembled all the military and civil officers, and two or three merchants. He placed me at his right hand, as a stranger, thus showing the estimation in which Englishmen are held. About thirty persons were present at the table, of which more than half wore uniforms. Indeed, the whole display was much more brilliant than I had expected. Everything was good and handsome. I had opportunities of seeing the Indian villages of Aronchas and Masangana, and there is a third in this neighborhood, of which I have forgotten the name. Each is distant from Sierra between two and three leagues in different directions. They are built in the form of a square, and each contains about three hundred inhabitants, one of my usual companions on these occasions was acquainted with the vicar of Aronchas, and we therefore made him a visit. He resided in a building which had formerly belonged to the Jesuits. It is attached to the church and has balconies from the principal corridor, which look into it. The Indians of these villages, and indeed of all those which I pass through, are Christians, though it is said that some few of them follow in secret their own heathenish rites paying adoration to the maraca and practicing all the customs of their religion. If I may use this word, of which so inexact a description is given in Mr. Southey's History of Brazil, when the Roman Catholic religion does take root in them, it of necessity degenerates into the most abject superstition. In adherence to superstitious rites, 
whether of roman catholic ordination or prescribed by their own undefined faith appears to be the only part of their character in which they show any consistency each village has its priest who is oftentimes a vicar and resident for life upon the spot a director is also attached to each village who is supposed to be a white man he has great power over the persons within his jurisdiction if a proprietor of land is in want of workmen he applies to the director who agrees for the price at which the daily labor is to be paid and he commands one of his chief indians to take so many men and proceed with them to the estate for which they are hired the laborers receive the money themselves and expend it as they please but the bargains thus made are usually below the regular price of labor each village has two juices ordinarios or mayors who act for one year one juice is a white man and the other an indian but it may easily be supposed that the former has in fact the management these juices have the power of putting suspicious persons into confinement and of punishing for small crimes those of more importance wait for the cohesum or circuit of the ovidor of the captaincy each village contains a town hall and prison the administration of justice in the sertão is generally spoken of as most wretchedly bad every crime obtains impunity by the payment of a sum of money an innocent person is sometimes punished through the interest of a great man whom he may have offended and the murderer escapes who has the good fortune to be under the protection of a powerful patron this proceeds still more from the feudal state of the country than from a corruption of the magistrates who might often be inclined to do their duty and yet be aware that their exertions would be of no avail and would possibly prove fatal to themselves the indians have likewise their capitoins mores and this title is conferred for life it gives the holder some power over his fellows but as it is among them unaccompanied by the possession of property the indian capitains morais are much ridiculed by the whites and indeed the half-naked officer with his gold-headed cane is a personage who would excite laughter from the most rigid nerves the indians are in general a quiet and inoffensive people they have not much fidelity but although they desert they will not injure those whom they have served their lives are certainly not passed in a pleasant manner under the eye of a director by whom they are imperiously treated consequently it is not surprising that they should do all in their power to leave their villages and be free from an immediate superior but even when they have escaped from the irksome dominion of the director they never settle in one place the indian scarcely ever plants for himself or if he does rarely waits the crop he sells his maize or mangio for half its value before it is fit to be gathered and removes to some other district his favorite pursuits are fishing and hunting a lake or rivulet will alone induce him to be stationary for any length of time he has a sort of independent feeling which makes him spurn at anything like a wish to deprive him of his own free agency to the director he submits because it is out of his power to resist an indian can never be persuaded to address the master to whom he may have hired himself by the term of senor though it is made use of by the whites in speaking to each other and by all other free people in the country but the negroes also use it in speaking to their masters therefore the indian will not he addresses his temporary master by the term of amo or patron protector or patron the reluctance to use the term of senor may perhaps have commenced with the immediate descendants of those who are in slavery and thus the objection may have become traditionary they may refuse to give by courtesy what was once required from them by law however if it began in this manner it is not now continued for the same reason as none of those with whom i conversed and there were very many appeared to know that their ancestors had been obliged to work as slaves the instances of murder committed by indians are rare they are pilferers rather than thieves when they can they eat immoderately but if it is necessary they can live upon a very trifling quantity of food to which their idleness often reduces them they are much addicted to liquor and will dance in a ring singing some of the monotonous ditties of their own language and drink for nights and days without ceasing their dances are not indecent as those of africa 
the mulattoes consider themselves superior to the Indians, and even the Creole blacks look down upon them. He is as paltry as an Indian. Footnote. Mofino como caboclo. End footnote. Is a common expression among the lower orders in Brazil. They are vilely indifferent regarding the conduct of their wives and daughters. Lying and other vices attached to savage life belong to them. Affection seems to have little hold upon them. They appear to be less anxious for the life and welfare of their children than any other caste of men who inhabit that country. The women, however, do not, among these semi-barbarians, perform the principal drudgery. If the husband is at home, he fetches water from the rivulet and fuel from the wood. He builds the hut whilst his wife takes shelter in some neighbor's shed. But if they travel, she has her young children to carry, the pots, the baskets, and the excavated gourds, whilst the husband takes the wallet of goat skin and his hammock rolled up upon his back, his fishing net and his arms, and walks in the rear. The children are washed on the day of their birth in the nearest brook or pool of water. Both the men and the women are cleanly in many of their habits, and particularly in those relating to their persons, but in some other matters their customs are extremely disgusting. The same knife is used for all purposes, and with little preparatory cleaning, is employed in surfaces of descriptions widely opposite. They do not reject any kind of food, and devour it almost without being cooked. Rats and other small vermin, snakes and alligators, are all accepted. The instinct, for I know not what else to call it, which the Indians possess above other men, in finding their way across a wood to a certain spot on the opposite side without path or apparent mark, is most surprising. They trace footsteps over the dry leaves which lie scattered under the trees. The letter carriers from one province to another are mostly Indians, for from habit they endure great fatigue and will walk day after day with little rest for months together. I have met them with their wallets made of goatskin upon their shoulders, walking at a regular pace which is not altered by rough or smooth ground. Though a horse may outstrip one of these men for the first few days, still if the journey continues long, the Indian will in the end arrive before him. If a criminal has eluded the diligence of the police officers, Indians are sent in pursuit of him as a last resort. It is well known that they will not take him alive. Each man who sees the offender fires, for they do not wish to have any contention. Nor is it possible for the magistrate to fix upon the individual of the party who shot the criminal. For if any of them are asked who killed him, the answer invariably is os omens, the men. It is usually said that a party of Indians will fight tolerably well, but that two or three will take to their heels at the first alarm. Some of them, however, are resolute and sufficiently courageous, but the general character is usually supposed to be cowardly, inconstant, devoid of acute feelings, as forgetful of favors as of injuries, obstinate in trifles, regardless of matters of importance. The character of the Negro is more decided. It is worse, but it is also occasionally better. From the black race, the worst of men may be formed, but they are capable, likewise, of great and good actions. The Indians seem to be without energy or exertion, devoid of great good or great evil. Much may at the same time be said in their favor. They have been unjustly dealt with. They have been trampled upon and afterwards treated as children. They have been always subjected to those who consider themselves their superiors. And this desire to govern them has even been carried to the direction of their domestic arrangements. But no, if they are a race of acute beings capable of energy, of being deeply interested upon any subject, they would do more than they have done. The priesthood is open to them, but they do not take advantage of it. Footnote. I heard from good authority that there are two instances of Indians having been ordained as secular priests, and that both these individuals died from excessive drinking. End footnote. I never saw an Indian mechanic in any of the towns. There is no instance of a wealthy Indian, Rich mulattoes and negroes are by no means rare. I have had many dealings with them as guides and carriers, and subsequently as laborers, and have no reason to complain, for I was never injured by any of them, but neither did I receive any particular good service, excepting in the instance of Julio. 
For guides and carriers they are well adapted, as their usual habits lead them to the rambling life which these employments encourage. As laborers I found that they had usually a great inclination to overreach, but their schemes were badly laid, and consequently easily discovered. I never could depend upon them for any length of time, and to advance money or clothing to them is a certain loss. If I had any labor which was to be performed by a given time, the overseer would always reckon upon his mulatto and negro free people, but did not mention in the list of persons who were to work any of the Indians whom I was then employing, and on my speaking of them he answered, an Indian is only to be mentioned for the present day, meaning that no reliance is to be placed upon them. Footnote. Caboclo eso para hoje. End footnote. Like most of the aboriginal inhabitants of the Western Hemisphere, these people are of a copper color. They are short and stoutly made, but their limbs, though large, have not the appearance of possessing great strength. They have no show of muscle. The face is disproportionately broad, the nose flat, the mouth wide, the eyes deep and small, the hair black, coarse and lank. None of the men have whiskers, and their beards are not thick. The women, when they are young, have by no means an unpleasant appearance, but they soon fall off and become ugly. Their figures are seldom well shaped. Deformity is rare among the Indians. I do not recollect to have seen any individual of this race who had been born defective, and the well-informed persons with whom I conversed were of opinion that the Indians are more fortunate in this respect than any other race with whom they were acquainted. All the Indians of Pernambuco speak Portuguese, but few of them pronounce it well. There is always a certain twang which discovers the speaker to be an Indian, although the voice was heard without the person being seen. Many of them, however, do not understand any other language. The Indians seldom, if ever, speak Portuguese so well as the generality of the Creole Negroes. It must be perfectly understood that although there may be some unfair dealings occasionally of the director toward the Indian, still this race cannot be enslaved. The Indian cannot be made to work for any person against his inclination. He cannot be bought and sold. An Indian will sometimes make over his child, when very young, to a rich person, to be taught some trade, or to be brought up as a household servant. But as soon as the child is of an age to provide for itself, it cannot be prevented from so doing. It may leave the person under whose care it has been placed, if so inclined. Two Indians presented themselves at the gate of the Carmelite convent of Guyana, and requested and were permitted to see the prior. They put into his hands a purse containing several gold coins, saying that they had found it near Dois Hills. They begged that he would order a number of masses to be said in their behalf, which were to be paid for from the contents of the purse. The prior, admiring their honesty, asked one of them to remain with him as his servant, to which the man agreed. The friar was in the habit of going into the country to a friend's house to shoot. On one occasion, after the Indian had served him for some time, he left the convent and took him on one of his expeditions. But when they were about halfway, the friar discovered that he had forgotten his powder horn. He gave the key of his trunk to the Indian and desired him to fetch the powder whilst he proceeded. In vain he waited at his friend's house for his servant, and on his return to the convent in the evening he heard that he was not there. He went immediately to his cell, supposing that he had been robbed of all his money, and whatever else the fellow could carry off. But to his joy he discovered, on examination, that the man had only taken the powder horn, two silver coins of about four shillings value each, an old clerical gown, and a pair of worn-out nankeen pantaloons. This story I had from an intimate friend of the prior. One of the days of my stay at Sierra, we passed upon the borders of a lake, which is between two and three leagues distant from the town, for the purpose of shooting. This lake was very nearly dry. The general feature of the country about Sierra is arid. The captaincy produces no sugar, but the lands are adapted for cotton, of which, however, the crop this year was very trifling. So excessive had the drought become that a famine was feared, and great distress would have been experienced if a vessel had not arrived from the southward, laden with the flour of the manjuk. The usual price of it was six hundred and forty hayes, 
per alquere but the cargo of this vessel was sold at six thousand four hundred hez per alquere a fact which proves the scarcity to have been very great formerly considerable quantities of beef were salted and dried here and were exported to the other captaincies but from the mortality among the cattle caused by the frequent dry seasons this trade has been unavoidably given up entirely and the whole country is now supplied from the rio grande do sul the southern boundary of the portuguese dominions but the meat which arrives at pernambuco from the rio grande do sul still preserves its name of sierra meat carne do sierra the country to the northward and eastward i understood to be much superior to that in the neighborhood of sierra the captaincy of piaui which lies in that direction is accounted fertile and is not subject to droughts many were the praises which i heard of the late governor of sierra juan carlos who was appointed to this province before he had arrived at the age of twenty years and who was at the time i visited sierra captain-general of mato grosso his administration of justice was in general summary but on one occasion he waived his usual severity he was informed whilst playing at cards at the house of senor marcos which is near to the palace that a soldier was robbing his garden he answered poor fellow great must be his hunger when he runs the risk of entering his governor's garden don't molest him some persons were in the practice of taking doors off their hinges and other tricks of the same sort during the night the governor had in vain attempted to discover who they were and he resolved at last to wrap himself up in his cloak and to apprehend some of them if possible with his own hands a young man with whom i was acquainted had met the governor on one of these nights he demanded his name and on discovering who it was admonished him to be at home at an earlier hour on the following evening the family of the fetosas still exists in the interior of this captaincy and that of piaui in possession of extensive estates which are covered with immense droves of cattle in the time of juan carlos the chiefs had risen to such power and were supposed to be so completely out of reach of punishment that they entirely refused obedience to the laws both civil and criminal such as they are they revenged their own wrongs persons obnoxious to them were publicly murdered in the villages of the interior the poor man who refused obedience to their commands was devoted to destruction and the rich man who was not of their clan was obliged silently to acquiesce in deeds of which he did not approve the fetosas are descendants of europeans but many of the branches are of mixed blood and perhaps few are free from some tinge of the original inhabitants of brazil the chief of the family was a colonel of militia and could at a short notice call together about one hundred men which is equal to ten or twenty times the number in a well-peopled country deserters were well received by him and murderers who had committed this crime in the revenge of injuries the thief was not accepted and much less the man who for the sake of pillage had taken the life of another juan carlos had received from lisbon secret instructions to secure the person of this chief of the fetosas his first step was to inform the colonel that he intended on a certain day to visit him at his village for the purpose of reviewing his regiment the village is not many leagues from the coast but is distant considerably from sierra fetosa answered that he should be ready to receive his excellency on the appointed day the time came and juan carlos set out accompanied by ten or twelve persons the colonel greeted him most courteously and had assembled all his men to make the greatest possible show after the review the colonel dismissed them fatigued with a day's exercise for many of them had travelled several leagues he retired with the governor to his house accompanied by a few of his near relations at the time all the party were preparing to settle for the night juan carlos having arranged everything with his own people rose and presented a pistol to the breast of the chief his followers doing the same to the colonel's relations and servants who were unable to make any resistance as they were unprepared and not so numerous as the governor's men juan carlos told fetosa that if he spoke or made the least noise he should immediately fire though he well knew that his own destruction would be certain he conducted him to the back door 
and ordered him and all the persons present to mount the horses which had been prepared for them. They made for the seashore, and arrived there very early in the morning. Jangadas were in waiting to take them on board a smack, which was lying off and on near the coast. The alarm was given soon after their departure from Fetosa's village, and as the governor reached the smack, he saw the colonel's adherents upon the beach embarking in Jingadas to try to overtake them, but it was too late. The smack left the land, and the next day made for the shore, landed the governor, and then proceeded on her voyage. Fetosa was supposed to be in the prison of Limoera at Lisbon when the French entered Portugal and either died about that time or was released by them. Footnote. Another member of this family was also to be apprehended, but the governor could not fix upon any means by which the arrest was to be accomplished. A man of well-known intrepidity and of some power was sent for by the governor to consult with him upon the subject. This person offered to go alone and acquaint the Fetosa with the orders that had been issued against him, and in fact to try to take him into custody. He set off, but Fetosa was apprised of his coming and of his errand, and immediately leaving his estate, proceeded to Bahia, where he embarked for Lisbon, arriving in due time at that place. The person who set off to arrest him followed him from place to place, arrived at Bahia, and embarked for and landed at Lisbon. He inquired for Fetosa, heard that he had spoken to the Secretary of State, and had again embarked on his return homewards, but that the ship was delayed by contrary winds. He likewise went to the secretary, and showed the orders which he had received for the arrest of Fetosa, making known the particular crimes which had made his apprehension requisite. Fetosa was taken into custody and put into the Limoera prison, where his persecutor or prosecutor went to visit him, saying as he approached, Well, did I not say so? Então, é o que disse, alluding to his determination of apprehending him. He returned to Brazil and gave an account of his mission to the governor, from whom he had received his orders. This man was well known in the province of Sierra, and the truth of the story is vouched for by many respectable persons with whom I conversed. This Fetosa has not been heard of. Ed footnote. His followers still looked forward to his return. The loss of their chiefs broke the power and union of the clan, and they have had disputes among themselves. Brazil is likewise undergoing a change of manners and emerging rapidly from semi-barbarism. A young man of Sierra had been, a short time before my arrival, to the distance of thirty leagues into the interior, accompanied by two constables, to serve a writ upon a man of some property for a debt. They rode good horses that they might perform their errand before he could have any knowledge that they were going, and might attempt, in consequence, anything against their lives. It is a dangerous service to go into the interior to recover debts. The Portuguese law does not allow of arrest for debt. But by serving a writ, any property which was sent down to the town to be shipped might be seized. I was received at Sierra most hospitably, the name of Englishman was a recommendation. In the morning I generally remained at home, and in the afternoon rode out with three or four of the young men of the place, who were much superior to any I had expected to find here. In the evening a large party usually assembled at the house of Señor Marcos. His company and that of his wife and daughter would have been very pleasant anywhere, but was particularly so in these uncivilized regions. Parties were likewise occasionally given at the palace, and at both these places, after tea and coffee, cards and conversation made the evenings pass very quickly. The palace was the only dwelling in town which had boarded floors. It appeared at first rather strange to be received by one of the principal officers of the province in a room with a brick floor and plain whitewashed walls, as occurred at the house of Senor Marcos. This gentleman had delivered to me a crimson-colored satin bag, containing government papers and directed to the Prince Regent of Portugal and Brazil, and he gave me directions to put it into the hands of the postmaster at Pernambuco. I obtained from being the bearer the power of requiring horses from the several commandants upon the road. To him it was convenient, as with me its chance of safety was greater than if it had been forwarded by a single man on foot. 
which is the usual mode of conveyance. The men employed for this purpose are trustworthy, but must of course sometimes meet with accidents. I had in my journey from Guayana to Sierra, seen Pernambuco and the adjoining provinces to the northward in almost their worst state, that of one whole season without rain. But extreme wretchedness is produced by two successive years of drought. In such a case, on the second year, the peasants die by the roadside. Entire families are swept away. Entire districts are depopulated. The country was in this dreadful state in 1791, 2, and 3, for these three years passed without any considerable fall of rain. In 1810, food was still to be purchased, though at exorbitant prices, and in the following year the rains came down in abundance and removed the dread of famine. I had, I say, seen the provinces through which I passed upon the brink of extreme want, owing to the failure of the rains. I had myself experienced inconvenience from this cause, and in one instance considerable distress from it. Now in returning the whole country was changed. The rains had commenced, and I was made to feel that great discomfort is caused by each extreme. But the sensations which the apprehension of a want of water produces are much more painful than the disagreeable effects of an immoderate quantity of it, heavy rains and flooded lands. I was obliged to stay at Sierra longer than I had at first intended, owing to an accident which I met with in bathing. This confined me to my bed for some days. As soon as I was allowed to move, I made preparations for my return. I purchased four horses, one to carry my trunk, and a small barrel of biscuit a second for farina a third for maize and the fourth for myself senor lorenzo sent for three trusty indians from one of the villages for the purpose of accompanying me and on the eighth of january eighteen eleven i commenced my return to pernambuco end of chapter seven part two chapter eight part one of Travels in Brazil, Volume 1, by Henry Coster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Return from Sierra to Natal, Sertanechos, Cattle, Vegetable Wax, from Natal to Recife. I left Sierra at daybreak with three Indians and three loaded horses, and one of the young men, with whom I had formed an acquaintance, accompanied me to a short distance from the town. I deviated on my return to Aracachi in some measure from the road by which I had traveled to Sierra. The first day passed without any circumstance worthy of being mentioned, and I was chiefly occupied in finding out what sort of beings my Indians were, for I had very little conversation with them before we set off. In the afternoon of the second day, having asked one of the Indians if the road was intricate to our next resting place, and being answered that there was no turning by which I could lose the right path, I left the loaded horses and rode on, being tired of following them at a foot's pace. This I had often done on other occasions. About five o'clock I put up at a cottage in which were two boys, whose appearance was very wretched but they seemed glad to say that they would let me have a night's lodging. On inquiry, they told me that their parents were gone to some distance to make paste from the stem of the carnauba, for that their usual food, the flour of the mangiac, was no longer to be had at any price in that neighborhood. I was shown some of this paste, which was of a dark brown color. Footnote. Ahutha says it is white. Vide Appendix. Therefore, some other ingredient may have been mixed with that which I saw. End footnote. And of the consistence of dough that has not been sufficiently kneaded. It was bitter and nauseous to the taste. On this substance, these miserable people were under the necessity of subsisting, adding to it occasionally dried fish or meat. My party arrived about an hour after me, and late in the evening, the younger boy began to beg, Inconsiderately I gave him money, but shortly he returned, saying his elder brother desired him to tell me that it would be of no use to them, as nothing could be purchased with it. Then I understood their meaning in begging at this moment, 
my men were going to supper the children were of course desired to sit down with them here feliciano one of the indians sewed two hides loosely round the two bags of farina saying that if we proceeded without disguising what they contained we should at some hamlet upon the road be obliged to satisfy the people who would probably beg part of it from us he had not known before he inquired from these children that this part of the country was in such a dreadful state of want the inhabitants had eaten up their own scanty crop and some of them had even been tempted by the exorbitant price to carry their stock to sierra for sale they had not heard of the supply which had arrived at that place from the southward we reached aracachi on the fifth day i remained two days at aracachi that the horses might be brought from the island upon which they had been put out to grass i experienced fully now what the guide had before told me respecting the horses they had all lost flesh and were apparently less fit for work than when i first arrived at aracachi though doubtless the relief from daily work for so long a period must have rendered them better able to renew it again now the spanish discoverers in south america who understood the business into which they had entered strongly inculcated to their people the necessity of the steady and regular continuance of their journeys unless a pause could have been made for some length of time footnote gaveca de vaca is particularly mentioned history of brazil volume one page one o nine and footnote i bought a large dog at aracachi which had been trained to keep watch over the baggage of travellers a man presented himself here requesting to be allowed to go with me to pernambuco he described himself as a portuguese sailor and european by birth and as having belonged to the portuguese sloop of war called the andorinha which was wrecked upon the coast between Pará and Maranhão. He had travelled from the spot at which he had landed, to this place, without any assistance from government. No provision had been made by any of the men in power for the assistance of the persons who escaped. I consented to his joining me. He behaved well, and I never afterwards had any cause to doubt the truth of his story. I had now a great increase in my number of men and horses, but was advised to take the men all forward with me as the rains might commence and the rivers fill in which case the more people i had to assist in crossing them with less danger would it be accomplished the additional number of horses enabled me to divide the weight into smaller loads and to have two or three beasts unencumbered for the purpose of relieving the others if necessary the party now consisted of nine persons and eleven horses Senor Pajosa's kindness was still continued toward me, and I hope I shall never cease to feel grateful for it. I was advised to get on to the seashore as soon as possible, on leaving Aracachi, this being the better road. Consequently, I slept the first night, distant three leagues from that place, at Algoa do Mato, a small lake which was now nearly dried up. The following morning we traveled over the sands, passed a small village near to the shore called Hitiro, and slept at Cajuais, a place we were acquainted with. And from hence to St. Lucia we followed the same route as in going to Sierra. From Cajuais we passed through Areas, famous for the ghost story, and rested at Tibo, proceeding in the afternoon with the intention of sleeping at the unfinished house on the road to Ilia but the night was closing in upon us when we were still two leagues short of it and for this reason it was thought advisable to stop and pass the night among the brushwood we had several showers of rain occasionally for some days past and although they were slight the grass had begun to spring up in some places the rapidity of vegetation in brazil is truly astonishing rain in the evening upon good soil will by sunrise have given a greenish tinge to the earth which is increased, if the rain continues, on the second day to sprouts of grass of an inch in length, and these on the third day are sufficiently long to be picked up by the half-starved cattle. The brushwood among which we had determined to pass the night was low and not close, so that only two shrubs were found to be near enough to each other and of sufficient strength to support a hammock. Between these mine was hung, whilst the people took up their quarters upon the packages as to them seemed best 
between one and two o'clock in the morning the rain commenced at first with some moderation the guide fastened two cords from shrub to shrub above my hammock and laid some hides upon them as a covering for me but soon the rain increased and the whole party crowded under the hides i got up and all of us stood together in some degree sheltered until the hides fell down owing to their being quite soaked our fires were of course completely extinguished i reminded my people of the necessity of keeping the locks of our firearms dry indeed those persons of the party who knew the certain must be even more aware than myself of the number of jaguars which are to be met with upon these travesillas i had not spoken many minutes before feliciano said he heard the growl of one of these animals he was right for a lot of mares galloped across the path not far from us and shortly after the growl was distinctly heard many of these beasts were near us during the remainder of the night as we heard the growl in several directions we stood with our backs to each other and by no means free from the chance of being attacked though the indians from time to time set up a sort of song or howl such as practiced by the sertanejos when guiding large droves of half-tamed cattle with the intent of frightening the jaguars towards daybreak the deluge somewhat abated but still the rain was hard and it did not cease in the morning there was much difficulty in finding the horses as the jaguars had frightened and scattered them indeed we much doubted whether they would all be alive but i suppose the wild cattle were preferred as being in better condition the loads were arranged and we proceeded to elia distant six leagues arriving there about two o'clock in the afternoon after having sustained twelve hours of continued rain the owner of the estate of elia sent a message to say that he wished me to remove from the outhouse in which i had settled myself for the remainder of the day and ensuing night to his residence i accepted his offer it was a low mud cottage covered with tiles which had been made from the clay found upon the skirts of the salt marsh near to which his house stood he gave us plenty of milk and dried meat there was a scarcity of farina but a plentiful year was expected immediately on my entrance into his house he offered me his hammock in which he had been sitting but mine was soon slung and we sat talked and smoked for a considerable time the mosquitoes were very troublesome indeed from this time we were scarcely ever without them at night and they annoyed us more or less according to the state of the wind and the quantity of rain which had fallen during the day the inconvenience occasioned by these insects is inconceivable until it has been experienced the next day we advanced to the village of st lucia and rested at noon there in an unfinished cottage soon after we had unloaded our horses and i had lain myself down in my hammock intending to sleep the guide told me that a number of people appeared to be assembling near to us and that i ought to recollect the quarrel which we had had here in going i got up and asked for my trunk opened it with as little apparent design as possible turned over several things in it and taking out the red bag placed it upon a large log of timber near to me and then i continued to search in the trunk as if for something i could not immediately find when i looked up again in a few minutes all the persons who had assembled were gone either the important consequences attending this bag were known that of having the power of making a requisition of horses or some other idea of my situation in life was given by the side of this magical bag the river near st lucia had not yet filled we proceeded in the afternoon and reached the banks of the river panema a narrow but now a rapid stream one of the men went in to try if it was fordable but before he was halfway across he found that it would be impossible to pass as the rapidity and depth would effectually prevent any attempt to carry the packages over upon the heads of the indians i desired the people to remain where they were whilst i turned back with a guiana guide to look for some habitation because owing to the commencement of the rains sleeping in the open air would have been highly imprudent we made for a house which was situated among the carnauba trees at some distance from the road and as the owner of it said that he could accommodate us and that there was abundance of grass for our horses the guide returned to bring the party to this place which was called st anna 
in the course of the night i had an attack of ague which would have delayed me at st anna even if the height of the waters had not prevented me from proceeding however i became more unwell and perhaps i imagined myself to be worse than i really was but i began to wish to arrive at assu as by so doing i should be advancing upon my journey and at the same time i should obtain the advantage of being near to some priest to whom i could impart any message which i might have to send to my friends although i was not in immediate danger i was aware of the sudden changes to which aguish disorders are liable as soon as the waters began to subside i determined to remove but as i could not mount on horseback would be necessary that i should be carried in a hammock however the difficulty consisted in procuring a sufficient number of men by waiting another day six persons were obtained from the cottages in the vicinity some of which were distant more than a league on the fifth day from that of my arrival here we set off crossed the river which was barely fordable and entered upon the flooded lands the waters covered the whole face of the country though they were now subsiding a little the depth was in part up to the waist but was in general less than knee deep the men knew the way from practice but even the guide whom i hired at Asu could not have found it without the assistance of those who carried me at noon the hammock with me in it was hung between two trees resting the two ends of the pole by which the men carried it upon two forked branches and hides were placed over this pole to shade me from the sun as the trees had not recovered from the drought and were yet with leaves the men slung their hammocks also the packages were supported upon the branches of trees and the horses stood in the water and eat their maize out of bags which were tied round their heads the water was shallow here as this spot was rather higher than the lands around and in one place the ground was beginning to make its appearance at dusk we reached shafatis a fazenda situated upon dry land and here we put up under an unfinished house the horse upon which my trunk and case of bottles had travelled had fallen down and to add to my discomfort my clothes were completely wetted and even the red bag did not entirely escape i passed a wretched night from the ague and from over fatigue the following morning i had some conversation with the owner of the place and purchased two of his horses at noon i sent off the camboyo under the care of feliciano who was desired to reach piatto the following night i remained with the goyana guide and julio who had been promoted to john's place of groom with considerable difficulty the packages were carried across the river which runs just below the estate the stream was rapid and the stony bed in which it runs increased the difficulty when i passed on the morning following the depth and rapidity of the current were considerably diminished for no rain had fallen during the night i had mounted the two persons who accompanied me upon the two horses which had been purchased the day before and i rode a led horse which was quite fresh resolving to arrive at piatto distant ten leagues in one day this i accomplished resting only a short time at noon i was very unfit for so much exertion but the necessity of the case did not allow me any alternative but i was determined to ride until absolute exhaustion forced me to give way we overtook my people and all of us rested at the same place feliciano shot an antelope upon which we dined it was seldom if ever absolutely necessary to depend upon our guns for subsistence though the provision thus obtained was by no means unacceptable as it varied our diet we could generally either purchase a considerable supply of dried meat or as occasionally occurred was afforded us gratuitously sheep were sometimes to be bought and at others fowls might be obtained on inquiring at the cottages but although numbers of the latter were to be seen about the huts and high price offered still the owners frequently refused to part with them the women naturally enough had the management of this department of household arrangement and after much bargaining the housewife would often at last declare that all of them were such favorites that she and her children could not resolve to have any of them killed this behavior became so frequent 
that at last when either the guide or myself rode up to a cottage to purchase a fowl it was quite decisive with us if the husband called to his wife saying that she would settle the matter unless we had time to spare for talking we generally went our way my friend the commandant was still residing at piatto i felt as if i was returning home my spirits were low and any trifle relieved them this night i was still very unwell my thirst was great and nothing satisfied and elated it so much as watermelons of which there was here a superabundance i ate several of them the guide said i should kill myself but i thought otherwise for i liked the fruit in the morning i woke up quite a changed person and the ague returned no more the guide often said afterwards that he never had known until the present occasion that watermelons might be taken as a cure for the ague he was quite certain that they had performed the cure and that they would have the same effect upon all persons in the same disease such are the changes to which this strange complaint is subject often thus suddenly leaving the patient but as frequently or more so ending in fever and delirium however it seldom proves fatal on the morrow we left piatto with the addition to our party of a small tame sheep and a tame tatubola or armadillo both having been given to me by the commandant the former kept pace with the horses for many days and it never gave us any trouble until the long continuance of the journey wearied it out and then i was obliged to make room for it one of the panniers in this manner it travelled for a day or two at a time the armadillo was conveyed in a small bag and only on one occasion gave us any trouble when we released it at our resting places it usually remained among the packages either feeding or rolled up it was with some difficulty that mimosa was prevented from annoying it but latterly she and the armadillo were very good friends at Asu, i changed one of my horses for another that was in better condition and gave about the value of a guinea to boot our friends the saddler and the owner of the house which we had inhabited going received us very cordially and offered to assist us in crossing the river which was full but they advised me to wait for a decrease of the depth and rapidity of the stream however i was anxious to advance my people made no objection here i discharged the young man whom i had taken from hence as a guide to aracachi we crossed the smaller branch of the river with the water reaching to the flaps of the saddles when we arrived at the second and principal branch it was discovered that at jengada would be necessary to convey the baggage across several of the inhabitants of the place had followed us judging that this would be the case and they were willing to be of service to us in expectation of being compensated for their trouble a few logs of timber were soon procured some of them had been brought down by the stream and were now upon the banks and others were conveyed from the town the cords with which the packages were fastened to the pack saddles were made use of to tie the logs together for the purpose of forming the raft the father of the young man who had been with me to aracachi accompanied us to the riverside to assist and had brought mimosa with him i requested him to secure her otherwise i thought she would follow me he did so and sent her back to the town by a boy when the raft was prepared the saddles and all the packages were placed upon it and i sat down among them four men laid hold of each side of the raft and shoved off from the shore and when they lost their footing each man kept hold of the raft with one hand swimming with the other but notwithstanding their exertions the stream carried us down about fifty yards before we reached the other side which however was gained in safety the indians were already there with their horses the river of asu is from two to three hundred yards in breadth it was now deep and dangerous and from the violence of the current a guide is requisite that advantage may be taken of the shallowest parts the sertanejos have a curious contrivance for crossing rivers which is formed of three pieces of wood and upon this they paddle themselves to the opposite side i heard it often spoken of by the name of cavalecci but as i did not see any of them i cannot pretend to give an exact description footnote there is a print in bartleus which represents the portuguese crossing the river st francisco upon rafts or logs of timber 
These must, I think, have been similar to those which are at present used in the Sertan. End footnote. The men soon left us to arrange the loads, which we were doing with all possible expedition, when on turning around I saw Mimosa running up to me, half crouched and half afraid. I'd often wished to purchase this animal, but nothing would induce her master to part with her. He said that he had had her from a whelp, and added that if he put the pot upon the fire and then went out with her, he was sure to return by the time it boiled, bringing something with which to fill it. He did not mean that this was literally the case, but thus quaintly he wished to impress the idea of her great expertness in hunting. She followed us, as she found that she was well received. We advanced and halted at St. Ursula, a fazenda distant from Asu one league and a half, and here we slept. The roads lay through woods, which were thick and close. From hence to the Sierra Merim, the country was new to me as I deviated from the road by which I had arrived at Asu on my way northwards. I now took the shortest road to Natal, but had frequently to cross this winding river. Whilst I was at dinner, Mimosa was near to me, watching for her share, when suddenly she crept under the bench upon which I sat. I soon saw what had caused this movement, for the old man, the father of her owner, was coming towards us. He said that he came for his son's dog. I persuaded him to sell her, and when he was going his way, Mimosa ran out from under the bench and fawned upon him. I told him to go on and invite her to follow him, but upon this she immediately returned growling to her old station under the bench. She had been better treated and better fed with me than when she was with her master. I always fed her myself and had several times prevented him from beating her. The next day we passed through the fazendas of Pasaja and Baja. The road was over loose stony ground, and we crossed one dry marsh. In the afternoon we traveled from St. Bento to Angicos, which obliged us to pass over some higher ground, which was very stony and painful to our horses. We crossed a small shallow stream several times, our next day's march carried us across more stony ground. The persons to whom we spoke said that there had been no rain. Indeed, this was evident. There was no grass, and the country was yet parched and dreary. The horses had no water at noon, for the well was small, and the spring which supplied it was insufficient for so great a number of beasts. I was thirsty in the afternoon, and therefore left the Camboyo to follow at its usual pace and rode on accompanied by Julio. The two dogs likewise would come with us. We entered upon a plan, and now for the second time I saw an Emma, a species of ostrich. Notwithstanding my attempts to prevent them, the dog set off after it, and much against my inclination, I was obliged to wait until their return. The bird ran from them with great velocity, flapping its wings, but never leaving the ground. The Emmas outstripped the fleetest horses, the color of the one which we saw was a dark gray. Its height, including the neck, which was very long, was about that of a man on horseback, and it had that appearance at first sight when at some distance. The Sertanesia say that, when pursued, the Emma spurs itself to run the faster, that the spurs, or pointed bones, are placed in the inside of the wings, and that as these are flapped, the bones strike the sides and wound them. I have heard many people say that when an Emma is caught after a hard chase, the sides are found to be bloody. It is possible that this effect may be produced by some cause similar to that which a pig cuts its own throat in swimming. The eggs of the Emma are large, and all the food which they afford is coarse. It is not unpalatable. The feathers are much esteemed. When the dogs returned, we continued our journey. The road led us between high rocks, and after proceeding along it for some time, the dog suddenly struck from the path and went up the side of a flat rock, which sloped down towards the road, but was sufficiently low to allow of a horse ascending it. Our horses stopped and snuffed up the air. Julio cried out at the same time, Water! Water! and spurred his horse to follow the dogs, and I did the same. Julio was quite correct in what he had supposed, from the direction which the dogs immediately took, and from the stopping of the horse. 
there was a long and narrow but deep cleft in the rock which was nearly full of water clear and cold the sides of the cleft slanted inwards and the water was below the surface so that the dogs were running round and howling without being able to reach it the horses too as soon as we dismounted and they saw the water began to paw and attempt to press forwards to drink we brought no vessel with which to take up any water and were under the necessity of using our hats to satisfy the horses and dogs the rest of the party came up after some time feliciano was acquainted with the spot but if the dogs and horses had not pointed out to julio he and i should have missed it we were delayed considerably in giving water enough to all the horses as we had no large vessel in which to take it up i heard from feliciano and subsequently from other persons that these clefts in the rock are common and that they are known to few and those principally of his rank and occupation in life and that this knowledge enabled them to find plenty of water when others were in great distress he said we never refuse to give information but we say as little about it as possible i travelled until ten o'clock at night wishing to reach some fazenda not to remain in the open air as there were several heavy clouds flying about from the look of which we well knew that if the wind abated rain would come on we reached a fazenda and applied for a night's lodging which was granted but upon a survey of the interior of the house i preferred the open air with all its disadvantages the place was full of persons who had assembled from the neighboring estates in expectation of rain as they had come to assist in collecting cattle the fellows were eating dried meat and had by some means obtained a quantity of rum i took up my station at a distance from the house and we scarcely laid down during the night from fear of the rain and in some measure that we might be prepared to prevent any of our horses being stolen as a piece of sport by the people in the house the next day we crossed over a plain which was partly without trees and in part covered with brushwood in going over this last portion i pushed on with julio leaving the camboyo to follow us we had nearly lost our way at the division of several paths even julio's knowledge was insufficient and had we not met some travellers and inquired of them i know not how far from the baggage we might have been at night on the following morning we advanced again took water and skins near to some cottages and at noon stationed ourselves in the bed of a rivulet where there was good grass but no water as the bed was lower than the neighbouring land the very first shower had made the grass spring up though there had not been rain sufficient to excite vegetation upon its banks here the armadillo strayed into some brushwood feliciano followed it by the marks of its footsteps over the grass and dried leaves and brought it back i am quite confident that he did not see which way it went and to a person unused to tracing footsteps there appeared to be none if it had passed over sand there would not have been anything extraordinary in discovering the way which the animal had taken but upon the grass and dry leaves so small an animal could make but a most trifling impression i mention at this place accidentally that the skins had spoiled the water for it tasted of the grease with which they had been rubbed feliciano heard me and took up a small skin that lay empty which was old and therefore not greasy and said i'll try to find some for you that is better and away he went in about an hour he returned with a skin full of excellent water he had recollected a cleft in a rock at some distance and had gone to see if any yet remained in it we slept at a fazenda and the next day proceeded in the expectation of reaching the sierra merim which we did this tract of country had not recovered from the drought but the trees were beginning to be clothed and the grass under them was in most parts of sufficient length to afford subsistence to our horses water was still scarce and bad but the rain had made it less brackish and more plentiful we passed over the travesia with all possible haste as the floods were expected shortly and sometimes the water comes down as i have before stated with great rapidity there is some danger in being caught by the water upon any of the peninsulas or islands which are formed by its bends for to be under necessity of crossing over a stream which runs with much violence 
perhaps ten times or more successively, would be too much for almost any horse to bear, and particularly for those which were already fatigued by a long journey. We left the Sierra Merim in four days, passed Pai Paolo, and early on the fifth day arrived again at the dry lake. The people of this place were upon the point of decamping, as the rains were expected, or rather had already commenced. We now met several parties of travelers who had taken advantage of the first rains to pass over this tract of country, and who were hastening before the floods came down the river. January is not properly speaking the rainy season. The rains at the commencement of the year are called the primeras aguas, or the first waters, and continue for about a fortnight or three weeks, after which the weather generally becomes again settled until May or June and from this time until the end of August, the rains are usually pretty constant. From August or September until the opening of the year, there is not usually any rain. The dry weather can be depended upon with more certainty from September until January than from February until May. Likewise, the wet weather can be looked for with more certainty from June until August than in January. There are very few days during the whole course of the year of incessant rain. What I have said regarding the seasons must, however, be taken with some latitude, as in all climates they are subject to variation. The horse I left at the dry lake was faithfully delivered to me, and I continued my journey on the following day to Natal. The governor received me with the same cordiality as before. I had now left the Sertan, and though it treated me rather roughly, still I have always wished I could have seen more of it. There is a certain pleasure which I cannot describe in crossing new countries, and that portion of territory over which I had traveled was new to an Englishman. From the sensations which I experienced, I can well imagine what those are which travelers in unexplored countries must feel at every step, at every novelty which comes under their view. There is yet much ground upon the continent of South America to be traversed, and I most heartily wish that it had been my fate to be the civilized individual first doomed to cross from Pernambuco to Lima. I have perhaps hardly said sufficient to give a correct idea of the inhabitants of the fazendas or cattle estates. Unlike the peons of the country in the vicinity of the river Plata, the Sertanejo has about him his wife and family, and lives in comparative comfort. The cottages are small and are built of mud, but afford quite sufficient shelter in so fine a climate. They are covered with tiles where these are to be had, or, as in more general, with the leaves of the carnauba. Hammocks usually supply the place of beds, and are by far more comfortable, and these are more likewise used as chairs. Most of the better sort of cottages contain a table, but the usual practice is for the family to squat down upon a mat in a circle, with the bowls, dishes, and gourds in the center, thus to eat their meals upon the floor. Knives and forks are not much known, and are not at all made use of by the lower orders. It is the custom in every house, from the highest to the lowest, as in former times, and indeed the same practice prevails in all the parts of the country which I visited, for a silver basin, or one of earthenware, or a quilla, and a fringed cambric towel, or one that is made of the coarse cotton cloth of the country, to be handed round, that all those who are going to sit down to eat may wash their hands, and the same ceremony, or rather necessary piece of cleanliness, takes place again after the meal is finished. Of the gourds, great use is made in domestic arrangements. They are cut in two, and the pulp is scooped out. Then the rind is dried, and these rude vessels serve almost every purpose of earthenware. Water is carried in them, etc., and they are likewise used as measures. They vary from six inches in circumference to about three feet, and are usually rather of an oval shape. The gourd when whole is called gabasa, and the half of the rind is called quia. It is a creeping plant, and grows spontaneously in many parts, but in others the people plant it among the mangia. The conversation of the Sertanejos usually turns upon the state of their cattle, or of women, and occasionally accounts of adventures which took place at Hesifi or some other town. The merits or demerits of the priest with whom they may happen to be acquainted are likewise discussed, 
and their irregular practices are made a subject of ridicule the dress of the men already has been described but when they are at home a shirt and drawers alone remain the women have a more slovenly look as their only dress is a shift in a petticoat no stockings and oftentimes no shoes but when they leave home which is very seldom an addition is made of a large piece of coarse white cloth either of their own or of european manufacture and this is thrown over the head and shoulders a pair of shoes is likewise then put on they are good horsewomen and the high portuguese saddle serves the purpose of a side saddle very completely i never saw any brazilian woman riding as is the case occasionally in portugal in the manner that men do their employment consists in household arrangements entirely for the men even milk the cows and goats the women spin and work with a needle no females of free birth are ever seen employed in any kind of labor in the open air excepting in that of occasionally fetching wood or water if the men are not at home the children generally run about naked until a certain age but this is often seen even in a sifi to the age of six or seven boys are allowed to run about without any clothing formerly i mean before the commencement of a direct trade with england both sexes dressed in a coarse cotton cloth which is made in the country the petticoats of this cloth were sometimes tinged with a red dye which was obtained from the bark of the koipuna tree a native of their woods and even now this dye is used for tinging fishing nets as it is said that those which have undergone this process last the longer in those times a dress of the common printed cotton of english or of portuguese manufacture cost from eight to twelve mil hayes from two to three guineas owing to the monopoly of the trade by which the merchants of hesifi put what price they please upon their commodities other things were in proportion owing to the enormous prices european articles of dress could of course only be possessed by the rich people however since the opening of the ports to foreign trade english goods are finding their way all over the country and the hawkers are now a numerous body of men the women seldom appear and when they are seen do not take any part in the conversation unless it be some one good wife who rules the roost if they are present at all when the men are talking they stand or squat down upon the ground in the doorway leading to the interior of the house and merely listen the morals of the men are by no means strict and when this is the case it must give an unfavorable bias in some degree to those of the women but the certanatio is very jealous and more murders are committed and more quarrels entered into on this score by tenfold than on any other these people are revengeful an offense is seldom pardoned and in default of law of which there is scarcely any each man takes it into his own hands this is without any sort of doubt a dreadful state of society and i do not by any means pretend to speak in its justification but if the causes of most of the murders committed and beatings given are inquired into i have usually found that the sufferer had only obtained what he deserved robbery in the sertão is scarcely known the land is in favorable years too plentiful to afford temptation and in seasons of distress for food every man is for the most part equally in want subsistence is to be obtained in an easier manner than by stealing in so abundant a country and where both parties are equally brave and resolute but besides these reasons i think the sertanesios are a good race of people they are tractable and might easily be instructed excepting in religious matters and these they are fast riveted and such was their idea of an englishman and a heretic that it was on some occasions difficult to make them believe that i who had the figure of a human being was not of some nondescript race they are extremely ignorant few of them possess even the commonest rudiments of knowledge their religion is confined to the observance of certain forms and ceremonies and to the frequent repetition of a few prayers faith and charms relics and other things of the same order the certanesios are courageous generous sincere and hospitable if a favor is begged they know not how to deny it but if you trade with them either for cattle or aught else 
the character changes, and then they wish to outwit you, conceiving success to be a piece of cleverness of which they may boast. The following anecdote is characteristic. A Certanesio came down from the interior with a large drove of cattle, which had been entrusted to him to sell. He obtained a purchaser who was to pay him at the close of two or three months. The Certanesio waited to receive the money, as his home was far too distant to return for this purpose. Before the expiration of the term, the purchaser of the cattle found some means of having him imprisoned. He went to him when he was in confinement, and, pretending to be extremely sorry for his misfortune, hinted that if he would allow him to appropriate part of the debt to the purpose, he would try to obtain his release. To this the Certanesio agreed, and consequently soon obtained his freedom. He heard soon afterwards how the whole of the business had been managed by the purchaser of the cattle, to avoid paying for what he had bought, and he could not obtain any part of the money. Having advised his employers and the certain of these circumstances, he received for answer that the loss of the money was of little consequence, but that he must either assassinate the man who had injured him, or not return home, because he should himself suffer if the insult remained unrevenged. The Certanesio immediately made preparations for returning. He had always feigned great thankfulness towards his debtor for obtaining his release, and a total ignorance of his unjustifiable conduct. On the day of his departure he rode to the house of the man whom he had determined to destroy, and dismounted, whilst one of his two companions held his horse. He saw the owner of the house, and as he gave him the usual parting embrace, ran his long knife into his side. He then quickly leapt onto his horse, and the three persons rode off. None dared to molest them, for they were well armed, and although this occurred in a large town, they soon joined a considerable number of their countrymen who waited for them in the outskirts, and proceeded to their own country, without any attempt being made to apprehend them. These circumstances took place several years ago, but the relatives of the man who was killed still bear in mind his death, and a determination of revenging it upon him who committed it, if he was again to place himself within their reach. Many persons can vouch for the truth of this story. End of chapter 8, part 1section 11 of travels in brazil volume 1 by henry coster the sleeper box recording is in the public domain chapter 8 part 2 the color of the certenechos varies from white of which there are necessarily few to a dark brown the shades of which are almost as various as there are persons two of exactly the same tint are scarcely to be met with children of the same parents rarely if ever are of the same shade some difference is almost always perceivable and this is in many instances so glaring as to lead at first to doubts of the authenticity but it is too general to be aught but what is right the offspring of white and black persons leans in most instances more to one color than to the other when perhaps a second child will take a contrary tinge Footnote. A mulatto woman once said to me, The children of mulattoes are like whelps, they are of all colors. Filho de mulatto e como filho de cachorro, um sai branco, outro pardo, e outro negro. And footnote. These remarks do not only hold good in the Sertão, but are applicable to all the country which I had opportunity of seeing. The Sertanejo, if color is set aside, is certainly handsome, and the women, whilst young, have well-shaped forms, and many of them good features. Indeed, I have seen some of the white persons who would be admired in any country. Their constant exposure to the sun, and its great power at a distance from the sea, darkens the complexion more than if the same person had resided upon the coast, but this gives them a decided dark color, which has the appearance of durability, and is much preferable to a sallow, sickly look, though of a lighter tint. The persons who reside upon and have the care of the cattle estates are called vaqueros, which simply means cowherds. They have a share of the calves and foals that are reared upon the land. 
but of the lambs, pigs, goats, etc., no account is given to the owner. And from the quantity of cattle, numbers are reckoned very loosely. It is therefore a comfortable and lucrative place, but the duties attending it are heavy, require considerable courage and great bodily strength and activity. Some of the owners live upon their estates, but the major part of the estates through which I passed were possessed by men of large property who resided in the towns upon the coast, or who were at the same time sugar planters. The interior of Pernambuco, Rio Grande, Paraíba, and Sierra contains, properly speaking, no wild cattle. Footnote. Dr. Manuel Ajuda da Camara says that before the dreadful drought of 1793, it was considered to be one of the duties of the herdsmen to destroy the wild cattle, that that which was already half tame might not be induced to mix with it. And he adds that this is still the case in the Sertoins of Piauí. He published his pamphlets in 1810. End footnote. Twice every year the herdsmen from several estates assemble for the purpose of collecting the cattle. The cows are driven from all quarters into the area in front of the house, and here, surrounded by several horsemen, are put into spacious pens. This being done, the men dismount, and now their object is, if any of the cows are inclined to be unruly, which is often the case, to noose them by the horn so as to secure them, or another mode is adopted, which is by noosing one of the hind legs and carrying the cord quite round the animal so as to throw it down. The calves are then caught, and this is done without much difficulty. They are marked on the right haunch with a red-hot iron, which is made of the shape that has been fixed upon the owner as his peculiar mark. When the oxen are to be collected for a market, the service is more dangerous, and frequently the rider is under the necessity of throwing the animal to the ground with his long pole, as I have in another place mentioned. On the man's approach, the ox runs off into the nearest wood, and the man follows as closely as he possibly can, that he may take advantage of the opening of the branches which is made by the beast, as they shortly close again, resuming their former situation. At times the ox passes under a low and thick branch of a large tree, then the man likewise passes under the branch, and that he may do this he leans to the right side so completely as to enable him to lay hold of the girth of his saddle with his left hand, and at the same time his left heel catches the flap of the saddle. Thus, with the pole in his right hand, almost trailing upon the ground, he follows without slackening his pace, and being clear of this obstacle, again resumes his seat. If he can overtake the ox, he runs his goad to its side, and if this is dexterously done, he throws it. Then he dismounts and ties the animal's legs together, or places one foreleg over one of the horns, which secures it most effectually. Many blows are received by these men, but it is seldom that deaths are occasioned. In crossing the Sierra Merim, I mention an instance of a cow having strayed to an immense distance from its native pasture. This propensity to ramble is common among horned cattle, even without its proceeding from the scarcity of grass or water. Often at the time of collecting the cattle, those persons who have been to a considerable distance to assist others drive back a number of beasts with their own mark, the estate to which they belong being distant twenty leagues or more. When a traveler is in distress for water, he cannot do better than to follow the first cattle path, as these usually lead to the nearest pool of water, in a direct line. The paths are easily distinguished, being very narrow, and the wood uniting above, leaving open below only a shady walk of the height of the animals which mate it. Each lot of mares with its master horse is driven into the pens. This consists of from fifteen to twenty in number. The foals are marked in the same manner as the calves. It is worthy of remark, and the circumstance was often repeated to me, that the horse of the lot drives from it not only the colts but the fillies also, as soon as they are full grown. The fact was only qualified in two or three instances, when told to me by the person who related it, adding that if the horse did not do so, he was taken from the lot and broken for the pack saddle, being considered of a bad breed. When a horse is to be tamed for any purpose whatsoever, he is noosed after being put into a pen, 
and is tied to a stake. On the following day, or perhaps the same afternoon, if he appears at all tractable, a small low saddle is placed upon him, and a man then mounts with a double halter. The animal runs off with him, which the man, far from attempting to prevent, rather urges him to do, though in general the whip and spur are not made use of unless he is obstinate and refuses to go forwards. Horses of good breeds are said to be those most easily tamed. The horse runs until he becomes weary, and is then brought back quietly by his rider, and perhaps they do not reach the rider's home until the following day. The man must not dismount until he has returned to the spot from whence he started, as he would probably experience great difficulty when he wished again to proceed from the restiveness of the horse. The same operation is continued as long as the animal is not supposed to be effectually broken in and safe to mount. It happens on some occasions that by plunging the horse gets rid of both man and saddle and is not again seen for a length of time. However, unless the girths give way, he has little chance of throwing his rider, for the Sertanejos are most excellent horsemen. The horses are small, and some of them are finely shaped, though little attention is paid to the improvement of the breed. Great stress is laid upon the color in the choice of these animals, some colors being accounted more demonstrative of strength than others. Thus a cream-colored horse with a tail and mane of the same color is rejected for the pack saddle or for any kind of severe labor, and if horses of this description are sold for these purposes, the price is lower than that of an animal of an equally promising appearance in form and size of any other tinge. They are much esteemed, if well shaped, as saddle horses for short distances. A cream-colored horse with a black tail and mane is reckoned strong. The horses that have one foreleg white and the other of the color of the body are supposed to be liable to stumble. The usual colors are bay and gray, and chestnut, black, and cream color are less common. Those most esteemed for work are dark bays with black tails and manes, and grays dotted with small bay spots. Stallions are broken in both for the saddle and for carrying loads in the neighborhood of the towns but the Sertanejos, both from necessity and from their knowledge of their superior ability to perform hard labor, make use of geldings. It is not always safe to ride a high-spirited horse in the Sertan, because when he begins to neigh, instances have occurred of some master horse coming to give him battle, and as both are equally desirous of fighting, the rider may perhaps find himself under the necessity of placing himself at a distance from the combatants. However, if he should chance to have a good stick in his hand, and can prevent his own horse from rearing as the wild horse approaches, he may come off in safety. Sheep are kept under every estate for their flesh, when that of a more esteemed kind fails, that is, either when the oxen are in a meager state, owing to a long continuance of dry weather, or that the herdsman is too much occupied at home, or too lazy to go out and kill one. The mutton is never well tasted and though it is true that in the Sertan no care whatever is given in rearing or feeding the sheep, still I do not think this kind of meat is to be brought to any great perfection. Footnote. When I resided at Jaguaribe and upon the island of Itamarines in the years 1813 and 1814, I took some pains in the matter, but the meat was not good, and though all kinds of flesh in Brazil have less flavor than those of the same species of animal in England, Still, I think that the mutton of Brazil is more unequal to the mutton of England than is the case respecting the beef of the two countries. End footnote. The lambs are covered with fine wool, and this continues until they are one year and one half or two years old. After this age, it begins to drop and is replaced by a species of hair. Although the wool should remain longer in some instances, it appears to me that it was coarse and short. Footnote. Lieutenant Colonel João da Silva Feijo, in a pamphlet published at Rio de Janeiro in 1811, on the sheep of the province of Sierra, says that the sheep of that part of the country bear wool which has all the marks of being of a superior quality, that it is in general soft, shining, well curled, of a good length and strong. He again says that the governor, the same of whom I have spoken, 
sent a small quantity of it to england which was much admired and esteemed i did not certainly remark particularly the sheep of sierra and his opinion must of course be taken in preference to mine as this gentleman is the naturalist of the same province however i bought several as food and their skins were invariably covered in the manner which i have described when i resided at jaguaribe and itamarasa i possessed a considerable number of sheep and of these i can speak positively and footnote a wound upon the body of this animal is more difficult to heal than upon that of any other and the flesh of it is of all others the most rapid in its advances to putrefaction the division of property in the certain is very indeterminate and this may be imagined when i say that the common mode of defining the size of a fazenda is by computing it at so many leagues or as in some cases by so many hundreds of calves yearly without any reference to the quantity of land few persons take the trouble of making themselves acquainted with the exact extent of their own property and perhaps could not discover it if they made the attempt the climate is good indeed the inland flat country is much more healthy than that immediately bordering the coast i can hardly name any disorders that appear to be peculiar to it but several are known agues are not common but they exist dropsy also they are acquainted with ulcers in the legs are common but less so than upon the coast ruptures frequently occur the smallpox footnote vaccination is finding its way among them in spite of prejudice eighteen fifteen and footnote makes dreadful ravages and the measles are much dreaded when the venereal disease has once settled the sufferer seldom gets rid of it entirely application of herbs are used but as these people are unacquainted with or unable to follow its proper mode of treatment some of the patients are crippled and the major part of them never again enjoy good health the yaws also are to be met with but i had afterwards more opportunities of seeing this complaint and will therefore not now give any account of it instances of a consumption occur the whooping cough did not appear to be known in any part of the country which i visited i made many inquiries respecting it and could not obtain any information upon the subject i slept many times in the open air and never felt any bad effects from so doing the dew is trifling and a high wind is usual in the night the sun is powerful and is of course particularly felt in travelling over sandy loose soil but it did not seem to do any mischief i never suffered from headache and excepting the attack of the ague which is accounted for from the heavy rain which we experienced i never enjoyed better health the food of the inhabitants of the sartan consists chiefly of meat of which they make three meals and to this is added the flour of the mangia stirred up into a paste or rice sometimes supplies its place the bean which is commonly called in england the french bean is a favourite food it is suffered to run to seed and is only plucked up when quite dry and hard i have often been surprised to see how little service maize is to them as food but yet it is occasionally used in default of these the paste of the carnauba is made and i have seen meat eaten with curds of green vegetables they know nothing and they laugh at the idea of eating any kind of salad the wild fruits are numerous and to be obtained in any quantities but few species are cultivated among the latter are the watermelon and the plantain the cheese of the sertan which when it is fresh is excellent but after four or five weeks it becomes hard and tough some few persons make butter by shaking the milk in a common black bottle but this must of course be experimental and not general in the towns even of the sertan rancid irish butter is the only kind which is to be obtained wherever the lands admit of it these people plant mangia rice etc but much i may say the greater part of the vegetable portion of their food is brought either from more fertile districts near to the coast or from the settlements still further back the valleys and skirts of the carais serra do teixeira and other inland mountains the trade of the sertão consists in receiving small quantities of european manufactured goods footnote this branch of the trade increases most rapidly 
1815. End footnote. The cotton cloth of the country, of which they make some among themselves, a small portion of European white earthenware, and considerable quantities of the dark brown ware of the country, which is made for the most part by the Indians who live in the districts that contain the proper kind of clay, rum in small casks, butter, tobacco, snuff, sugar, and treacle made up in cakes, spurs, bits for bridles, and other gear for their horses, excepting the saddles, of which the greater part are made in their own districts. Gold and silver ornaments also find a market, to a certain amount. The peddlers travel about from village to village, and from one estate to another, bartering their commodities for cattle of all kinds, cheese and hides of horned cattle. A colt of from two to three years sells for about one guinea, a horse broken in for the pack saddle for two or three guineas, a horse broken in for mounting from five to six guineas, a bullock of two years ten shillings, a full-grown ox one guinea and a half, a cow varies much according to the quantity of milk, from one guinea to five guineas, a sheep from two to three shillings, a goat for slaughter is worth even less, but a good milch goat is valued at one guinea, and sometimes higher. Children are frequently suckled by goats, which increases the value of these animals. The goat that has been so employed always obtains the name of comadre, the term which is made use of between the mother and godmother of a child. And so general is this that she-goats are frequently called comadres without having had the honor of suckling a young master or mistress. Dogs are sometimes valued at from one to two guineas, and even higher if they are good sporting or good house and baggage dogs. A fowl is as dear as a sheep or goat, and in one instance, as has been related, I paid four times the money for one of these birds that I had given for a kid. The hawkers seldom obtain money in exchange for their wares. They take whatever is offered, and hire people to assist in conveying the cattle or produce to a market, where they are exchanged for goods, and then the owner again returns. A twelvemonth is sometimes passed in turning over the property once, but the profits are usually enormous, two or three hundred per cent. During my stay at Natal, the governor showed me a species of wax which is produced from the leaves of the Carnauba, a tree I have frequently mentioned. A quantity of this wax was sent by him to Rio de Janeiro. It is mentioned in one of Dr. Ahuda's publications, and a sample of it found its way to England and has been taken notice of by the Royal Society. The governor, in one of his journeys through the province, passed the night, as often happened, in a peasant's cottage. A wax candle was lighted and placed before him, which was rudely made, but afford a good light. He was somewhat surprised at this, because oil is generally used. On making inquiry, he found that the wax dropped from the leaves which covered the cottage during the heat of the day. I suppose the cottage had been newly built, or that a fresh covering of leaves had been put on to it. He afterwards made the experiment himself, tried some of the candles, and became confident of the importance of the vegetable wax. The governor also gave me a piece of iron ore, which was the produce of the captaincy of Rio Grande. He told me that he entertained little doubt of the existence of considerable quantities of this metal in this part of the country, and that the government would be well recompensed for their trouble, if proper persons were appointed for the purpose of making discoveries on this subject. I saw some cloth which he had ordered to be woven from the thread of the caruata. Its texture was not unlike that of the coarse linen which is used for sheeting. It is very strong. I have some of the thread in my possession. As soon as I had arranged that I should leave Natal in the morning of the 6th of February, the governor told me that he intended setting off on business relating to his province at the same time. We took leave of each other at night, and in the morning when I arose I found myself in possession of the house, as he had set out at four o'clock. We did not get away until about seven, owing to the number of horses, loads, and other matters which it was necessary to arrange. I felt quite at home at Natal, although I was yet distant from Hesifi seventy leagues but the country is well watered, well wooded, and comparatively well peopled. I passed again through St. Jose, the Indian village, but did not turn off from the road toward Papari. I slept at a hamlet, 
and in the morning proceeded to Cunyau. About ten o'clock we were under the necessity of turning loose and leaving behind one of the planes, a horse which I had purchased at Chafaris. who was completely fagged and could not proceed farther. The colonel of Cunyau was not at home, but his steward wished me to make use of his master's house. However, I merely mentioned having left a horse at some distance upon the lands of the plantation, and the guide drew for his government the mark which it had upon the haunch. I have often observed the quickness of these people in recognizing a mark which they have once seen and the accuracy with which they will draw it, after having taken seemingly a casual glance, and perhaps after a period of some weeks has elapsed since they had even this. Footnote. In the year 1813, I was one evening in company when I heard a gentleman request one of the party to ask the Englishmen who were present if any of them had ever left a horse upon his plantation. I turned round and recognized the colonel of Cunyau. The horse was sent to me about a month afterwards. End footnote. We then rode on half a league to the hamlet. The commandant of this place introduced himself to me and was extremely civil. He put my horse into a stable and wished me to stay until the following morning, but I preferred advancing and slept the same night at another hamlet two leagues beyond. This day we passed several rivulets which were all much swollen, but none of them were sufficiently full to prevent the continuance of our journey. There had already been some rain, and the face of the country bore a more pleasing appearance. Two letter carriers passed through the place in the evening, and I wrote by them to a friend at Pernambuco that the cottage at the Cruz das Almas might be ready for me on my arrival. The next day we passed some sugar plantations and over some hills. The country was most beautiful. Everything looked green and healthy. I crossed a considerable rivulet at the foot of a hill, and ascending on the opposite side, put up at a single cottage which was inhabited by white people, an old man, a widower, with a fine family of handsome sons and daughters. Their cottage had not room for all of us, and therefore we intended to sleep in the open air altogether, but the old man insisted upon my going to sleep in the house, and I was not sorry for this, being rather afraid of a return of the ague. Nearly at sunset, or at the close of the day, which in that country are almost about the same time, the tame sheep was missing. Great search was made for it, but to no purpose. The old man ordered two or three of his sons to set out, and not to return until every inquiry had been made in the neighborhood. I did all in my power to prevent giving this trouble, but he persisted, saying, No, you are under my roof, and this unfortunate circumstance may lead you to have an unfavorable opinion of me. Long after dark, the young men returned with the sheep and a mulatto man in custody. I wished the man to be released, but they said that this could not be, for he was a runaway slave who had committed many depredations, and for whose apprehension a considerable reward was offered by his master. They had followed the footsteps of the sheep upon a sandy path as long as the daylight lasted and then they had taken a direction which they thought might lead to some mocambos or huts of the wood made by runaway slaves. After they proceeded a little way, the bleeding of the sheep was heard, upon which they prepared themselves, and came suddenly upon this fellow and a woman who were in a hut. The woman escaped, which they regretted, as she was likewise most probably a runaway slave. The man was taken into the house, and was tied fast upon a long bench with his face downwards, and the cord was passed around his arms and legs several times. This was done in the room which I was to inhabit for the night. The whole of the family retired to rest and left us together. I had my knife with me, but naturally soon fell asleep. In the morning the bench and the cords remained, but the man was gone. He had crept through a small window at the opposite end of the room. The young men of the house were sadly vexed, but I told them it was their own fault, for some of them should have kept watch, as they could not suppose that I should remain awake, who had come in fatigued from traveling. We were now afraid that he might have taken one of our horses for his more convenient escape, but this was not the case. Our journey took us again through the village of Mamanguape, and a little distance beyond it I left the road, accompanied by the guide, and went to the principal house of a sugar plantation where we asked for a night's lodging. I was told that the master was not at home, 
and great doubt seemed to be entertained of taking us in. Whilst we were talking at the door, a young man of dark color came up, mounted a horse which was standing there without a saddle, and rode off, seemingly avoiding to observe that there were any strangers present. One of the black women said, Why did you not speak to him, for he is one of our young masters? I now inquired and discovered that the owner of the place and his family were mulattos. This was the only instance of incivility I met with, and the only occasion on which a night's lodging was denied to me during the whole course of my stay in Brazil. We lodged this night under a tree, distant about one hundred yards from the Ingenio, near to a neat and comfortable-looking cottage, of which the owner was an elderly woman. She was civil to us, and expressed her sorrow at the treatment which we had received. There had been very little rain here, for the grass in the field of the plantation had still a parched look, and the cattle were in bad condition. Toward the evening of the following day we reached a hamlet, and at one of the cottages I obtained permission to pass the night. There was a penthouse standing out from the front. These are usual even for dwellings of wealthy persons. Under it I slung my hammock but was surprised to find that, though the house was inhabited, still the door was shut, and that the person within spoke to us, but did not open it. This I thought strange, and began to suppose that he might be afflicted with some contagious disorder, and had been forsaken by his friends, or rather that his family had been advised to remove to some neighboring cottage. But the guide explained, saying that the man had been bitten by a snake, and that the bite of this species only became fatal if the man who had received it saw any female animal, and particularly a woman, for thirty days after the misfortune. As the lower orders imagine that all snakes are poisonous, it is not surprising that many remedies or charms should be quoted as efficacious. It is well known that many of these reptiles are innoxious, but as this is not believed by the people in general, it is naturally to be supposed that any cause rather than the true one is assigned on a recovery from a bite. On the morrow we left these good people in expectation of their friend's restoration to health, and at the allotted period, and proceeded to dine on the banks of the river Paraiba, at a spot which was not far distant from the plantation of Espiritu Santo, where we had slept on our way northward. The river was still as dry as it had been during the drought, that is, the pools or hollows in the bed of it had water in them, but they did not contain a sufficient quantity to overflow, unite, and form a stream. We arrived upon the banks about ten o'clock, and heard from several persons of a report which had been spread that the river was filling fast. At about twelve o'clock the water made its appearance, and before we left it the river was three feet deep. We afterwards heard that the stream was not fordable at five o'clock of the same afternoon, and that it continued to run with great rapidity for some days. I went round to Espiritu Santo and spoke to the Capitan Moore, and did not dismount, as I was more and more anxious to end my journey. We slept at a single cottage about two leagues beyond, and on the following morning again set forth. About noon, for I had pushed on without resting until this hour, we were descending a long and steep hill when a violent shower of rain came on, which soon caused a torrent to run with much noise and velocity through the gullies in the road. The clay of which the hill was composed was rendered excessively slippery, and far from proceeding more quickly, the horses became more cautious, and on these occasions it is needless to attempt to urge them forwards faster than they themselves are willing to go. They are aware of the danger of a false step, and nothing that the rider can do will make an old roadster alter his usual manner of proceeding. At the foot of the hill stood a venda, or liquor shop, at which travelers were in the habit of putting up. Most of the hamlets contained one of these places, and we had met with them much more frequently since we had entered upon the great cattle road. Wet as we were, through and through, it would have been impossible to go further that day. Therefore we were thankful for having a house so near, Indeed, the rain continued during the greatest part of the afternoon. We had descended into a narrow and beautiful valley, much of which was covered with flourishing plantations of sugarcane, looking very green and luxuriant. This was not the first night that I had seen the beautiful luminous insect, Elater noctilucus, which is called by the Portuguese Casafogo. 
it is to be met with chiefly in well-wooded lands and admits at intervals a strong but short-lived light after leaving this place the next morning we discovered that we had lost some trifles belonging to our baggage i sent the guide and another man back to seek for them but they returned unsuccessful we had it is true seldom taken up our lodgings in public houses but perhaps if we had done so oftener i should have had more reason to complain however as it is this was the only occasion upon which i lost any part of my baggage with a suspicion of theft attached to its disappearing we rested at midday near dois Hios, and in the afternoon passed through that place arriving at guayana about sunset it will be remembered that i purchased some of my horses at guayana now on my return two of the same animals were still with me and this alone proves that they were of the best kind when we were distant from guayana about one league one of them made towards a narrow path to the right of the road and was prevented by his driver from turning up into it but immediately after passing it he began to flag and in a few minutes i was under the necessity of having him released from his load and of desiring one of the men to lead him otherwise he would have turned back he had from this time the appearance of being quite fatigued i can only account for this circumstance by supposing that the path led to his former master's residence and that the animal had proceeded thus far in expectation of ending his journey here i was received by my friends at guayana in their usual friendly manner but i found that the town was in a dreadful state from the scarcity of provisions one person was said to have died of hunger and i was told by an inhabitant that several respectable women had been at his house to beg for farina offering to pawn their gold ornaments for it on the morning of the fifteenth of february i left guayana and assisted my people in crossing the river as soon as they were all safe on the Hesifi side of it i pushed on accompanied by julio and feliciano all three of us being mounted upon our best horses we rested during the heat of the day at Iguarasu. My horse recognized the place, for as he entered the town, he quickened his pace, and without being guided, went up to the door of the inn, from whence he refused to stir again until I dismounted. We arrived a little after sunset at the Cruz de Salmas. John was prepared for me, but did not expect me for one or two days. The following morning I rode to Hesifi and was received by my friends as one who had been somewhat despaired of, and even my particular friend to whom I had written did not expect me so soon. When I returned home in the evening, the rest of the party had arrived, and Feliciano and his two companions set off two days afterward on their return to Sierra. Footnote. In the year 1812, I met Feliciano and one of the others, who was his brother-in-law in one of the streets of Hesifi, they recollected me and I was stopped by both of them getting hold of my coat on each side. They asked me if I was going again to travel, for if I was, they said that they were unemployed and would go with me. Their attack had so much the appearance of being more in violence than in the gladness of old friendship that one or two of my acquaintance who chanced to pass at the time stopped and inquired what was the matter supposing that i had got into some scrape these fellows literally held me fast until i had answered all their questions their fidelity seems to militate from the general unfavorable character which i have given of the indians but unfortunately individual instances prove very little and footnote julio likewise left me with which i was much displeased footnote I had imagined that he did not intend to return again into my service, but on my second voyage to Pernambuco I found him at the house of one of my friends, employed as a household servant, and I heard that he had come down to Hesifi two days after I had left the place, for the purpose of remaining with me. But as I was gone, he had entered into the service in which I found him. Julio was an exception to almost all the bad qualities of the Indians, and if I was again to travel in that country I should use every endeavor to have him in my company he belonged to alhandra and footnote end of chapter eight part two section twelve of travels in brazil volume one by henry coster 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9, Part 1 Voyage from Pernambuco to Maranhão St. Louis Trade Wild Indians The Governor Alcantara The author sails from St. Louis and arrives in England. Eight days after my return from Sierra, arrived a vessel from England, bringing letters which obliged me to leave Pernambuco and proceed to Maranhão. As a cargo could not be obtained for the brig at the former place, the consignee determined to send her to Maranhão, and being myself desirous of taking advantage of the first opportunity, I prepared for the voyage, and sailed in the course of forty-eight hours. We weighed anchor on the 25th of February, and had a prosperous passage of seven days. We were in sight of the land nearly the whole time, and occasionally, as the brig was small, and the master wished, if possible, to become acquainted with the points of land, we were very near to it. The Portuguese ships seldom come up this coast without a pilot, nor is it prudent to do otherwise, but we could not obtain one without delay, to which the master objected. He had scarcely ever before been out of the British seas, but their school is good, and now he found his way to Maranhão with as much dexterity as an experienced pilot. This coast is generally known to be dangerous, and the land has for the most part a dreary and dismal look, particularly after passing Rio Grande. We entered the bay of St. Marcos with the lead going, took the channel to the eastward of the Baixo do Meio, or Middle Bank, passed the fort of St. Marcos, and came to an anchor opposite and very near to the sandbanks at the mouth of the harbor of St. Louis. As no pilot came off to us, the master and myself got into the boat, intending to fetch one, but on coming opposite to the fort of St. Francisco, a gun without shot was fired, and the sentinel beckoned us back to the ship. We pulled for the fort, and when we approached it, an enormous speaking trumpet was produced and through it we received orders not to proceed to the city. However, we landed at the fort, and I told the officer that the master was particularly desirous of having a pilot, as he was unacquainted with a bay or port, and it is well known that they contain many sand banks. We were answered that the pilot would come in due time, and finding a remonstrance of no avail, returned to the ship, when the pilot arrived, he was accompanied by a soldier and a custom-house officer. It was with some difficulty that I could persuade the master to allow the former to come into the vessel. Sailors and soldiers never very well agree, and the blunt Englishman said he had no idea of his ship being taken from him by a fellow in a party-colored jacket. This was a new regulation. Indeed, in most of those regarding the port of Maranhão, I could not avoid recollecting the old proverb of much cry, etc. As the brig came up the harbor, we received the health and custom-house visit, who was composed of several well-dressed men, some of whom wore cocked hats and swords, and all of them ate much bread and cheese and drank quantities of porter. The administrador of the customs was among them, and was dressed in the uniform of a cavalry officer. I scarcely ever saw so much astonishment pictured in the countenance of any man as in that of the master of the brig. He had been accustomed to enter our own ports, where so much business is done in so quiet a manner, and he now said to me in half joke, half earnest, why is not only one, but they are coming in shoals to take the ship from me? After all these personages and all the trouble they had given us, I was still obliged to pass the night on board because the guard amour, the officer especially appointed to prevent smuggling, had not made his visit. Fortunately, I found means of having the letters conveyed on shore. Otherwise, the vessel would have arrived four and twenty hours before the merchant, to whom she was consigned, could have obtained any information regarding her. To render the night still more disagreeable, some heavy rain fell. The deck was leaky, and about midnight I was obliged to rise and look for a dry corner. The city of St. Louis, situated upon the island of Maranhão, and the metropolis of the Estado, or state of Maranhão, is the residence of a captain-general and the see of a bishop. It is built upon very unequal ground, commencing from the water's edge, 
and extending to the distance of about one mile and a half in the northeast direction. The space which it covers ought to contain many more inhabitants than is actually the case, but the city is built in a straggling manner, and it comprises some broad streets and squares. This gives it an airy appearance which is apparently pleasant in so warm a climate. Its situation upon the western part of the island, and upon one side of a creek, almost excludes it from the sea breeze, by which means the place is rendered less healthy than if it was more exposed. The population may be computed at about 12,000 persons, or more, including Negroes, of which the proportion is great, being much more considerable than at Pernambuco. The streets are mostly paved, but are out of repair. The houses are many of them neat and pretty, and of one story in height. The lower part of them is appropriated to the servants, to shops without windows, to warehouses and other purposes, as at Pernambuco. The family lives upon the upper story, and the windows of this reach down to the floor, and are ornamented with iron balconies. The churches are numerous, and there are likewise Franciscan, Carmelite, and other convents. The places of worship are gaudily decorated in the inside, but no plan of architecture is aimed at in the formation of the buildings themselves, with the exception of the convents, which preserve the regular features appertaining to such edifices. The governor's palace stands upon rising ground, not far from the waterside, with a front towards the town. It is a long uniform stone building, of one story in height. The principal entrance is wide, but without a portico. The western end joins the town hall and prison, which appear to be part of the same edifice, and the oblong piece of ground in its front, covered with grass, gives it on the whole a handsome and striking appearance. One end of this is open to the harbor and to a fort in the hollow, close to the water. The other extremity is nearly closed by the cathedral. One side is almost taken up with the palace and other public buildings, and the opposite space is occupied by dwelling houses and streets leading down into other parts of the city. The ground upon which the whole place stands is composed of a soft red stone, so that the smaller streets leading from the town into the country, some of which are not paved, are full of gullies through which the water runs in the rainy season. These streets are formed of houses consisting only of the ground floor and having thatched roofs. The windows are without glass, and the dwellings have a most mean and shabby appearance. The city contains a custom house and treasury. The former is small, but was quite large enough for the business of the place, until lately. The harbor is formed by a creek in the island, and is to be entered from the Bay of St. Marcos. The channel is of sufficient depth for common-sized merchant ships, but it is very narrow and not to be entered without a pilot. Opposite to the town, the water is shallow at the ebb. It is worthy of remark that the tide rises gradually more and more along the coast of Brazil, from south to north. Thus at Rio de Janeiro the rise is said to be trifling. At Pernambuco it is from five to six feet. At Itamarasa eight feet. And at Maranhão it is eighteen feet. The forts of Maranhão are all of them said to be in bad order. I heard one person observe, half in earnest, that he did not suppose each fort contained more than four guns which were in a fit state to be fired. I did not see that of St. Marcos, which is situated at the entrance of the bay, but it is reported to be in the same state as the others. Those I saw are small and built of stone. The soldiers were well dressed and well fed, and they looked respectable. The barracks are new and large, comparatively speaking and have been built in an airy situation in the outskirts of the city. The garrison consists of one regiment of regular infantry of about 1,000 men when complete, but these are much divided, being stationed in several forts. Recruits are formed of the lower orders of white persons and of the people of color. The men were never exercised with the artillery, and were merely accustomed to the common routine of mounting guard though a few detachments have, on some occasions, been sent on to the mainland at the back of the island to assist the planters against the wild Indians. The island of Maranhão forms the southeast side of the Bay of St. Marcos. Consequently, this bay is to the westward side of it. To the eastward of the island is the Bay of St. Jose. 
from some similarity between the point of ita colomi by which vessels are in part guided when about to enter the bay of st marcos and another point of land upon the small island of st anna which is at the entrance of the bay of st jose instances have occurred of vessels mistaking the latter for the former in entering the bay of st jose this error causes great danger and inconvenience because owing to the prevalence of easterly winds it is next to impossible for a vessel to beat her way out of it it is therefore necessary that she should go through the narrow channel between the mainland and the island of marignan a passage of considerable difficulty footnote the information which is contained in this note i had from captain juan roman trivino of the spanish ship st jose of three hundred tons burden he received orders to proceed from rio de janeiro to marignan for the purpose of loading cotton in the commencement of the year eighteen fifteen he arrived off the settlement of sierra and sent on shore for a pilot to take him to st louis he was informed that none resided at sierra but that he would find one at jericoa Quarara, a high hill between sierra and parnaiba on arriving near to this place he discovered an indian in a canoe fishing who came on board and offered to pilot him to st louis this was agreed to and they proceeded but from mistaking the two points of land in the manner mentioned above the indian took the vessel into the bay of st jose on the fifteenth of march they kept the lead going even before they discovered the error into which they had been led as is the custom with all vessels bound to st louis the ship was brought to an anchor off the village of st jose which is situated upon the northeast point of the island of marignan in eleven fathoms water whilst they continued in the mid-channel of the bay they found from eighteen to twenty fathoms the depth of water regularly decreases from the centre of the bay towards the land on each side but it contains no insulated sandbanks the ship was at anchor off the village of st jose two days they then proceeded through the channel which is enclosed on either side by mangroves and is so narrow in some parts that the yards at times brushed against the branches the wind was fair and they sailed through without being obliged to tow or warp the ship the depth of water varied from five to two and a half fathoms the bottom was of mud about halfway through the channel the tide from the bay of st jose and that from the bay of st marcos meet this takes place nearly but not quite opposite to the mouth of the river itapicuru they were two days in sailing from the anchorage ground at st jose to the island of taua which is situated near to the southwest corner of the island of marignan here the ship came to an anchor in nine fathoms water with a sandy bottom the captain sent to st louis for another pilot as the man who had brought them thus far was not acquainted with the remainder of the navigation the island of taua is rocky and uninhabited and is covered with palm trees the village of st jose appeared to captain trivino to be of considerable size but with the exception of two or three the houses were built of slight timber and of the leaves of different species of palm trees its inhabitants were mostly fishermen he mentioned that he saw a shoemaker at work there captain trivino understood from his pilot that the river itapicaru is at its mouth a hundred and twenty yards wide and that its depth is one fathom and a half End footnote. the bay of st marcos is spotted with several beautiful islands and is of sufficient extent to admit of considerable grandeur the width of st louis to the opposite shore is between four and five leagues its length is much greater towards the south end there are several sandbanks and the water is shallower it receives here the waters of a river along the banks of which are situated several cattle estates but the river itapicaru which runs into the narrow channel between the mainland and the island enjoys the greatest share of cultivation its banks are extremely fertile and upon them have been established the principal plantations of cotton and rice which are the two chief and almost only articles of commerce from the city of st louis the island is in itself very little cultivated there is no considerable plantation upon it a few of the rich merchants residing in the city have country houses distant from it about one league 
but the remainder of the lands are left untouched owing as is said to the unfitness of the soil for the purposes of agriculture footnote Juan the fourth sent over one bartholomew bajeros de ataide with three miners one a venetian and the other two french to search for gold and silver after two years search up the amazons they returned to maranon and offered to supply the people with iron at a cruzado about two shillings four pence per quintal a hundred and twenty eight pounds weight if the state would engage to take all that they should produce at that price the people were afraid to enter into any such contract the island was so rich in this orb that foreign cosmographers called it the ilia do fejo in their maps and all who came there with any knowledge of the subject said that it was ore of the best quality a thing of great importance to portugal which bought all its iron and yet this discovery was neglected from a memoir of manuel guedes araña procurador from maranon sixteen eighty five in volume six pinero collection of manuscripts in the possession of mr southey a royal manufactory of iron has been established in the captaincy of st paulo called the royal fabric of sao joan g ipanema i obtained a knowledge of the fact from two letters in numbers forty five and fifty six of the investigador portugues a periodical publication published in london i am sorry to say that the two letters to which i allude have arisen from some differences existing among the directors of the fabric and footnote there is a horse path through the island to a house which stands immediately opposite to the mouth of the river itapacoru at this is stationed a canoe for the purpose of conveying people from one shore to the other another horse path also leads to the village and chapel of st jose the importance of the province has increased very rapidly previous to the last sixty years no cotton was exported and i heard that when the first parcel was about to be shipped a petition was made by several of the inhabitants to the camera or municipality requesting that the exportation might not be permitted for otherwise they fear that there would be a want of the article for a consumption of the country this of course was not attended to and now the number of bags exported annually is between forty and fifty thousand averaging about a hundred and eighty pounds weight each footnote i have just in time received the following statement of the exportation of cotton from maranon from the year eighteen o nine to eighteen fifteen eighteen o nine to great britain in fifty one vessels fifty five thousand eight hundred and thirty five bags to other parts twenty nine vessels twenty one thousand six bags eighteen ten to great britain in thirty seven vessels forty thousand six hundred and eighty four bags to other parts nineteen vessels eleven thousand seven hundred and ninety three bags eighteen eleven to great britain in thirty six vessels forty eight thousand seven hundred and five bags to other parts in nineteen vessels six thousand fifty three bags eighteen twelve to great britain in twenty nine vessels thirty five thousand seven hundred and sixty seven bags to other parts twenty nine vessels four thousand eight hundred and three eighteen thirteen to great britain in thirty five vessels fifty thousand seventy two bags to other parts in twenty seven vessels ten thousand one hundred and one bags eighteen fourteen to great britain in twenty two vessels thirty one thousand two hundred and five bags to other ports in thirty four vessels fourteen thousand four hundred and thirty six bags eighteen fifteen to great britain thirty two vessels twenty eight thousand five hundred and thirty nine bags to other parts in forty nine vessels twenty two thousand two hundred and sixteen bags Close footnote. The quantity of rice grown there is likewise great. Footnote. A person of the name of Belfort first planted rice at Marignan, and some of his descendants now reside there in opulence. Close footnote. But the sugar which is required for the consumption of the province is brought from the ports to the southward. Some sugar cane has lately been planted, but hitherto molasses only have been made. 
I heard many persons say that the lands are not adapted to the growth of the sugar cane. Footnote. There were five sugar works, or engines, as they are called, at Itapicuru, which compounded for 5,000 ahovas of their produce. On the island there were six engines in full employ. 1641. History of Brazil. Volume 2, page 9. End footnote. The cotton and rice are brought to St. Louis in barks of about 25 or 30 tons burden. These come down the rivers with the stream from their plantations. The return is not, however, so easy, as they are obliged to be rowed or warped. But being then empty, or nearly so, the difficulty is not very great. Considerable quantities of manufactured goods have been sent out from Great Britain since the opening of the trade, as has been done to the other principal ports upon the coast but a ready sale has not been found for them here to any great amount. The province of Marignan will not bear comparison with that of Pernambuco. It is still in an infant state. There still exist wild Indians, and the plantations upon the mainland are still in danger from their attacks. The proportion of free persons is much smaller, the slaves very much preponderate. But this class can of necessity use but little of what is in any degree expensive, or what in such a climate is mere luxury. There exists at St. Louis a great inequality of ranks. The chief riches of the place are in the hands of a few men who possess landed property to a great extent, numerous gangs of slaves, and are also merchants. The wealth of these persons, and the characters of some of the individuals who enjoy it, have raised them to great weight and consequence, and indeed one governor knows to his cost that without their concurrence, it was useless to attempt the introduction of the innovations proposed, and impossible to trample long upon the rest of the community. But the great inequality of rank bespeaks the advancement of this place to have been less rapid than of other settlements further south, where the society is more amalgamated and property more divided. As a port of trade with Europe, St. Louis may be accounted the fourth establishment upon the coast of Brazil and point of importance giving precedence to Rio de Janeiro, Bahia, and Pernambuco. The wild Indians have occasionally crossed from the mainland to the island, and have committed depredations upon the houses and gardens in the neighborhood of St. Louis. Some of these people have been at different times made prisoners and brought to the town, where at very little pains, I fear, have been taken to conciliate them. I did not see any of them, but they were represented to me as most frightful beings, their features are excessively ugly, and their hair is black and preposterously long, both before and behind. They are of a dark copper color, darker than Indians that have been domesticated. The last individuals taken, to the number of four or five, were brought into the town quite naked, were put into close confinement, and I was informed that there they died. I could not find out that any attempt had been made to send them back as mediators or that any plan of conciliation had been entered into, and on mentioning something of this kind, I was in more than one instance told that it would be of no use, that rigor was the only method. I do not think that this is the general opinion regarding them, but I much apprehend that but faint hopes can be entertained of any zeal being shown by their civilization. There are now no enthusiastic missionaries. The Jesuits no longer exist in that country and the other orders of friars have become lazy and worse than useless. However, the Indians cannot be enslaved, therefore at least they are not hunted down like wild cattle, as formerly was the practice. The name which is given generally both here and at Pernambuco to all wild Indians is Tapuya, and that of Caboclo is applied to those who have been domesticated. Having thus given an outline of the place at which I had arrived, I may now leave my quarters on board the brig and be allowed to land, which I accomplished on the morning subsequent to that of our entrance into the harbor. I was received upon the quay by my friend, a young Portuguese with whom I had been intimate at England and at Pernambuco. He told me it was necessary to go to the palace for the purpose of presenting my passport, as the regulations of the port had for some time been most strictly followed, and several indeed had been lately added. I then for the first time recollected that I had no passport. Having forgotten to obtain one, owing to the haste with which I left Pernambuco, this produced a demure as my friend was afraid that I should be imprisoned, 
the governor not being friendly to Englishmen. However, I determined to call myself the supercargo of the brig. We proceeded to the palace, the entrance to which was guarded by two sentinels, and we passed several others in going up the stairs into the antechamber, where we were received by a gentleman-like officer, who heard what I had to say, asked no questions, and soon dismissed us. I thought I had seen the great man himself, but was undeceived, and heard that he seldom honored any one with an audience. The officer to whom we had spoken was the lieutenant colonel of the regiment of regular infantry. The guard at the palace consisted of one company. The muskets were piled in front of the chief entrance and appeared to be in good order. I soon discovered that St. Louis was ruled with most despotic sway. The people were afraid of speaking, as no man knew how soon it might be his fate to be arrested, from some trifling expression which he might allow to escape him. The governor was so tenacious of the honors due to his station that he required every person who crossed the area in front of the palace to remain uncovered until he had entirely passed the whole building, not that the governor was himself always in view. But this adoration was thought necessary even to the building within which he dwelt. The distinction, until then reserved by the Romish church for its highest dignitaries, was, however, not thought by his excellency too exalted for himself. The bells of the cathedral rang every time he went out in his carriage. Persons even of the first rank in the place were to stop, if in their carriages or on horseback, when they met him, and were to allow him to pass before they were again to move forwards. End of section 12section thirteen of travels in brazil volume one by henry coster this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine part two i was introduced to several of the first merchants and planters and particularly to the colonels jose gonzalves da silva and simplicio diaz da silva the latter is the sub-governor of parnaiba a small port situated about three degrees to the eastward of st louis they are both of them men of great wealth and of independent spirit the former is an elderly man who has made a large fortune in trade and latterly has increased it by planting cotton he possesses between one thousand and fifteen hundred slaves on one occasion the mulatto driver of his carriage though ordered by his master to stop that the governor might pass refused so to do the following day an officer came to the old gentleman's house with orders to arrest the man the colonel sent for him and said go and i'll take care of you adding to the officer tell his excellency i have still several other drivers to the surprise of every person about the prison two servants made their appearance in the evening with a tray covered with a cloth which was handsomely embroidered and filled with the best kind of victuals sweetmeats etc were not forgotten all this was for the driver, and was repeated three times every day until the man received an order for his release. The Colonel Simplicio had been sent for by the governor of St. Louis. Had it not been for the circumstances in which he was placed, I should have gone down to his residence at Parnaiba. He has there a most notable establishment, part of which consists of a band of musicians, who are his own slaves some of them have been instructed at lisbon and at rio de janeiro it is through such men as these that improvements are to be expected i likewise became acquainted with a gentleman who had been imprisoned for a trifling breach of some new port regulation and of his friends were allowed free ingress to see him and i passed some pleasant evenings with him and other persons who were in the habit of assembling there he was allowed two small rooms in the prison and was confined in this manner for several months the ovidor of the province was also suspended from exercising the functions of his office removed from st louis and imprisoned in one of the forts the juiz Giafora, the second judicial officer performed for the time the duties of the situation he was a brazilian and a man of independent character who spoke and acted freely notwithstanding the ostensible place he held and the danger of it under such a government the master of an english merchant ship i was told had been arrested for some breach of port regulation 
and was confined in a miserable dungeon for three days. I heard many more stories of the same nature, but these will, I think, suffice to show the state of the city of St. Louis at the time, and just before I visited the place. The governor was a very young man, and a member of one of the first noble families of Portugal. Footnote. He has been removed, was ordered to Lisbon, and ultimately on his return to Rio de Janeiro was refused admittance for a short time to the Prince Regent. End footnote. There are few situations in which it is so greatly in a man's power to be much beloved or much disliked as that of governor of a province in Brazil in which a man may be either the benefactor or the scourge of the people over whom he is sent to rule. My friend's residence, in which I stayed during my visit to Maranhão, was situated by the waterside, and almost within hail of the ships at anchor in the harbour. I was amused sometimes at the rapidity with which the fishermen paddled their canoes. These are long, and of just width sufficient to allow of two men sitting abreast. I have seen in one of them as many as sixteen men in two rows, with each a paddle, which they move with quickness and great regularity. The last man upon the bench steers the canoe when necessary, placing the paddle so as to answer the purpose of a rudder. One or other of the two men steering, according to the direction which the vessel is to take. These fellows are mostly dark-colored mulattoes and blacks, and entirely naked excepting the hats which they wear upon their heads but when they come on shore they partially clothe themselves. The nakedness of the negro slaves is not sufficiently concealed. Neither males nor females have any covering from the waist upward, excepting on Sundays and holidays. Though the climate may not require any more clothing, decency certainly does. I speak here of slaves who are at work in the streets, for the household servants are at least tolerably covered, and some of them are neatly and even gaudily dressed at pernambuco the slaves are always decently clothed the criminals who are to be seen chained together as at pernambuco are here more numerous and in walking the streets the clanking of the chains is continually strike in the ear reminding every man of the state of the government under which he resides such is the power of a governor that a respectable person might be sentenced to this dreadful punishment at least until redress could be obtained from the seat of the supreme government at rio de janeiro a period of four months or more intervening i brought with me the horse which had carried me as far as rio grande on my journey to sierra and took several rides in the neighbourhood of the city with an english gentleman who was residing there the roads are extremely bad even in the immediate vicinity of st louis and our usual practice was to ride several times round the open piece of ground upon which the barracks stand Maranhão is again in this respect far behind the place I had lately left. The number of country houses is small, the paths are few, and no care is taken of them. Notwithstanding this, several persons have carriages, which are of a form similar to those used in Lisbon, and not unlike the cabriolets drawn by a pair of horses, which are to be seen in France and Flanders. The horses that may be purchased at St. Louis are small, and few of them are well formed. Grass is scarce, and the inducements to take exercise on horseback are so few that the number of these animals upon the island is not considerable. This, too, may be one cause why fine horses are not to be met with there, for if a ready sale was found for the beasts of this description, some would doubtless be carried from Piaui to Maranhão which might be done with almost as little difficulty as is experienced in conveying many of them from the interior of Pernambuco to Recife. An English gentleman with whom I was acquainted arrived at Maranhão a short time after the opening of the trade to British shipping. He was riding in the vicinity of the city one afternoon when he was accosted by an old woman who said that she had heard of the arrival of an Englishman and wished to know if it was true as she was going to St. Louis, and much desired to see this bichu, or animal. After some further conversation upon the subject, he told her that the bichu she was speaking to was the Englishman himself. Of the truth of this, some difficulty was found in persuading her, but when she was confident that it was so, she cried out, Ay, 
Don Benito. Oh, how handsome! She expected to have been shown some horridly ugly beast, which it was dangerous to approach, and was consequently agreeably surprised to find that she was mistaken, and to see flesh and blood in human form, handsomely put together. I nearly lost a number of books which I had brought with me. The box containing them was carried to the custom house. They were taken out, and I was desired to translate each title page, which I did. Though the works were chiefly historical, still I found that the officer who looked over them was not inclined to let me have them, and a hint was given to me by one of my acquaintance that they might be considered as irrecoverable. However, I made immediately a petition to the governor to be allowed to send them on board again. This was granted, and thus I regained possession. If I had delayed, I am almost certain that I should not have seen them again. Such are the difficulties which are experienced with books in the parts of Brazil which I visited, that the only resource which remains is that of smuggling them into the country. Footnote. It is not perhaps generally known that there are published in London three or four Portuguese periodical works. One of them is prohibited in Brazil, and I have heard it said that all of them are so situated but they are principally intended for Brazilian readers, and they find their way all over the country, notwithstanding the prohibition. I have seen them in the hands of civil, military, and ecclesiastical officers, and have heard them publicly spoken of by them. It is said that the regent reads them, and is occasionally pleased with the invectives against some of the men in power. End footnote. I hope, however, that the enlightened minister who is now at the head of affairs at Rio de Janeiro will put an end to this dreadful bar to improvement. I brought a letter from one of my acquaintance at Pernambuco to a gentleman who resided at Alcantara, a town on the opposite side of the bay at St. Marcos. My friend at St. Luis, another young Portuguese, and myself, accompanied by two servants, agreed to hire a vessel and go over for the purpose of making him a visit and of seeing the place. We hired a small bark and set sail one morning early, with a fair but light wind. The beauties of the bay are only to be seen in crossing it. The number of islands diversify the view every five minutes, from the discovery of some hidden point or from a change in the form of the land, owing to the progress of the boat. The entrance into the harbor of Alcantara, the town itself, and the size of the vessel in which we were, reminded me much of the models of these realities. The place, the port, and our boat were all small and of proportionate dimensions, having much the appearance of playthings. It was not like a small vessel entering a large harbor, for in our case, as there was but little water upon the bar, as much pilotage was necessary as with a large ship in coming to anchor at St. Louis. We were about five hours in reaching the end of our voyage, the boatmen obtained for us a small cottage near to the beach. We intended to be independent and have our victuals cooked by our own servants, but soon after we were settled in our new habitation, the gentleman introduced himself, to whom we were furnished with a letter. He said that he had heard of our arrival, and he insisted upon our removal to his house. The town is built upon a semicircular hill, and at first sight from the port is very pretty, but it falls short of its promise on a nearer examination. The houses are many of them of one story in height, and are built of stone, but the major part have only the ground floor. The town extends back to some distance in a straggling manner, with gardens and large spaces between each house, and many of the habitations in that situation are thatched, and some of them are out of repair. As the hill which rises from the water side is not high, and the land beyond rather declines in a contrary direction. The meaner part of the town is not to be seen at the first view. Alcantara is, however, a thriving place, and its importance increases rapidly, as the lands in the neighborhood are in request for cotton plantations. A handsome stone quay was building upon the inside of a neck of land, round which the harbor extends for small craft. The place contains a town hall and prison, and several churches. The evening we passed with our new friend and his partner, both of whom were pleasant men. The latter took us to a neighboring church to hear a famous preacher and to see all the fashion and beauty of the place. It was much crowded, and therefore we saw little or nothing of the congregation. 
but the preacher, a large, handsome Franciscan friar, with a fine tone and clear voice, delivered a very florid discourse, with much energy and animation. This man and one other were the only persons of those I heard preach in Brazil, who deviated from the common praises usually given to the Virgin and to the saints. It was a good practical sermon, inculcating moral duties, but by way of conformity to established custom, he now and then mentioned the worthy in whose honor the festival was given. Footnote. About twelve months afterward, I had an opportunity of being personally known to this man, and found him to be very superior to any individual of his or any other order of friars with whom I have been acquainted. End footnote. The next day was agreeably passed in conversation, and in the evening two guitars were introduced and some of the young men of the place came in, and added to the amusement of the party. They sang and played, and there was much sport. There was no ceremony, but the behavior of these people was gentlemanly, and their conversation entertaining. I heard here of a certain estate, of which the slaves were numerous, but they had become rebellious. More than one steward had been killed by them, and for some time they remained without any person to direct them, but still they did not leave the place. When things had gone on in this manner for some time, a native of Portugal presented himself to the proprietor of the estate, and offered to take charge of it if he would allow him a salary of one conto of Hayes, about 250% annually, which is an enormous stipend, and if he would sign an agreement by which he should not become responsible for any slaves who might be killed in reducing the remainder to obedience. To all this no objection was made, and the man set off, accompanied by two other persons, his friends, and a guide, all of them being well provided with firearms and ammunition. They arrived upon the scene of action one evening, and finding the door of the principal house open, took up their lodgings in it. In the morning several of the negroes, on discovering the intentions of the persons who were in possession of the house, assembled in the area in front of it, but at some little distance. The new steward soon came to the door unarmed, not permitting his companions to appear, and called to one of the ringleaders by name, as if nothing was amiss. The man answered, and came out of the group, but said that he would not approach any nearer than the spot to which he had advanced. The steward made no reply, but quickly took a loaded musket, which stood immediately within the door, fired, and brought the man to the ground, and without delay called to another of the slaves also by name no answer being given, his companions came forward, and all of them fired in among the slaves. Such was the effect of this summary manner of proceeding, that in two or three days all was quiet, and went on smoothly as had formerly been the case, a few only of the slaves absconding. On our return from Alcantara we had a disagreeable passage. As the wind blew hard and some heavy rain fell, which made us apprehensive of not being able to reach the harbor of St. Louis. Our vessel had no cabin, but she was decked, and therefore, as a matter of necessity, we crept into the hold, in which we could not stand upright, and the bilge water occasionally reached our feet. But this produced much laughter, and we ultimately arrived in safety. Not far from the mouth of the port of Alcantara stands an island of three miles in length, and about one in breadth, called Ilha do Livramento. It is inhabited by one man and woman, who have under their care a chapel dedicated to Our Lady of Deliverance, which is visited by the inhabitants of the neighboring shores once every year, for the purpose of celebrating by a festival this invocation of the Virgin. My departure from Maranhão sooner than I had purposed at first, prevented the fulfillment of my intention of landing and spending a day upon this spot. I know not what idea I might have formed of the island if I had more narrowly examined it, but the view I had of it at a distance was extremely beautiful. From what I heard of it, I think that if any one was about to settle at Maranhão, here it is that he should try to fix his residence. I was introduced by my friend to a respectable family of St. Louis. We made them a visit one evening without invitation, as is the custom and were ushered into a tolerably sized room, furnished with a large bed and three handsomely worked hammocks, which were slung across in different directions. 
there were likewise in the apartment a chest of drawers and several chairs the mistress of the house an elderly lady was seated in a hammock and a female visitor in another but her two daughters and some male relations sat upon chairs the company which consisted of two or three men besides ourselves formed a semicircle towards the hammocks there was much ceremony and the conversation was carried on chiefly by the men and an occasional remark was made by one or other of the old ladies an answer was given by the daughters to a question asked but no more and some of the subjects touched upon what would not have been tolerated in mixed society in england a part of the formality might perhaps have worn off on further acquaintance the education however of women is not attended to which of necessity curtails the possibility of their entering into conversation upon many subjects even if so to do was accounted proper still the ladies of st louis cannot be said to be generally thus reserved for gaming among both sexes is much practised and is carried to great excess a young lady in one instance when going out with her mother to some evening company passed through the apartment in which her father was at play with several of his acquaintance he spoke to his daughter and asked her to take a card which she did she went on playing until she had lost three hundred mille hays about eighty pounds and then said she had no more money a fresh supply was afforded to her and she accompanied her mother to their party where most probably play was likewise the entertainment of the evening dancing is an amusement much too violent for the climate and is only resorted to on some grand occasion the love of gaming may be easily accounted for where there is little or no taste for reading and great sums of money are amassed without any means of expending them living is cheap a fine house a carriage and a number of servants may be had for a small sum the opening of the trade has however given to these people a new turn of expenditure and the facility of obtaining articles of dress and furniture two english merchants only were established at st louis the commercial transactions of british houses of trade were entrusted chiefly to portuguese merchants of the place footnote a british council has since been appointed to marignan and footnote many of these were accustomed to little ceremony and walk the streets in short jackets some of them without neckcloths and a few without stockings but others dress according to the manner of persons in europe it was with much difficulty that i could persuade the generality of those with whom i conversed that i had no business to transact they could not comprehend the motive by which a man could be actuated who was putting himself by travelling to certain inconveniences for the sake of amusement indeed many persons would not be convinced and thought that in so saying i had some sinister views i had not many opportunities of gaining information respecting the interior but i will mention what i heard the banks of the river itapicaru of which i have already spoken though they are much cultivated compared to what they were a few years ago are yet very wild and there is space incalculable for a new colonist the captaincy of piaui and the interior of the state of marignan abound in cattle and these parts of the country are not subject to droughts the town of aldeas altas footnote an ovidor has been appointed to aldeas altas and piaui has been raised to the rank of an independent provincial government these are improvements which show the regular government is gaining ground and footnote which is situated in the latter and the city of oeras in the former and further inland are said to be flourishing places great numbers of cattle are annually driven from these quarters of the sertão to bahia and pernambuco the proprietors of the estates which are situated in districts so far removed from the seat of government are at times unruly and a party of soldiers which was sent up to arrest one of these men some time before i arrived at st louis returned without effecting its purpose among other anecdotes i heard of a mulatto slave who ran away from his master and in the course of years had become a wealthy man by the purchase of lands which were overrun with cattle he had on one occasion collected in pens great numbers of oxen which he was arranging with his herdsmen to dispatch to different parts for sale when a stranger who came quite alone made his appearance and rode up and spoke to him 
saying that he wished to have some private conversation with him. After a little time they retired together, and when they were alone the owner of the estate said, I thank you for not mentioning the connection between us whilst my people were present. It was his master who had fallen into distressed circumstances, and had now made this visit in hopes of obtaining some trifle from him. He said that he should be grateful for anything his slave chose to give him. To reclaim him he well knew was out of the question. He was in the man's power, who might order him to be assassinated immediately. The slave gave his master several hundred oxen, and directed some of his men to accompany him with them to a market, giving out among his herdsmen that he had thus paid a debt of old standing, for which he had only now been called upon. A man who could act in this manner well deserved the freedom which he had resolved to obtain. As it was my intention to pass the ensuing summer in England, and no ships arrived from thence, I was afraid of being delayed some months for a conveyance. Therefore I thought it better to take my passage in one of the ships which were about to sail. I preferred the Brutus, as I was intimate with the supercargo, a young Portuguese. We set sail from St. Louis on the 8th of April, in company of another British ship, but we were soon out of sight of each other, owing to one vessel holding a better wind. On the 18th we reached variable winds, in latitude 20 degrees north longitude, 50 degrees west. It is not usual to find them so far to the southward, therefore we might consider ourselves remarkably fortunate. We passed our time pleasantly, as the weather was fine, and the wind favorable. On the 7th of May the wind freshened, but we had a good ship and plenty of sea room. A wave struck the stern and entered the cabin on the 8th in the morning setting everything afloat. This occurred soon after we had risen. On the ninth we discovered two vessels at a great distance ahead, and rather to windward. Both of them were laying two, but soon each appeared to stand on different tacks. One proved to be an English brig loaded with timber. She was waterlogged and about to sink, and the latter was an American ship which had lain two, and was in the act of assisting the people in leaving her. If the brig had not been loaded with timber, she must have gone down long before. As the American ship was bound to her own country, we took the crew on board the Brutus, nine persons. They were in most woeful plight. Some lay, others nearly naked, and all of them half starved with cold and hunger. The vessel had sprung a leak, which increased so rapidly as to oblige them to retreat from the deck into the foretop, where they had been for three days and two nights almost destitute of provisions. We arrived safe off Falmouth on the 20th of May. Here the supercargo and myself landed, and proceeded to London. End of section 13